Do you want to learn to code your own cryptocurrency and build your own ICO? Hey, I'm Gregory from DAP University, and today I'm going to show you how to create your own cryptocurrency on the Ethereum blockchain and sell it. I'll walk you through each step in the process where we will create our own ERC20 token with a smart contract. We'll create a token sale smart contract and we'll write tests against both of these contracts in order to ensure that the code is robust. And lastly, we'll create a token sale website where we can hold an ICO and allow people to purchase the tokens. So if you're interested, let's jump over the shoulder and get started. This video will be part one of a step-by-step -step tutorial series that I will be releasing over the course of several videos. So be sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so that you can get alerts about those next videos when they come out. You can turn on notifications by clicking the bell icon below this video. This video will build upon fundamental blockchain knowledge. For example, it'll be helpful if you're already familiar with a few concepts like what the Ethereum blockchain is and you know have a basic understanding of how it works. It'll also be helpful if you know what a smart contract is and what it does. If you're not familiar with these concepts already, you can check out a tutorial that I have. This is a two hour tutorial that shows you how to build your first decentralized application step by step. And I have a slideshow in this tutorial that goes through some of those you know, concepts uh, individually and addresses them. And I've also got several other videos on the channel that talk about smart contracts and what they are and, you know, what the blockchain is and how it works. So you can find this video on my Twitter. It's pinned to the top of my Twitter feed. You can also follow along with me uh, for daily updates on Twitter at DAP University. I'll be talking about these concepts as we go. So it's not necessary for you to understand them fully before you get started. But the more knowledge you have, the better but I will be explaining them as we build our uh, token sale website step-by-step. Step. Here is the project that we're going to be building. We're going to create our own cryptocurrency called DAP token, named after you know this channel, DAP University. And we'll create a website where you can purchase DAP tokens. You can see this is the project right here. This is the website which is deployed to GitHub pages. So I'm not actually running this website locally. This is deployed uh, you know, to the web. And you can also see that the smart contracts to this project are talking to the Rinkeby test network. Now, we'll use a local blockchain to develop this project in the tutorial, but you can see here that I am actually connected to the Rinkeby test network with this account. Now the Rinkeby test network is, you know, a version of the main Ethereum network that is used for test purposes. And all of the ether that is exchanged on the Rinkeby test network is fake and is not really worth anything on the main network. And that's nice actually for our purposes because it means that we can deploy our projects to a test environment and send Ether without worrying about spending real money. Now we can look at some of the features of this website. We can see that there is a main form here which allows us to purchase tokens. We can select the number of tokens that we want. We can buy them. We'll see a MetaMask confirmation pop up here. And we can also see how many tokens exist and the number of tokens that have already been sold. We can see our account address down here that we are connected to the local blockchain, or excuse me, the test network. We can also see the price of the token, and we can see how many tokens that we currently own. Let's get a conceptual overview of what we're going to be building in this tutorial. First is the cryptocurrency itself. Ethereum allows you to create your own cryptocurrency on the blockchain with a standard called ERC20. This standard allows you to mint your own token that can easily be transferred between wallets and sold on cryptocurrency exchanges with this ERC20 standard. 
It's also the standard that's going to allow us to have a token sale in the form of an ICO, like we'll be building in this tutorial. Now an ICO is a way for a business to raise capital by selling tokens that they've minted on the Ethereum blockchain. An ICO stands for an initial coin offering, and this is based on the traditional initial public offering that you might be familiar with from the stock market. The ICO that we'll be building in this tutorial will consist of you know, a website that we just saw, so that will be deployed to the web, and the smart contracts that govern our ICO and our token will be deployed to the blockchain. Well, let's talk about the ERC-20 standard that I've mentioned a few times already. ERC-20 is an API standard that governs how a token should be built. Now, you can find this standard that we'll look over here in a second on GitHub. This is the, uh, the Ethereum organization, and it comes from the Ethereum Improvement Proposals Repository. You can find this standard here as a markdown file. So let's take a look and see what this is all about. So like I said, ERC-20 is an API specification for how a token should be built. It's a community adopted standard that allows your tokens to get supported by you know, a variety of applications and uses. And we want to use this standard because we want our token that we're going to build to be compliant and widely accepted. For example, we want this token to be able to you know, be transferred from one wallet to another. We want the token to be bought and sold on a cryptocurrency exchange. And we want the token to you know, be able to be sold in an ICO like the one that we're going to build in this tutorial. So what does this specification look like? Now, this specification is essentially uh, you know, a specification of the structure of our smart contract. It dictates the functions that the smart contract must have, and it you know, provides some other suggested functionality that is nice to have, but ultimately optional. And it also dictates you know, certain events that our token must have, like a sell event. So let's take a look at that here. For example, the token can have a name. This is just a function that returns the name attribute of the token. And we can see that the name here is optional because ultimately our token doesn't have to have a name, but it's nice for it to have one. Same thing for a symbol. This might be the symbol that you would see on a cryptocurrency exchange. And in our case, our symbol is going to be DAP and our name is going to be DAP token. Let's look at some other functions here. Let's look at the transfer function. This is the function that is going to, you know, allow us to send our token uh, on the Ethereum blockchain from one account to another. Now, this is a required function. This is something that our, you know, token contract must have. And this is part of the standard of the ERC-20 specification. We can look at other things here. We can look at the events. This is a transfer and an approval event. So in Solidity, our smart contracts can emit events. Now an event is something that, you know, a smart contract emits and a consumer can subscribe to in order to receive these events anytime they happen. In the case of this ERC-20 standard, the transfer event is a required feature, and this essentially allows a consumer to subscribe to our token uh, to know whenever a value has been transferred with the token. So for example, we want to, Im we want to implement the transfer event anytime we call the transfer function. 
And again, this is a required characteristic of our DAP token. And again, you can uh, visit this website yourself and read more about the uh, ERC-20 standard if you'd like to, straight from the source. But we will be implementing this in our tutorial as we go. Let's get a bird's eye view of the technical aspect of the project that we're going to be building. You know, what are the basic components of the tutorial that we're going to be building? Well, we'll have two smart contracts that we will develop. We'll have a smart contract for our actual token. This is the DAP token cryptocurrency that implements the ERC-20 standard that I just talked about. We'll have a, another smart contract, the token sale contract. This essentially is going to govern the token sale and the ICO part of our project. And then we'll have a token sale website, which will be, you know, consist of uh, just a simple index.html file and um, some basic JavaScript that we will write in order to uh, handle the sale of tokens and displaying balances and things like that. Basically everything that we just saw when we demoed the project in the first time. Now that we've seen you know, a bird's eye view of everything that we're going to be building in this tutorial, let's go ahead and install all of the dependencies that we're going to need for our project so that we can jump in and start coding. The first dependency that we need is Node Package Manager, or NPM. And this comes bundled with Node.js. You can see if you have Node already installed by going to your terminal and typing node-v. If you need to install Node, you can install it with a command line tool like Homebrew. Or you can go to the Node.js website and download it directly. The next dependency is the Truffle framework. Truffle is a framework that's going to allow us to create decentralized applications on the Ethereum network. It's going to give us a suite of tools that allows us to write our smart contracts with the Solidity programming language. It also gives us a framework for testing our smart contracts. And it gives us a set of tools to deploy our smart contracts to the blockchain. We can also develop our client-side application inside of Truffle. You can install Truffle by going to your terminal and typing npm install g truffle. The next dependency is Ganache. Ganache is a local and memory blockchain that we will use for development purposes. You can install the Ganache by going to the Truffle Framework website and downloading Ganache directly. The next dependency that we're going to need is the MetaMask extension for Google Chrome. Now, in order to use the blockchain, we must connect to it. Remember, I said the blockchain is a network. We'll have to install a special browser extension in order to be able to use the Ethereum blockchain. And that's where MetaMask comes in. We'll be able to connect to our local Ethereum network with our personal account and interact with our smart contract by using MetaMask. Since we're going to be using the MetaMask extension for Chrome, you'll also need to install the Google Chrome browser if you don't have it already. To install MetaMask, you'll need to go to the Chrome Web Store and search for the MetaMask plugin. You will add it to Chrome. Once you've installed MetaMask, you should go to your Chrome extensions and ensure that MetaMask is enabled. You can also double check to see that it's working by going to your extensions bar and clicking on the little fox. Now the last thing that we need is some syntax highlighting for the Solidity programming language that we'll be using to write our smart contract. Most text editors and IDEs don't have syntax highlighting for Solidity yet, so we'll need to install some. I'm using Sublime Text, and I've downloaded the Ethereum package from Package Control. All right, that's it, guys. That's the end of the introduction for this tutorial series on how to create your own cryptocurrency and ICO. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications with the bell below so that you can see the next video in this series when it comes out. And if it's already out, then you can find a link to the next one at the end of this video so that you can keep binge watching and finish the tutorial. But until next time, thanks for watching DAP University.
Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University. So welcome back to the series where I'm showing you how to create your own cryptocurrency on Ethereum and how to build your own ICO. So this is video two in the series where I'm going to show you how to set up your project with the Truffle framework and get into coding your first smart contract. In particular, we're going to start writing the token contract for our project. So be sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications with the bell below in order to see the next video when it comes out. And if it's already out, you can check the link at the end of this video or just watch the next video in the playlist. Let's go ahead and set up our application. The first thing that we'll need to do is open Ganache that you downloaded and installed in the first video where we installed the dependencies for our project. So once Ganache is open and you've got that running, uh, we have a local blockchain running. So let's kind of take a look around here and see what we've got. Uh, you can see when we started Ganache, Ganache gave us uh, 10 accounts for free. Each of these accounts has an address. This is the unique identifier that we will uh, use to connect to the Ethereum blockchain, and this will represent our account that we're connected with. And each of these accounts has you know, a balance of 100 fake Ether. This Ether isn't worth anything on their real Ethereum network. And you can also click this little key to see the private keys for our account. We will use this whenever we add our accounts to MetaMask when we build out the client side portion of our tutorial. Now that we have Ganache running, I'm going to uh, minimize this and go to our terminal. Now here we're going to create a project directory. We'll do that like this. We'll call our project token sale. And we will CD into our token sale. This is just to change directory. Now the next thing that we want to do is initialize a Truffle project inside of this directory. And in the last tutorial where I uh, showed you how to build an election decentralized application, we used a Truffle box that gave us just some boilerplate code to get started quickly. Uh, and in this tutorial, I'm actually going to do everything by hand. So I'm going to import all of the front end dependencies and kind of build everything that we need from a blank Truffle project. And this is so that you can know how to do this on your own without using something like a Truffle box if you wanted to. So I will just run Truffle init. That's going to just create a new Truffle project in this directory. We can see that the uh, setup and the unboxing was successful. And this gives us just a few commands to start off with. Truffle compile, Truffle migrate, Truffle test. We'll use some of these later in this tutorial but here they are for reference for now. Now the next thing that I'm going to do is open this project in my text editor. Uh, I'm using Sublime Text and I have the uh, Subl uh, symlink configured. I've actually gotten a lot of questions about this from my previous tutorials. So basically this is just a uh, symlink or you know a command that I've configured uh, on my machine in order to open the project uh, in Sublime Text quickly. So once I execute that, we open Sublime Text, and we can take a look around in our project. We can see what our truffle init command gave us. It gave us a few things. It gave us a contracts directory, a migrations directory, a test directory, and a few configuration files here. So we'll step through these kind of bit by bit. The uh, migration.sol file here in our, in our contract directory is really just a contract that handles uh, the migrations whenever we deploy our smart contracts to our blockchain. And this is also the directory that we will use in order to develop our other smart contracts. We'll put our token contract inside this folder and our token sale contract inside here. Uh, the next directory is the migrations directory, and this is um, 
where all of our migration files will go. We'll look at this first migration file. This is uh, the initial migration that's going to get run whenever we deploy our smart contracts. This is just taking the migration contract that we just saw from the migration directory. Now, let me make some comments about you know migrations here. So if you come from another you know development environment, maybe maybe web development, um, you probably are familiar with the migrations directory that allows you to you know migrate or change the state of your database that you're working on. And this is a you know similar concept in blockchain development with the Ethereum blockchain. We keep uh, track of the migrations that we want to run in files like this. And we need migrations whenever we deploy smart contracts because whenever we you know deploy smart contracts, we are creating transactions and writing to the blockchain. We're actually you know changing its state. Uh, and so when we push a smart contract to the blockchain, we are migrating the blockchain state from you know point A to point B, which is uh, you know not having this smart contract to having this smart contract and actually running the contracts constructor and whatever logic that that does. So, and this is just like how we would change state, uh, you know, with a development database or any kind of database when we're building a centralized application. And any time that we want to uh, create another smart contract, we will create a new file here um, that will, you know, handle migrating those smart contracts to the blockchain. And, you know, down here is our test directory, which is empty for now. Uh, this is where we will put the tests that we will write against our smart contract. We'll go ahead and write uh, our first test at the end of this video. And next you'll see some project configuration files. Now these two files basically do the same thing. Um, and it's kind of funny looking that there are two of them. And the reason why is because on some Windows machines, there's actually a conflict between the Truffle executable and the Truffle file name. So for example, uh, if on some machines, if you were to run Truffle, uh, this executable that we would run in the command line would conflict with this Truffle.js file. So Truffle gives you the option to uh, house all of your configuration in this Truffle uh, config file. Uh, I'm on a Mac and I don't ever have this problem, so for the purposes of this tutorial, I'm just going to use the truffle.js file. But if you do have a problem, you may want to put your settings in this file. So let's go ahead and fill out some of the configuration for our project. Um, the first really configuration that we need is just to tell truffle uh, what our network is for development purposes. This essentially tells us, you know, how do we connect to our local blockchain. So I'm just going to do a networks key here. And I'm going to say development. And I'll say uh, the host is, you know, localhost. And the port will be, let's check actually. Let's open Ganache and see that uh, Ganache is running on port 7545. So we'll copy this, minimize Ganache, and we'll paste that here. And the network ID, we want it to honor all. We'll say this is, you know, match any network ID. All right, so there's our uh, initial project configuration. And that's kind of it for the overview of our project. Um, we'll add more, you know, directories and folders uh, and files here as we go, as we, you know, add more dependencies to our project, as we build out our client side application and deploy it and things like that. But for now, uh, this is all the configuration that we really need to get started. Let's go ahead and start writing our first smart contract. So just a quick review, you know, a smart contract is a way of writing code that's going to get executed on the Ethereum blockchain. It's where all of the, you know, business logic of our token is going to live and also our token sale. You know, this is where we're going to write our ERC20 token. And, you know, this smart contract is going to be in charge of reading and writing data 
to and from the blockchain. And it's also going to uh, be in charge of all the behavior of our cryptocurrency that we're writing. It'll be in charge of, you know, describing the basic attributes like the token's name, uh, the symbol for the token, you know, the price, you know, the total supply, how many tokens you know, actually exist. It's also going to govern the behavior of the token, like, uh, uh, you know, allowing users to buy and sell them and send them to others. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. So the token and the token sale and our front end application together is really going to be a decentralized application or a DAP. It's really just a token sale website that has a client side and a, you know, a back end that lives on the blockchain. And, you know, our two smart contracts that we're going to write uh, work together to be the decentralized portion of our DAP. So let's get started by creating a new smart contract. I'm going to create a token contract. I'm going to go ahead and create a new uh, file for our smart contract. I'll do, we'll create a new file in the contracts directory, contracts, uh, we'll call this dap token dot soul. All right, and we'll go to our project here. Now, our dap token is the smart contract that's going to implement the ERC-20 standard that we've talked about. It's going to be in charge of, you know, governing the behavior of our cryptocurrency itself. So let's kind of start coding this and see how all that works. First, we need to declare the version of Solidity that we're using. This is the Solidity programming language. We do that like this, pragma solidity. And we use a caret. We'll use version 0 0.4.2 for now and above. And the next thing is we want to declare a contract. And we do that like this, contract, dap token. And we give it some curly braces. Now, the first thing we want to do is kind of create some sort of test to ensure that we've created this contract properly and that we can, you know, set some sort of variable and uh, interact with the console just to make sure that this all works properly, you know, that we've set up our project and that we can, uh, you know, interact with the smart contract. So we'll do something simple. We'll do this by initializing the smart contract with the number of tokens available. Uh, that is, you know, how many tokens will actually ever exist for this DAP token. And to do this, we're going to need a couple of things. I'll just jot down some comments here. We need a constructor. We need something that's going to get run anytime our uh, smart contract is deployed. And this is actually going to set the value of the number of tokens that we'll have. We also need a way to set the tokens. And we need a way to read the total number of tokens. Oops. All right. So let's create the constructor. In Solidity, we can create a constructor by defining a function that has the same name as our contract. We do that like this. And we declare this function public. This is the visibility of the function. That's what we're doing here, setting the function's visibility. Um, because we want this uh, function to get run whenever the smart contract is deployed. Now, inside of this function, we can store the number of tokens that will exist uh, and we can set it to a variable. So what we'll do is create a variable called total supply. 
and we'll set it equal to the total number of tokens. And let's just say that there are 1 million tokens available. So 1 million. All right, we'll save that. Now this variable here is going to represent a state variable. And a state variable in Solidity is going to be uh, a variable that's accessible to the entire contract. It's kind of like a uh, class variable, maybe, in another object-oriented language. And the, uh, sorry, the state variable for our smart contract will actually uh, write to disk. It will uh, write to storage. And in this case, uh, that means anytime we update this variable, it's actually going to write to the blockchain. So let's go ahead and store that variable. We need a way to store it, and we need a way to read it. We can do all that with one fell swoop, like this. We'll first uh, declare a data type, uint256. We'll call it public and we will uh, name it the total supply. Oops. Save that. All right, let's see what we did. So whenever we declare a variable in Solidity, first we must declare the uh, data type of the variable. This is an unsigned integer, 256. And we'll see that the uh, visibility is set to public. And we call this total supply, which is the same name as the variable that we set here. So now whenever we you know, deploy our smart contract, we will uh, set the total supply to 1 million uh, inside the constructor. And that will save uh, to this value total supply, which is a state variable that's actually going to write uh, this data to the blockchain. This will be publicly visible and it'll create a transaction that's, that shows that this was set to 1 million tokens whenever the contract is migrated. Now let me say something about this as well. This is a, uh, a state variable that I've signed, uh, or I've made publicly visible, and with Solidity, whenever I declare a, vari a state variable public like this, uh, Solidity gives us a getter function for free. So normally I would have to write a function that returns this value, uh, but with this uh, public visibility, we don't have to, which is really nice. Also, total supply here uh, is, I, I didn't just choose this name arbitrarily, this actually comes from uh, the ERC-20 standard that we talked about quite a bit, um, and I'll show you that right now. You can see that total supply is part of this standard. This is a uh, required function for the ERC-20 token that shows how many uh, tokens actually exist. And you can see that this is a uh, function here. And we know that it's just a uh, reader because it's uh, a constant and it declares the return value. And see that this is an unsigned integer of 256 and it returns total supply. So if we look back at our code here, it's an unsigned integer of 256 and it's total supply. And you can see that uh, we're gonna get a function that looks like this in Solidity for free because we declare the state variable public. Let's try to interact with our smart contract in the Truffle console to see if we wire things up properly and to see if we can read the total supply that we just set. In order to do this, we need to create a migration. We'll go uh, into our project and we'll go to the migrations directory and we'll see this initial migration that we have here. What we want to do is to create a new migration file that's going to be in charge of migrating our smart contracts. And we'll use this code as sort of the basis for doing that. So what I'm going to do is uh, create a new file. I'm going to create a new file called um, deploy contracts. And notice that uh, whenever I do this, I prepin the file name with number two. And I do this because uh, we want to keep track of the order that uh, Truffle wants to run these migrations in. 
And we do that by just uh, numbering our files like this. So let's take uh, this code from our initial migrations file, copy it over, just as a starting point. So let's modify everything that we need for our purposes. We'll start by changing migrations to uh, DAP token. All right, let's save that. And let's kind of just step through uh, everything inside this migration file and see what it does. So first we are reading uh, the DAP token contract in the Solidity programming language uh, with this require function um, from our project directory. It's coming from here. And uh, we're actually assigning that to a variable here and we are deploying that uh, that value in the uh, uh, right here. So let me also explain artifacts here. So artifacts, uh, create, creating an artifact here basically allows us to create a contract abstraction that Truffle can use uh, to run in a JavaScript runtime environment. And this has you know, several different applications. This basically allows us to interact with our smart contract in any JavaScript runtime environment, like our Truffle console, um, or when we are writing tests, or when we are trying to interact with the smart contract with our client-side application. Um, that's really what Artifacts allow us to do. Now that we've created this migration, let's see if we can uh, run them. First, we'll uh, go to Ganache, make sure that it's running, uh, that everything's working. Right, good to go. We'll go back to our command line. Hope that we did everything correctly. Uh, so we'll try to run our migrations with Truffle. Migrate. Oops, it looks like we had a little hiccup there. So I'm going to rerun this migration. Uh, we'll do Truffle migrate. I'm going to pass it the reset flag. Let's see if this works. All right, that worked. So let's uh, open our console and try to read the total supply from our smart contract. We could open the truffle console like this, truffle console. Now the truffle console um, is a JavaScript runtime environment where we can, you know, write JavaScript commands inside of here uh, in order to, you know, interact with our contract. So let's do that like this. We'll uh, use the variable name DAP token. This is the same variable that we got from our migration. It's the value here. So DAP token, and we'll say deployed. This gets us a deployed instance of our contract. And then pass it a function. All right. So let's talk about what we just did here. Again, this is DAP token. It's the variable name that we just saw from our migrations. We got a deployed instance of uh, this DAP token contract. And then we assigned uh, the value of that instance to a variable token. Now, let me make a mention of uh, this then function and what we had to do here. Because of the excuse me, because of the asynchronous nature of our smart contracts, you know, developing them relies heavily upon the use of JavaScript promises. And if you're unfamiliar with promises, they're basically a way of handling the eventual result of an asynchronous operation. In this case, a function call. You know, for example, I I can't just say you know var uh, you know, token equals dap token uh, dot deployed. This won't work. Uh, if I did this, this would really just set this to a promise. Um, instead, you know, this deploy function is going to return a promise. And what I can do whenever this promise finishes is call the then function. 
and that's going to accept a callback function. And I can set the you know return value, which is going to get the deployed instance of the contract, and set it to this token variable. So if you're new to promises, they can be pretty confusing at first. Um, you can just read about them more on you know Google, but they're pretty essential to smart contract development uh, with the Truffle framework. And we'll use them a lot in our tests and on our client side application. Um, so feel free to brush up on them if you're uh, unfamiliar. So now that we have the instance of our app, let's see some things that it responds to. Token, we'll say uh, the address. We can see the address of the smart contract that's been deployed here. Now let's see if we can get the uh, total supply of the tokens. We'll do that like this. Uh, token, uh, total supply. And then we'll say then call the function. Say uh, s supply equals s. All right, we'll inspect that. Um, click enter. All right, we can see uh, our total supply of one million here. And when, whenever we uh, return, you know, uints that, that are this big, you know, 256, um, the Truffle console and really uh, is going to give us a big number in JavaScript. That's because, you know, these unsigned integers that are, that are very large might be bigger than uh, a number that JavaScript can handle natively. So I can get the uh, value like this to number all right you see that's one million one two three one two three all right now that gives us a good test for our uh, smart contract in the console we'll go ahead and exit the console with exit and you know before we go on let's make a quick mention about gas uh, whenever we, you know, ran our migrations and deployed our contracts to the blockchain, uh, it cost gas. That's because, you know, reading data from the Ethereum blockchain is free, but writing to it costs gas in the form of Ether. So basically, we had to pay some amount of Ether uh, or cryptocurrency, you know, whenever we uh, deploy our contracts to the blockchain. So I'll show you. In Ganache, you can see that the balance of our first account has gone down by, you know, some amount. And uh, Truffle, by default, uses uh, this first account in our, uh, in our collection of accounts here as the uh, account that it uses to uh, run our deployments. Now let's, uh, let's write a test to see if you know, our total supply is correct for our token. In order to do this, I'm going to create a new test file. The touch, we'll do something in the test directory. We'll call it dap token JS. All right, we have a new file here. Now let's say a quick word about testing. It's very important to test our smart contracts because you know the smart contract code is immutable. All the data on the blockchain is supposed to be immutable. And whenever we deploy our smart contract, you know we don't really want to change it. Um, so that's really important that we want our smart contract to be bug free because if we deploy them and we found a bug, the best thing that we can do is disable our smart contract and deploy a new copy. And we want to avoid that if at all possible. So let's get into writing some tests. Testing our smart contract with Truffle is pretty easy. Um, it comes bundled with the uh, Mocha testing framework and the Chai assertion library. So we can use both of those things uh, to write our tests. We'll get started by importing our contract file, just like we did in our migrations. We'll say var dap token equals artifacts require. And we'll say uh, dap token soul. All right. And to uh, kind of initialize this test suite, we'll say contract, we'll say uh, dap token, and we'll pass it a function. 
And whenever we, uh, you know, pass this callback function, it's going to give us all the accounts that are available that were provided by Ganache. Uh, this will give us all the accounts that are uh, available for testing. You can actually uh, use those for our tests. And we'll say, you know, it uh, sets the total supply upon deployment. All right. Oops, actually, we want to pass this function. All right. And what we'll do is uh, we'll kind of do a lick just like we did in the console. We'll, we'll uh, you know, return adapt token deployed. And then we'll say then function. And we'll say instance. And uh, we'll say the token instance instance. All right, we're basically just uh, caching the instance here to a token instance variable that we'll use uh, in a promise chain. So we'll say return token instance total supply. This is the function that we defined, you know, in our smart contract with our uh, getter. And it's what we used in the console. And we'll also, you know, execute our promise chain here. And we'll pass it a function, a callback function for the total supply. All right. And what we want to do here is check that this total supply is equal to the value that we expect. So we can use the uh, chai assertion library to say assert. And we say equal. And we'll say that uh, the total supply you know, to number uh, is equal to 1 million. And we'll say this sets the total supply to 1 million. All right. We can save this. Now let's uh, see if this works. We'll copy this file path. We'll do uh, truffle test. This is how we run our tests. Pretty easy. All right. We have one test passing. So let's change this value to make sure our tests work. We'll just change this to, you know, nine. All right. So we can see that our test works. Oops. Run it again. All right, and our test is passing again. Let's go ahead and commit everything that we've done so far. I'm going to initialize a new Git repository, git init. All right, I'm going to check the status. Okay, I'm going to add everything. Add dot. And let's go ahead and create a new commit. We'll call this one, and we'll call this, uh, we'll just call this smoke test. That's the same thing that we did in the last tutorial. All right, see that everything was added. Now I'm going to go ahead and uh, push this up to GitHub. Um, I'm gonna put a link down to the code in this point in the tutorial with a release. Um, so go ahead and check that link out if you'd like to, you know, follow along with the code in this point in the tutorial, or if you get stuck, you can feel free to download it and use this as a guide. All right, so a quick addendum to this video. Um, I realized I did something kind of stupid. I put the uh, token sale directory inside of another token sale directory. Uh, so if you have followed along with that, my apologies. That's not what I intended. Um, I'll show you how to clean it up. So from this level, we'll uh, just CD up a level. And uh, we're going to copy all the files from the token sales subdirectory to the parent. So let's do cp-rp token sale. Um, I'm just going to move everything to the current level. All right. 
we could see uh, ls l. Let's actually do al to ensure that we've copied our git directory. Okay, looks like everything's correct. So uh, let's get status. All right, we can see that the old token sale directory is still there. So let's remove that. Rm rf token sale. All right, get status. All right, and everything should be good to go. All right, guys, that's the uh, end of the second video in this series about creating your own cryptocurrency on Ethereum and building your own ICO. So be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you can find the next video when it comes out. And if it's already out, you can check the video at the end of the link in this, uh, at the end of this video. And until then, thanks for watching DAP University. Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University. So welcome back to the multi-part series where I'm showing you how to create your own cryptocurrency and hold your own ICO on Ethereum. This is video number three in the series. In the last video, we started building our token contract. And in this video, we'll continue building out that token contract. So be sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications with the bell below in order to see the next video in the series when it comes out. And if it's out already, you can check out that video at the end of this, or you can just watch the next video in the playlist. So first things first, if you haven't watched the other videos in the series so far, it's probably good to do that so that you can catch up and follow along. And if you want to download the code at this point in the tutorial, you can check out the link to uh, GitHub in the description below. You can just download the project at this point in the tutorial and follow along. So before we jump into uh, building out our contract more, let's just make sure that uh, Ganache is still running. Okay, Ganache is good. We've got our blockchain running. So let's go to our token contract. So we left off, um, we set the total supply of all of the tokens in existence uh, for our uh, token here. So and we did that with the constructor whenever the contract was deployed the first time. So I'm going to clear out those comments and let's see what we want to do next. So the first thing I want to do instead of uh, you know hard coding this total supply is I actually want to accept uh, a supply as an argument to this function. And again, this is the constructor for our smart contract. It's the function with the same name as the contract. And I can add a, uh, an argument to this function, this constructor function like this. And this will be an unsigned integer, 256. And we'll call this the initial supply. All right. Now, when I accept this initial supply, I actually want to set it to the total supply here. We'll just say the initial supply, right? The total supply is going to be equal to the initial supply. We'll do more with this initial supply variable here in a moment. And you'll notice that uh, I've used an underscore in front of initial supply. Um, that's because there's a convention in Solidity that we use underscores uh, at the beginning of you know vari variables that are only available inside this function. Again, this is a local variable, whereas this is a state variable that we've defined here. Um, there's actually nothing magical about this uh, underscore. It's just a convention. So if we are passing in the initial supply here, and this is the constructor function, how do we actually pass an argument into this whenever we want to interact with the smart contract as we're developing our project? Well, in order to do that, we need to visit our migration file that we created in the last section. So we'll do that. We'll go to our deploy contracts migration. And this deploy function accepts multiple arguments. At first, we can... Uh, you know, pass in the contract abstraction like we did uh, for our initial deployment. 
but we can also add you know subsequent arguments and those will be passed into the constructor function for our smart contract and you'll notice whenever we uh, did this the first time we set the initial supply to 1 million so I'll do the same right here all right 1 million Now that we've done that, let's try to run our tests. Again, we uh, wrote a test to make sure that our uh, you know total supply is set to one million. We'll see if we broke anything. We'll do that with truffle test. All right, they pass. Now the next thing that we want to implement is a way to keep track of uh, the balance for each account that might own some tokens. We want a way to, you know, say uh, how many DAP tokens do I have with my, you know, specific address, or how many DAP tokens do you have with your specific address. So we can see the documentation for that for the ERC twenty standard. Again, we're, you know trying to make a token that complies with this standard so that it can be used on exchanges and things like that. And we can see that this standard gives us uh, a function that's called balance of. And this returns the account balance of another account with address owner. So essentially we want a function that uh, is called balance of that takes one argument that's going to be uh, the owner or you know some sort of address and this is going to be a reader function this is why it's a constant and it's going to return uh, an unsigned integer that's going to be uh, the balance. So it's a pretty simple function basically it just takes in uh, an address and returns a balance. Now, just like we did with total supply, I'm not going to write a complete function. I'm going to use the, uh, we're going to declare a, a public variable that will give us a reader function for free, just like we did with total supply. But instead of defining, you know, a simple uh, unsigned integer data type, we're going to define a mapping. Now, a mapping in solidity is like uh, an associative array in other languages or a hash, a hash table. And we can declare a mapping like this. We say mapping and we give it basically a key and a value. Now, yeah, so a mapping is a, a, essentially a key value store like an associative array in another language. And the key that we want to use for the mapping is an address. And the value is going to be an unsigned integer. And we're going to say this is public. And we'll call this balance of. All right, so let's just recap here. So this is a mapping. This is a, uh, a new structure in our, in our contract. Um, this mapping is going to be called balance of. Uh, and it's going to be available publicly in our contract. And because we, you know, declared this variable uh, public, it's going to give us something like the ERC20 standard uh, requires. It's going to give us a reader function. Uh, sorry, it gives us a reader function here that uh, is called balance of, and it's going to take in the address uh, of, of the owner, and it's going to return an unsigned integer. So essentially, uh, the argument for that function is going to be the key that gets looked up in this mapping and the return value uh, is going to just be this unsigned integer which will be the balance of this particular address. Now the first thing that we want to do with this balance of mapping is actually allocate this you know total supply or this initial supply of the token. So you know this contract is responsible for uh, knowing where each token is you know we initially said hey we want to mint you know 1 million dap tokens uh, but this contract is also supposed to know who has each dap token and that's going to correspond to an address so anytime a token is bought and sold or transferred 
uh, this mapping is going to be responsible for knowing where each of those tokens live. You know, it's gonna it's gonna be responsible for knowing who has uh, each token. And when we deploy our contract, we have to you know give all the tokens to a particular address. They have to actually have a starting point. So we can do that here. We're going to uh, allocate the initial supply. Again, we want to, you know, say we're going to take these 1 million tokens and actually put them somewhere. And let's do this in a test-driven fashion. Let's actually write the test first, and we'll write the code to make it pass. In order to do that, I'm going to build on the test we wrote in the previous uh, lesson. So I'm going to enter a new line here after our first assertion, and I'm going to say, you know, return um, token instance, which we set here. This is going to be a balance of accounts zero, and then we'll uh, tap into this promise chain. Then function, we'll call this admin balance. This will be the administrator. And we'll assert that the admin balance is equal to, you know, this. We'll say, you know, it allocates the initial supply. to the admin account. And let's go ahead and uh, actually declare this variable here. And we'll clean this up too, just for consistency's sake. All right, so let's explain what's happening here. I'm running a test. Actually, let's do this. Let's put these side by side. So I'm writing a test to say that whenever we initialize our contract, we want to take the you know initial supply that we accepted with this argument, and we want to allocate that entire supply to you know an administrator of this token. And since we have accounts available inside of our test suite here, we have you know, all of the accounts available uh, from Ganache. We can take the first account from this zero-based index array, and we can, you know, check the balance of that account to its ensure uh, that it has been set to, uh, you know, this amount. And that's, you know, we haven't written the code for that yet. We're doing this in a test-driven fashion. Um, but that's what we want to check for. We want to check that after we run this constructor that the admin account has, you know, 1 million tokens that we're reading from this mapping. So we can uh, run this test. It's going to fail. Hopefully there's no errors, but we expect just a failure at the moment. All right. So it's equal to zero, which is which is what we expect at the moment. Um, this uh, doesn't shouldn't have anything, and that also gives you a hint that this mapping is going to default to zero. It's actually uh, an interesting characteristic. S mappings and solidity um, have default values, and in the case of an unsighted integer, it's going to be zero. So let's make this code pass. What we can do is um, say that. Let's actually do it above. We can say balance of. This is how we write to this mapping. Balance of. We do msg sender. And that's equal to the initial supply. Now let's explain what's happening here. We can write a value um, 
with this mapping by using uh, you know brackets like this. This is pretty standard notation that you might have seen in another language. And we pass it the key and we set the value. Now, this might look unfamiliar if you're new to Solidity. This is, uh, MSG is a, uh, a keyword, or sorry, not a keyword, it's a global variable um, in Solidity that has uh, several you know, different uh, values that you can read from it. In this case, sender is the address of, uh, you know, the address that called this function. And in Solidity, you know, there is metadata uh, that can be passed to a function outside of its initial arguments. And um, the from value is always going to correspond to the sender. And in this case, when we run our migrations in development, it's going to be the first account um, in Ganache because that's what Truffle uh, is going to default to. So essentially, we're saying that we want, you know, to write the balance of uh, this account right here to be whatever we initialize our contract with. We want to take the initial supply and just set it all to uh, this address. So again, we're writing to this mapping. This is the key. This is the value. And this is the balance of mapping that we declared here. And msg.sender is the account that uh, deployed the contract. So we can run our spec to see if that works. All right, looks like there's an issue here. That's because I had a typo, my fault. Do that again. All right, and it passed. Now, really quickly, I can show you some more resources to look at if you want to uh, you know, kind of read about some of those things we just talked about, like msg.sender. You can go to solidity.readthedocs.io to see uh, the documentation for the Solidity programming language. And here I'm on the page that talks about, you know, units and global variables. So here we can read about um, kind of the, you know, global variables uh, that are available to us. And we can see msg.sender here. This is always corresponding to an address. And it says that this is the sender of the message or the current function call. And you can see everything that's available to you in Solidity. Like now, you can see information about the transaction. This is the gas price and the origin. Uh, the block, um, gas left, things like that. So feel free to examine this if you'd like. You can also uh, kind of open the console really fast to... Uh, maybe demonstrate a few things. We can use our Web3 object. Again, Web3 is uh, just a library that allows us to uh, interact with uh, our smart contracts and the blockchain. I can show you the accounts that are listed in Truffle. You can see a list of those here. And I can show you the uh, account. You know, We can reference these by index. This will be the first account. This is the same thing as uh, you know the accounts that come in our spec. This all the accounts that are going to get injected here are the ones that uh, are available uh, with our Web3 object, just like this. And also, I can give you an example of you know what uh, is coming into our function whenever we call msg.sender. So I'm just going to do this with pseudocode. This won't actually be a uh, a function call in our contract because we haven't really gotten to this point yet and uh, we can look at that in a later video but for example if we had an instance of this contract I could say you know token dot transfer we're actually going to implement this function later and I could say uh, you know let's transfer well let's actually look at the transfer documentation we can say it takes uh, you know an address and it takes a value so we could say transfer uh, to web3.eth.accounts0. Uh, that's going to be the account that we want to transfer it from. Well, actually, let's, let's go to 1, since we know this one doesn't have any, uh, uh, any tokens yet. So this is who we're going to transfer to. We're going to transfer from um, 
Well, actually, let's look at the value. We want to transfer, let's just say, one token. And this is how we get access to msu.sender in our function. So this is the metadata that I was talking about earlier. These are, you know, the two arguments, the uh, address uh, two and the unsigned integer value. You know, we expect this function to only take two arguments, but we take some additional function metadata. We can say from, and this is going to be the account, three.eth.accounts, and we're going to say zero. And this is how we would specify, you know, the account that this is getting sent from. And if we were to call this function and, and you know, develop it locally, uh, from metadata is going to be who msg.sender is uh, in this function. Now, since this is a constructor, this is going to happen under the hood whenever our contract gets migrated. Uh, but I wanted to give you an example of that so that you're not just sitting there scratching your head. Now, let's go ahead and... Uh, add some more attributes to our token. We're going to give it some basic properties like a name and a symbol. And uh, we can see you know, what those things are available to us in our specification here. This is the you know, ERC20 standard. Let's give our token um, a name. We'll give it a symbol. And we'll give it, um, I'm also gonna give it a standard. So, Again, we're going to use public variables for this, so we're going to, you know, get reader functions for free for our name uh, and our symbol. So let's go back to our contract, and we want to add a name. Let's just do it up here. We want to add a name. We want to add a symbol. But we want to do this kind of in a test-driven fashion. So we can write the test for this. We'll uh, add some new tests at the beginning. And let's actually update this one. It sets the total supply. We'll say it allocates initial supply. Okay. And we'll say, write a new spec that says it uh, initializes the contract with the correct values. Give us a function. All right. So I'm going to give us one column here just to see this better. And what I'm going to do is kind of start off like we did here. We're going to return dap token dot deployed, uh, then function. And we're going to get an instance of our app or our token here, sorry. And we'll say, you know, token instance equals instance. And we want to return uh, token instance name. All right. And we'll use our promise chain name. And we'll assert that the name. Uh, let's say let's say name is equal to DAP token. We'll say let's, let's do it this way, and we'll say that this has the correct name. All right, so that's our uh, first assertion. We can run that spec. Now let's get out of our console here. Let's do truffle test. All right, it's failing. All right, we can say token instance dot name is not a function. That's what we expect because we haven't uh, written the uh, the getter for the name yet. So let's go do that. We can write a getter for our name like this. It's pretty easy. We'll just do the name first. We'll say we'll declare a public variable of string type. And we'll call it name, and we'll say it's uh, DAP token. All right. And we can see this is the same name as our, our test. So let's run our spec and see if it passes. All right, it passes. 
So let's go ahead and assemble as well. We can uh, add a new line here and say that uh, we want to return the token instance uh, symbol. Again, we do our promise chain. And we want to assert that the symbol is dap. All right. So our spec, it's going to fail. All right, token.symbol is not a function, so we expect. So let's just uh, copy this. String public symbol. We want to call this uh, dap. So again, this symbol is essentially just, you know, what, uh, how our token is going to be reference on like an exchange or if you wanted to see it on a list uh, you guys are probably pretty familiar with that this is just the the name of the token this is the symbol so let's run this test now let's see if it passes all right it passes and let's do uh, one more thing let's go ahead and add a standard this is what I'm going to do. So then function standard. Let's return that here. Return token instance standard. Okay. And then we'll assert uh, equal Oops. standard. And we'll say uh, the standard is dap token version 1.0. We'll say it has the correct standard. Okay. Run that. It's going to fail. The standard is not a function. That's what we expect. I'm just going to copy this, add a new line. So string public standard. We'll call this uh, uh, dap token version 1.0. And we'll see if that passes. There we go, it passes. So one thing to note here, standard is not part of the ERC20 implementation. This is something that I've just used for my tokens that uh, kind of gives you uh, the version. So I'm just gonna use that here. And name and symbol are both part of the ERC20 standard, but they are optional. Um, but they're pretty nice to have so that you can, uh, you know, know your token name and your token symbol if it's going to get listed on something like an exchange. Now, the next thing that we want to do is add a transfer function. We want to add the ability to actually you know pay with tokens or send tokens or you know move them from one place to another we'll take a look at that here in the documentation we'll read about the transfer function here so this transfers value uh amount of tokens to address to and must fire the transfer event so this function should throw if the from account balance does not have enough tokens to spend. Note transfers of zero must be treated as normal transfers and fire the transfer event. So let's see what we need out of this function. It uh, is going to accept two arguments. It's going to accept an address that we're transferring to and it's going to uh, accept a value. This is going to be the amount of tokens that we want uh, to transfer to. And um, it's got to do a couple different things. It's got to uh, throw an exception if the person sending the tokens doesn't have enough. It's got to trigger a transfer event. And it's also got to return this specific value. It's got to return a Boolean value, which is going to be true or false, depending on whether the transfer was successful or not. 
Now we've got our work cut out for us. I'm going to uh, sketch out what we need here. We need a transfer function. It's got to trigger a transfer event. Um, it's got to it's got to uh, trigger an exception. Yeah, if the account doesn't have enough. It's got to um, return a boolean. And um, yeah, we'll just start with that for now. So we'll go ahead and sketch out our transfer function here. We'll start by uh, declaring this function like this function. We'll call it transfer just like the standard. And remember we saw that it requires two arguments. It requires the address that we're transferring to. We'll use an underscore here for two. And this is again the data type that we're transferring to. You know, this address is a special data type in Solidity that corresponds to the user's connection to the blockchain. And we'll do an unsigned integer of value. And this is going to be the number of tokens that we actually want to transfer. Now, the visibility of this function must be public because we want it to, you know, respond to the public interface. We want, you know, people to be able to call this function when we are using this standard. And we're going to specify the return value. This will be a Boolean data type, and we'll just call this success. All right. Okay, so that's how we declare this function. Now we'll have to uh, implement a few things here. Let's go ahead and put these inside of our function. All right. Now we can also do this uh, in a test-driven fashion. I'm gonna go over here to our test file and we'll uh, start uh, you know, a new thing here. I'm going to add some lines so that we can have more room here. Let's start by saying um, you know, it transfers ownership. We'll pass this a function. Now we'll do the same thing we've done every other test. We'll return to app token deployed. Then function, get our instance. Oops. And we'll set that the token instance. All right, so the first thing we wanna do is um, test the require statement, right? So we want to throw an exception if the account that we're trying to, uh, you know, transfer from the person who calls this function, the sender, you know, like msg.sender, the sender of this function doesn't have enough uh, tokens in their, uh, you know, balance. So essentially we want to check this mapping um, that you know allocates the balance and if you know someone tries to send tokens that they don't have we want to stop the execution of this function and uh, you know raise some kind of exception and I'll show you how we do that I'm going to actually just paste this in here okay so we want to test this require statement by first transferring uh, something larger than the sender's balance so we know we only have, you know, a million tokens available. So we know that the sender uh, won't have a million tokens, won't have this many tokens. That's, you know, ridiculous. So we'll return the uh, result of this, call then. And then we'll say assert fail. This is how we do this. And then we'll catch, we'll say function, we'll get the error. And we want to assert that this error has a message. We want to say assert 
uh, error message. We want to read read something out of this, and we want to try to say that it contains revert. All right. And again, we're just getting, this is going to be the transaction receipt. Well, it's not the receipt since it's an error message, right? We're going to get the error. Um, we're going to get the message out of it. And we're going to just ensure that uh, it contains this uh, substring revert. So we can do that. And we can try to run this spec or this test. See what happens. Again, we haven't, we haven't written any code for this yet. All right, so the message must contain revert, and that's not happening, just like we expect, because we actually haven't written any code yet. So let's try to implement that. Now let's recap. We want to uh, say if the sender of this function, right, so msg.sender, sender, that we saw earlier. This is the you know way that we capture who's calling this function, like this. If this person doesn't have um, enough tokens to transfer, then we want to raise an exception. For example, if this person only has one token in their account and they want to transfer ten tokens to somebody else, they can't do that because they only have one token. Um, similarly, if they only had you know ten tokens and they wanted to transfer a hundred tokens, they can't do that either. So we first want to read the balance of this person's account, just like we did here. Balance of msg.sender. And we're not going to assign this to anything like we did here. We're just going to read the value out of it. And we want to see if it's greater than or equal to this value. All right. This is the value that's getting passed in. So when we call this function and we say, I want to transfer 10 tokens to some address, we pass in the address that we want to send it to, and we pass you know, 10 as the value. And we want to ensure that this person has at least 10 tokens in their account, which we're going to read with this balance of mapping that we created here, and that we you know, use when we set the initial supply when we deployed the contract. So we'll do that like this, with the require. All right, and this is uh, something that's special in Solidity. So require is just going to say, if this evaluates to true, continue function execution. And so everything else will, below will get run. If this is false, then stop function execution and throw an error. And if you're using uh, you know, gas in this transaction, which we are, because this is writing to the blockchain, um, then all the gas spent up to this point uh, will get used, but any gas remaining that would have gotten used here is going to get refunded to the sender. So let's try to run that. Triple test, see if our test pass. All right, our test pass. Now the next thing that we want to do is actually, you know, transfer the balance. We want to take, uh, you know, the amount of uh, tokens that we called, you know, that we sent in this function, uh, and transfer them from the sending account, right, msg.sender, and we want to we want to assign those to uh, the address that's getting passed in here. So the tokens are going to go from you know this account to this account, and we can you know do this in a test-driven fashion. So we'll go back to our test here. And we can say, uh, well, let's just do this here. Um, let's do this. We'll say rule we'll return uh, token instance. We'll actually uh, do a transfer. We'll actually call it this time. We'll do accounts. Uh, we'll do it to account one, and we'll say you know, 2,500 or 250,000. Let's do that. All right. 
So let's do this from, we have a three to ETH, or no, sorry, we have accounts here. We'll do it from the first account. This is where the initial supply has been allocated. And we've returned this, so we'll call the promise chain, then function, and we'll say uh, this is actually going to be a receipt that we'll inspect here momentarily. So we'll skip that step for now. Um, just notice uh, that whenever we create this transaction, you know, a, a, a transaction receipt's going to be here. So we'll skip the receipt for now, and we'll return. Um, the token instance you know, balance of the uh, account that we you know sent these tokens to accounts uh, one sorry and we'll also tap into our promise chain then function uh, we'll call this balance And we want to assert that the uh, well, let's see, assert equal the balance to number is equal to uh, let's see here twenty five or two hundred fifty thousand. That's what we transferred here. And we're going to say it adds the amount to the receiving account. Okay. And we can also say we can check the balance of the, uh, sorry, typos get a little crazy here. Uh, the account that sent the transaction accounts zero. Okay, so we want to inspect this balance as well and say that um, that this balance actually went down by the amount that we transferred from, and we'll assert equal the uh, balance. Yeah, two number, just like we did up there. And the balance of this account that sent the transaction has gone down by 250,000, right? So we started with a million and we subtract 250,000 to get 750,000. And we'll say this deducts uh, amount from the sending account. All right. Now we can run this spec see if it passes it should fail as we expect Let's see if you got any errors in our test no just uh, errors in the um, you know just uh, assertions that aren't passing which is what we expect now before we go try to implement this I wanted to make a quick note about uh, how we're calling some of these functions you'll notice that I used uh, call here and I uh, didn't use call uh, here, and I'll explain why. So call in this case just allows us to call our functions um, and inspect. It doesn't actually create any transactions, right? So uh, if I call this function, you know, without using dot call, actually call it directly here, it's going to create a transaction, and that's why we get a transaction receipt here instead of you know the a boolean return value that we're going to implement uh, at the end of our, our function here. So just in summary, this does not trigger a transaction and this does trigger a transaction. And that's why we get a transaction receipt here that we will inspect momentarily. So let's go ahead and uh, write the code that's going to make this spec pass. We'll say um, balance of. This is msg.sender. Again, this is the account that's sending the transaction. And we're going to deduct this 
with the decrement operator. We're going to make it go down by the value that was passed into the function, right? And we're going to increment the balance of the address that we're, you know, sending these tokens to. And we're going to pass in two. And we're going to increment it by the value. Now this is a very uh, standard, just uh, financial uh, transaction that you might have seen in other programs. It's just deducting the balance uh, from one account and adding it to another. And this is the code that we need in order to make this uh, test pass. So let's give it a try. Oh, we got a failure. Let's see what it is here. Adds the amount expected, 250,000 to equal 250, oh, yeah, sorry, I added one extra zero in that test. We'll just change that here. Run our specs again. All right, and they pass. Okay, so the next thing that we want to do is trigger a transfer event. If we notice, uh, you know, back in our documentation, this says that uh, all of the functions in the, you know, that implement this ERC20 standard, uh, you know, must fire a transfer event. And, uh, you know, this event has to transfer even for, you know, zero values. They must, you know, trigger a transfer event anyway. So that's the next thing that we'll implement. We'll do a transfer event. In order to emit a transfer event, we must declare one. We can do that like this. It's pretty easy. We can say event transfer. And we will pass this some, uh, some arguments. We'll do the address. This will be uh, indexed. This is going to be the account that, uh, you know, that sent the transaction. Uh, sorry, it's a syntax error. Um, we're going to add the account that uh, is going to. Sorry, I'm full of typos today, guys. Uh, and we're going to add the amount. All right. And we can uh, actually go back to our documentation to see that event. I'll show you. Events, transfer. So we want an event that looks like this. Address is indexed as from, address is indexed to, and this is the value. So this event in Solidity is really just something that the contract is going to admit that uh, you know a consumer can subscribe to. You know, we can listen to uh, this token at any time a uh, you know event is triggered, we can get alerted about it. Um, we can also listen to, you know, events that we care about. We can listen to, you know, events that are triggered, uh, you know, from this account or to this account or for this value. Well, not for this value because it's not indexed. But, um, yeah, you get the idea. So we want to trigger this event here, but we want to write the test first. We can test for events by looking at the transaction receipt. And uh, that's what we'll dig into here. And I'm going to paste in uh, s these specs here. All right, let's see what they do. First, we're going to say that this receipt has logs. This is where you know our uh, event information is going to be. It's going to be in the logs. And whenever we dig into these logs, we want to find the first one. We want to ensure that's an event. It's going to be a transfer event. And we want to make sure that this event has all the arguments that we uh, expected. So it's going to be from this account, because we just called it here. Uh, it's going to be going to this account, because we just you know added that here. And it's going to be for this value, uh, which is you know the same value that we pass into this function. So let's run this test. We expect it to fail. All right. 
It expected uh, one event, but got zero. So let's actually implement this event. It's pretty easy. Um, take that out. And we'll say, you know, transfer. This is how we call this event in Solidity. We'll say msg.sender because that's the uh, account that it's coming from. This is the account that's calling this function. And we want to uh, add you know, the account that it's going to. It's going to be two. And we want to give it the value. And that's just the you know, value that's coming into this function. All right, so let's run this test and see if that passes. All right, it passes. Now the last thing that we want to do for this function is to return a, uh, a Boolean value because that's also uh, part of our specification. We can see that here. Um, the uh, value must uh, return a Boolean. So we can do that in our function. We've also declared that here, returns a Boolean of success. But let's write the spec first. So we go into our test file. And we can, um, you know, we'll just, uh, we'll, we'll, let's, let's basically, you know, we'll do kind of what I said earlier. We'll, we'll call transfer with uh, this call function. We won't actually trigger a transaction because we want to actually inspect the return value of the function, not just the transaction receipt. So we can do that here. Let's just do it below. Uh, let's, let's do it below here. We can do return. This will just be a fake transfer. We're not actually trying to do anything. Uh, we just want to inspect the return value of the function. So the token uh, instance, the transfer call, and we'll say accounts. We'll go to account one. And we'll say you know 2,500 or 25,000. This is the same kind of transaction we do here, and uh, let's just do the same parameters. Okay, and we can you know close this out. And say then, and this will be the actual return value of the function because we're using call. This is the Boolean value of success, which we defined. I'm sorry, let's kill that. And let's assert equal that the um, success is equal to true. Sorry guys, full of typos today. So let's run this test, see if it passes. We expect it to fail. All right, it fails. It, uh, it expected false to equal true. It got false, but we wanted true. So we'll go into our function and we'll basically just say uh, return true. Now, we can specify this only if uh, all of this code is executed successfully. That's kind of why this is here, to say that this function you know, uh, uh, worked. So let's go to our test and run it again. All right, and it passes. All right, so we have successfully implemented a transfer function for our token. Let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and commit some of these changes. So we'll uh, get add dot. We'll add everything. We'll uh, commit. We'll call this number two, and we'll say uh, transfer tokens. And again, uh, I'm going to. Uh, add a link to this commit at the uh, end of this video. I'll put it down in the description below. This will be, you know, up on GitHub so you can uh, check out this point of the tutorial. All right, and that's it, guys. That's uh, it for today. 
that's part three of our uh, series where we're showing you how to create your own cryptocurrency and your own ICO on Ethereum. We've uh, you know worked on this ERC20 token in a test-driven fashion, and that's our stopping point. So be sure to check out the next video when it comes out. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications with the bell below so that you can see that video when it comes out. And if it's already out, you can just check the link at the end of the video or just wait for the next video in the playlist. And until then, thanks for watching DAP University. Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University. So welcome back to the multi-part tutorial where I'm showing you how to create your own cryptocurrency and ICO on Ethereum. In this video, we're going to be continuing uh, working on our token contract for DAP token. In the last video, we uh, built out the transfer function. Today, we're going to add a few more uh, pieces of functionality that are required by the ERC-20 standard. So if you haven't seen those previous videos, be sure to check those out. They'll be uh, kind of required in order to continue on with this tutorial. And if you'd like to pick up the code along uh, this point in the tutorial, check the GitHub link down in the description below. And also be sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications with the bell below so that you can get notified about the other videos in this series when they come out. So if you're picking up at this point in the tutorial, um, we can do a couple things just to make sure that we're good to go to continue working on our project. We will first, uh, you know, ensure that Ganache is running. And it looks like it is, and we have, you know, some Ether in our accounts. So we'll minimize that. We'll also run our tests to ensure that our contracts are working as expected. All right, test pass. So in the last video, we worked on uh, this transfer function, and this allowed you know an address uh, to transfer DAP tokens, you know the token that we're working on in this contract. It allowed the address to transfer tokens um, from their account to someone else. Basically, it allowed them to send tokens, and this was all you know done on their behalf. Basically, you know a, a, an address would. Um, and this is how they would basically spend the tokens, right? Now, the next thing that we want to do for the ERC-20 standard is implement, you know, a few functions that handle transfers where the account did not initially initiate the transfer. Um, and this can be referred to as a delegated transfer. So we want to implement two functions that we we'll, can take a look at in the ERC-20 standard. Actually three, but we'll, uh, we'll write two here and we'll um, kind of automatically generate one with solidity by declaring another public variable and we'll see that in a second. So we want to handle delegated transfers. We basically, it's going to be a two-step process. Um, one function is going to allow our account to approve a transfer and another function is actually going to handle uh, the delegated transfer. It's actually going to, uh, you know, s seal a transfer from, you know, one account to another without the sender initiating the transaction. Now also I should mention that the next little bit of functionality that we're building out um, won't actually be used in our token sale. Uh, but part of this tutorial is to show you how to build a complete ERC-20 token. And if you remember, the standard that we've been reading through, um, you know, has a list of required functionality in order for our token to be uh, compliant with the standard. And that's what we're building out here. So let's take a look at uh, the next level of functionality that we want to build out for this token to handle this delegated transfer. There are a few things. The first thing is, um, well, I'll just take a look. We want to implement a transfer from, uh, a, an approve function, and an allowance. Okay? 
So we'll step through these kind of one by one and uh, kind of explain what they do. So without like just reading off what's here, from a high level, uh, approve is essentially going to allow someone to approve another account to spend tokens on their behalf. So if I uh, were to call this function, um, I could say that, you know, my account A approves account B uh, to spend, you know, C amount of tokens on my behalf, and that C would be DAP tokens. So an example of how you might use something like approve would be on an exchange, right? So you put a limit order in that would say, you know, I want X amount of tokens uh, to be sold. And, um, you know, the exchange, you, you're basically approving the exchange to transfer X tokens on your behalf. Uh, the transfer fum function would actually handle that transfer. So once you have approved a certain amount, um, you know, the third party address, uh, you know, address B can actually execute that transfer. So once we've approved it, this is someone else basically calling a transfer on our behalf. And it's a lot like this transfer function we built out in the last video, but the transfer function in the last video, we are always calling our own transfers on our own behalf. And the transfer from is, you know, a, a third party or calling transfers on our behalf or this delegated transfer that I mentioned a minute ago. And the other thing we want to build out is this allowance. And this allowance is um, basically the allotted amount that we have approved to transfer. So going back to the example I said a minute ago, um, if I'm account A and I approve account B to spend, you know, X tokens, or, or sorry, C tokens on my behalf, C DAP tokens, um, that amount gets stored in this allowance. So if I say, you know, account A, or if I'm account A and I approve account B to spend C tokens, C tokens goes in here and it knows that account A has approved account B to spend those C tokens. Now, a lot of that's kind of abstract and maybe a lot at first, um, but we can jump into writing that code and doing it in a test-driven fashion and hopefully that you can see um, you know, the examples and the tests and uh, follow along. And also in, in addition to those uh, functions, we have one more event that we must implement. This is the uh, approval event. This is uh, a requirement. Anytime we call the approve function that we mentioned a minute ago, um, and Anytime that that function call is successful, uh, we must trigger and log this approval event. And that's also something that we'll implement in this video. All right, so let's jump into building this delegated transfer. So just as a recap, we want uh, an approve function. Sorry, let me pull this up so you can see it. We want an approve function. We want a uh, transfer from function. I'm going to give us some space here. Um, and we also want to build an allowance. And we need to build a transfer event. All right, save that for now. So the first thing that we want to build is this approve event. Now in order to build this, we'll just sketch out this function. This will take uh, an address. This will be the spender. This will give a, uh, an amount, basically, of an unsigned integer. This will be a public function, be public visibility. And we will also specify the return value based upon the uh, standard we just saw, would be a Boolean. 
And you'll notice that this is a pretty common theme with these ERC20 functions. Um, you know, we want a return value to know the uh, result of the function whenever we call it. That's the same thing that we'll implement here. So let's just take a look here. So this approved function accepts an address of the spender and the uh, value as an unsigned integer. So these two arguments represent the account that we want to approve to us to send on our behalf. So for example, uh, you know, if I'm account A, I want to approve account B. That's what I would, you know, pass in here. This might be, you know, the address on the exchange. And I want to approve account B to spend, you know, amount C DAP tokens with this function. And remember, msg.sender keeps track of the account that called this function. We saw that in previous videos. Um, and, you know, that's just function metadata that's going to get passed in here. Um, so that's how we keep track of who is approving this. So msg.sender is going to be essentially, say, me in this case. And I'm going to approve this account to spend this many tokens. So let's... Uh, Go ahead and run a test. We'll uh, give ourselves some space so you all can see. Um, I normally don't put you know extra space in my files like this, but uh, I'm really just doing this for the tutorial so that you all can uh, see the code at the top of the screen here. It's not really best practice, but just explaining why. So let's say you know it uh, approves tokens uh, for delegated transfer. And we'll pass it a function. And we'll say return dap token deployed. Oops. Then function. And we'll get track of the instance. And this is, you know, pretty standard like we've done in every other test, token instance. Say return token instance prove call. This will be accounts one. This is 100. All right, so let's explain this. So essentially, we are, uh, you know, taking our contract, our token contract, and we're calling the uh, approved function with uh, just this call here. Now, I remember from the last video, uh, if I'm, you know, adding call here, this doesn't actually create a transaction. This uh, simply, you know, calls this function in Solidity without uh, writing to the blockchain. So if I, you know, do call from account one and 100 tokens. I'm not actually writing uh, this data to the uh, blockchain and changing all the data in our tests. I'm just doing it for this, uh, you know, small instance here. So we'll call then. And the reason I'm doing that um, at this point is a so that we don't change the data, but uh, B, I really just want to inspect the return value of this function. So, based on our standard, right, you know, we want this thing to return true. So, let's go ahead and test for that. We'll start equal, success. We'll say true. It returns true. All right. So let's run our tests. All right, failed. Doesn't return true. It's what we expect, so we'll make it return true. All right.
All right, passes. So let's uh, go back to our standard and see, you know, what we need uh, to implement. We'll go to the approve function. All right. And so it allows the spender to withdraw uh, from your account multiple times. And all right. So the approve function is going to build upon uh, a couple things. We're going to handle the allowance. And we're going to handle um, the approve event. Because that's what this says here. It sets the allowance. And also, it uh, triggers this approve event. Must trigger on any successful call to approve. So we'll uh, we'll build out the approve event first. We can do that like this, just like we saw this uh, transfer event. We want to uh, do an approve. Sorry. We'll say event approve. Again, if you missed this in the last video, uh, events and solidity are just a way to, you know, admit uh, that something happened from a contract, and you know, consumers can subscribe to these events, and you know, these events are also going to get logged in the transaction logs, um, and you know, we can also subscribe to events that we care about with these index values like from and to. So let's take a look at the standard and see um, you know, what our event must have. So it must have an address. And this be, must be indexed. This is the owner of the tokens. And this is the address that must be indexed of the spender of the tokens. And this is the value, which is the number of tokens that are being approved. So let's do this here. We'll say address. This will be in, uh, indexed. This will be owner. This will be another address. This will be indexed spender. And this will be an unsigned integer of the value. So this event's going to say that, you know, I, the owner, account A, approved uh, account B, the spender, uh, to, you know, transfer you know, C number of DAP tokens. And that's what this event, you know, uh, declares. So we, now that we have uh, written that event, we want to add it to our function, but let's write our test first. So what we can do um, is actually call approve. So we want to say return token instance, approve, I want to approve account one, I want to approve 100. Now look, this is different from what we did up here. Remember I said that uh, we used call so that we don't trigger a transaction so that we can inspect the return value of this function and not modify any data. Uh, but here we do want to actually uh, call approve. We want to create a transaction uh, mostly so that we can inspect the transaction receipt and you know dig into the receipt and find the logs. And we want to you know dig into the logs so that we can check for the approve event that it's going to be called or emitted whenever we call this approve function like this. And um, we'll do something similar to what we did here when we check for uh, the logs. I'm actually going to just uh, kind of modify this and paste it in. All right. So let's see what's going on here. We want to inspect this transaction receipt. We want to ensure that it has logs. So that there's going to be one log there or one event. Um, we want to check it and we want to say that it's the approval event. 
we want to check that it's uh, got an owner. We want to check it that it's got a spender. And we want to check it to see that it has a value. So we can save this, run our tests. All right, fails. Oh, accounts. That's that's actually a spec problem. Let's uh, fix that. It's my fault. It's a typo. All right, it fails like as we expect. So uh, it did not trigger any events, and we expect it to have one. So let's go uh, into our function and call the the approval event. That's pretty easy. We just do that like this. MSG.sender, spender, and value. All right, so let's uh, kind of just look over this really fast. You know, this is the approval event that we just defined here. Oh, sorry, approve, my fault. Approve event that we defined here. Um, MSG.sender, remember, is how we get access to the account that's calling this function. Uh, the spender is going to be the uh, you know address that we are approving to spend our DAP tokens, and the value is going to be the number of DAP tokens that we are approving. So let's run our tests. Uh oh, the event should be approval, and I think I might have missed named this actually. Let's go ahead and check our standard. So this is uh, important that we call things the right way uh, because we want our token to be compliant. All right, so that's my fault, guys. I'm sorry. This needs to be the approval event, not approve. Sorry, I've done this a hundred times, but um, kind of just uh, made a little error there. So we want to call this approval. All right, so we'll go back to our spec. I'm this is why you write specs, <laughs> to make sure that your code is doing the uh, correct thing. So it would be approval event. And we'll run this test. All right, could not connect to your Ethereum client. Um, yeah, guys, I'm I'm uh, glad we're actually running into these problems on the uh, video because these are the kinds of things that uh, you run into with smart contract development. Let's check Ganache. Womp womp. So Ganache has crashed. Let's relaunch. All right. So you all might have experienced this before. This is pretty normal. Um, let's try to run these tests again. All right, they pass. Now that we've transferred the approval event, we want to uh, really implement the meat of this function, which is going to be setting the allowance. We want to say, hey, you know, this other account, this is how much they're allowed to spend. So in order to do that, uh, we want to create an allowance. And that's kind of what we mentioned up here. Now, if we look at our uh, standard, we can look at allowance. Oops, right here. And this is saying, you know, allowance is a function uh, that takes an owner and a uh, spender and returns, uh, you know, the balance that's remaining. This is the uh, amount which the spender is still allowed to draw from the owner. So essentially, um, if we just set this balance with the approve and we try to read out of the allowance mapping, it's just going to return the amount of tokens that we just approved for if nothing else has changed. So instead of writing a, you know, a long, long form function here, uh, like we saw in the standard, I'm going to just use a public variable. It's going to be a mapping and this is going to be, uh, 
maybe a step forward. So um, if this is a little advanced, I'll, I'll break it down and explain it. All right, so let's break this down. So this is our allowance that we're uh, building here. You know, allowance is a requirement that we have to implement. And this is, you know, just a state variable in solidity with public visibility. And because it's a state variable with public visibility, we're going to get a uh, getter function for free. So let's see what's going on here. So this is a nested mapping. So remember, mappings in Solidity are uh, like associative arrays or you know hash tables in other languages, um, where we have key and value pairs. This was you know just a one-dimensional mapping that we saw in Balance of. It just takes an address and returns an unsigned integer. But in this case, we have a mapping within a mapping. Let's explain why. So essentially, I want to read uh, you know this address. I want to say if I'm approving uh, the spender, you know, if, if I account A am approving account B to spend, you know, C amount of DAP tokens, I want to keep track of that in this mapping. So this key essentially says I would be account A in this case. You know, this would be the key. Uh, I account A am approving account B, right? And I could, you know, approve account D, account E, account F, account G, uh, so on and so forth. So everything underneath this key would keep track of all of my approvals that I have, you know, approved for transferring tokens. And that's what this mapping is in charge of. You know, if I were to, like I said, approve account D, account E, account F, so on and so forth, this mapping would take this address and show how many tokens that I have uh, approved, right? So in this case, it's pretty simple. I account A want to approve count B, right, in here to spend, you know, account uh, amount C tokens. So this is a, you know, a bit of a brain bender at first, uh, but we'll write tests against this and, and you can kind of see how it works. And maybe just take a second to uh, kind of reflect on what's going on here if you don't quite understand it initially. So let's write a test to see that uh, we actually update the allowance here that we actually you know approve an account to spend tokens for us. And we'll do that like this. We'll add to this test here. We'll say return um, token instance and we'll check the allowance. Right? This allowance is the thing we just created. We'll check the allowance for accounts zero and we'll say, you know, did account zero approve account one for some amount of tokens. Right? And we'll say assert allowance stores the allowance for delegated transfer. Right. So let's see what's going on here. We'll look at our tests. You know, we said uh, we actually created an approval, and we said we wanted to approve uh, account one. Let's actually specify the from account here. Um, so we'll specify msg.sender. Otherwise, it was just defaulting to the account zero, but we'll be explicit. We are approving, uh, you know, account one to spend 100 DAP tokens on our behalf. 
And this is, you know, the value that's getting passed in as msg.sender. So down here, we want to check the allowance um, that uh, our account, you know, the one that sent the transaction, account A or account zero, uh, actually approved account uh, one or account B, 100 tokens. So let's run that test. All right, so we can see that this was uh, uh, didn't didn't pass as we expect. Let's actually call two number. It's probably going to yell at us here too. That's okay. All right, expect a zero to equal one hundred, and it didn't. That's okay because we didn't actually update the allowance mapping. So let's do that right now. So for allowance, we'll say allowance, this is just referencing the mapping that we created. We want to set the key of msg.sender. And we want to, you know, update the nested mapping within that. So we'll call, you know, spender. This is the argument that we're passing in here. And we'll set it equal to the value. Let's run our test. Boom, it passes. Now that we have our um, approve function working and updating this, uh, you know, approval event and the uh, allowance mapping. Let's uh, build out our transfer from function. So just to recap, the transfer from function uh, essentially is uh, the function that allows us to, you know, handle this delegated transfer. So the last function we approved a certain amount, and you know we stored that amount in this allowance mapping. And in this function, we actually want to execute that transfer. So this is the you know function that's going to basically act like transfer, but on behalf of a, a third party. So remember, we said you know we we're approving uh, account B as account A. So I account A approve account B to spend C tokens. In this case, uh, account B is spending C to tokens on account A, my behalf. So we'll uh, build that out. We see some requirements here that we'll go through. So first, let's just sketch out the function. Function um, transfer from. And we want to pass it an address from to Oops. All right, so we'll take a look at that here. So a lot like our other functions, uh, you know, this is a publicly visible function that, you know, returns a Boolean, just like these. Um, this, uh, you know, denotes the success of our function. And it's going to accept, uh, you know, the address of the account that we're transferring from and accepts the address of the account that we are transferring to. And it um, accepts the, you know, number of tokens that we are going to transfer. So in our case, uh, you know, msg.sender, whoever's calling this function would be account B, as I've been calling it. And... Uh, account A is going to be the account that we're transferring from. And we have a new account in this case, which would be account maybe C, um, that we're transferring to. So there's three accounts in this case, the one that's calling the function, the one that we're transferring from, and then the one that we're transferring to. 
So let's uh, see what needs to go inside this function. We want to, you know, return true, return a Boolean. Uh, we want to call the transfer event. Right. So anytime a transfer happens, whether it's inside this transfer function or in the transfer from function, we have to uh, call a transfer event so that we can show that a transfer happened. That's just part of our ERC20 standard. Um, and we want to set, uh, yeah, we want to actually change the balance. And we want to um, update the allowance. And we also want to add some, you know, requirements here. We want to require that uh, the from account, we'll say this from has enough tokens. And we want to require, we want to require that the allowance um, is big enough. Basically, you know, if you were to try to transfer, you know, tokens that were more than the allowance, we want to execute. And if you were also trying to transfer more tokens than the original account had, we also want to execute. Or sorry, yeah, uh, escape. So, this is uh, quite involved here. There's several things we need to do. We'll step through them one by one. We'll start by writing tests. We'll go over to our test file here. And uh, we'll start a new test that says it. And we'll say uh, this is approved tokens for delegated transfer. We'll say it actually handles delegated transfer. Oops. All right, just like every other test. Oops, sorry. And we'll say return. Actually, I'm just gonna copy this. I feel like you all have seen this enough times, so I don't have to repeat myself. And we'll keep track of the instance. And in addition, we're going to do some more setup for this test. Like I said, we need to keep track of three accounts. We need to keep track of the account that's you know calling this function, the account we're sending tokens to, and the account we're sending tokens from. So we can do that like this. We can say from account. And we'll say accounts to. We'll say to account. And we'll call this uh, counts three. And we'll say spending account. This is the one that's going to call the function. All right. So yeah, I'm just keeping track of these with some variables so that it's clear what's happening in our test. You know, from to spending, which is the sender, right? So from to and then msg.sender is going to be the spender. And it's just convenient that that rhymes. So we'll do some setup. We'll actually transfer some tokens. We're going to transfer some tokens to this account so that it actually you know, has some tokens to, uh, to transfer. We'll say token instance transfer. Uh, from account. Oops. All right. So we'll do that. Let's see then. 
we'll just execute this promise chain here. Oops. Okay. And we'll just say we're going to next approve spending account. Spend 10 tokens from from account. All right. So we're not actually going to test anything inside here. We're just going to, uh, you know, continue executing this promise chain after we did some setup. You know, this basically uh, gave this tokens, uh, sorry, gave this uh, from account some tokens so that we can actually write some tests. This came from, you know, account zero, which uh, has a bunch of tokens, right, already from our test suite. You know, we uh, allocated a whole bunch of tokens to that account when we call our constructor sorry, the constructor, and uh, gave it some initial supply. So we've just transferred a bunch of tokens, you know, 100 from that account to this account. And now we want to approve uh, the spending account to spend 10 tokens uh, from this account that we just gave some tokens to. We'll do that like this. We'll say spending account. 10 from account. All right. And we'll say then function. Get the receipt. Now let's actually uh, build out this function a little differently. Let's go ahead and test the you know, requirements of the function first. These uh, you know, require statements, these guards. Um, We'll do that like this. We'll try a test scenario where we say, you know, try transferring something larger than the sender's balance. We can do that like this, token instance. Uh, I'll try to call this transfer from, from account, and then to account. All right, so look here. We have 100 tokens in from account because we set it up that way initially, right? We you know, just transferred some tokens from this account to here so that we had some. And now in this case, we're going to say if this from account, if we're trying to transfer you know, some tokens from this account you know, to this account from here to here, we want to try to transfer more than 100 because this account only has 100 and we don't want our function to work if we try to do that. So let's try to transfer some really large amount, like, right? This is way more than the number of tokens that we actually have here. We wanna test that uh, this fails, right? This is gonna be from the spending account, right? This we set up here. So just recap. Spending account is calling this function and it's trying to say, you know, from account, spend more tokens than you have to this account. And we want to, uh, you know, get an exception here. And we can test for that exception like this. Let's say assert fail. We can catch. All right. You can say assert um, that the uh, error message, all right, index of, revert, oops, sorry. I think I might have too many here. Yeah, I do. Index of, um, sorry, guys, my brain is going dead. Revert. Uh, is greater than or equal to one, or sorry, zero. And we'll say that you know, cannot transfer value larger than uh, balance. All right. Let's make sure I don't have any syntax errors here. 
All right, so we've got that in place. Let's try to run that test. All right, it failed as we expect. Let's actually implement the code to make a pass. So we want to require that from has enough tokens. And we can do that like this. Value. Balance of. From. All right. So essentially what we're doing is adding a you know require statement like we've seen up here in the transfer function. Earlier, you know, we just required that, you know, the balance of the sender is more than the value. In this case, we want to require that the uh, balance of, you know, the from account, since this is a delegated transfer, is greater than, you know, the value. We want to say that they have enough tokens to transfer. So we'll run that. All right, it passes. The next thing we want to test, test for is require that the allowance is big enough, right? We want to try to ensure that we're not trying to transfer too many tokens, like more than we're actually allowed to. So we'll give that a try, go to our test file. And uh, we'll just kind of add on to what we've got. We'll say, we'll go here and we'll say, try transferring something larger than the approved amount. All right. Do that like this. Token instance, uh, transfer from. Oops. We'll say from account, just like this, to account. All right. And we'll say, um, we'll say 20. And I said 20 because uh, 20 is going to be larger than the amount that we approved here. And it's going to be less than the uh, actual balance. So we want to test, like this, you know, this test tested for something bigger than this number, right? This is the total number of tokens that this account would have. Um, and in this case, this is, you know, bigger than the approved amount, but smaller than the number of tokens we have. So basically we want to get past this and uh, get to here and, you know, trigger this exception. And that's how we do that. Uh, a number that's in between these two values. If that didn't quite make sense, uh, maybe just kind of mull that over for a second. And we'll say this is uh, from spending account. All right. And just like this, we'll uh, certain error. And we can say. Let's. Uh, Basically copy, copy this, and we'll say cannot transfer, uh -huh. typo, sorry guys, larger than approved amount. Okay. Close this out. Run our test. See if we had any errors in our test, or if this actually fails like we expect. All right, failed like we expect. Tests seem to work fine. Uh, so let's implement this. We want to require, oops, that the value is less than or equal to the allowance. All right, let's explain this. So we're reading out of this allowance mapping up here that we uh, created earlier. And we're saying, you know, from this uh, account, the from account, all the approved amount, all the amounts that this account is approved for, we want to find the amount that uh, is calling this function. 
and we want to require that that's uh, you know bigger than the actual value, right? So we're saying that you know msg.sender is the third party here. This is the balance that they are approved to spend on behalf of this from account, and we want to ensure that uh, you know there's enough in there to transfer this value. Again, this is might be a little complicated at first, but uh, just kind of mull this over, and hopefully it'll make sense. So we'll run this test. All right, it passes. All right, so that's done. The next thing we want to do is actually change the balance. We want to write a test for this. Well, actually, let's uh, let's test the return value first. Uh, let's do this. We will. Uh, we're just gonna say this. I'd like to just copy this. Let's. Um, Try to you know call this transfer from function again with some valid parameters. So we know that it's approved to uh, transfer ten tokens. So let's try to transfer ten tokens. But we want to test the return value of this function. We don't actually want to create a transaction. Um, so we'll do call. All right. Then um, we'll say success. Oops, sorry. Then function. All right. And we want to say assert equal success true. All right. Run this test. All right. It's failing. Expected false to equal true. So we can implement this. Turn true. Run this test again, see if it passes. All right, it passes. So let's uh, let's try our let's go backwards and do our events like we did in the last test. So we want to test that the transfer event is actually called. We can return token instance. transfer from and well, let's just paste this in here this time we actually want to uh, create a transaction so that we can inspect the receipt from account to account uh, do 10 and we'll you know go from the spending account this will be the uh, actual function call that we'll kind of use to test the rest of this entire chain. So this is, you know, when, it's important to know like when you're actually creating transactions and when you're just calling functions. Uh, I'm kind of doing these in a specific order for a very specific reason uh, because this doesn't change the state of the blockchain. Uh, this does, and then we want to, you know, test sort of the result of this continuing down the chain. So at first, I'm going to get the transaction receipt, and that's why I want to test the events here. Uh, before I test for you know balances and things like that. So, um, all right. Then function receipt, and we'll do something similar like we did on the, all these other tests. I'm actually going to just paste this in here. All right. So we want to assert that the you know the receipt has logs that triggers an event just like we did in the other specs. It's a transfer event uh, that has the from account, that has the to account, that has the value. So we'll run that test. Make sure there's no problems with our tests. All right, didn't get any events, so our test is working. So we want to call the uh, you know transfer event here. Just like we did in, uh, you know, this function. We'll say, actually, let's just do this. We'll do from T 
to value. All right, you we're transferring from, transferring to, we're transferring this amount. So it's pretty simple. All right, let's run the test. Uh oh, I forgot an underscore. That's very important that we, uh, you know, keep keep that in mind. Our local variables uh, by convention are going to be prepended with an underscore, and state variables um, should should not be. They should be, uh, you know, just like this. So that was my mistake. I accidentally referenced this like a state variable, and it should be a local variable. And I'm kind of leaving these uh, mistakes on the uh, screen just so I can kind of show you all what you know real development actually looks like. These kind of little hiccups happen, and I uh, wanted to just kind of work through them with you. All right, so it looks like something's not working. Stores the allowance for delegated transfer. And again, yeah, it was kind of weird. Uh, had a little issue here with shuffle test. Uh, just reran the test, and it actually worked again. So this looks like it might be an intermittent failure. Some of these things happen um, with Truffle at this kind of stage in the game. Uh, if Sometimes if you get an error that you don't expect, just try running the test again, see if it passes, and it did. So, all right, our transfer event is being triggered. And the last thing we want to do, or the last two things, we want to actually change the balance and update the allowance. So we'll change the balance with the test. We'll uh, do that here. Say return. Again, so we you know we've called this transfer from function. Now we're going to try to read the balance to see if this transfer uh, transfer from actually did what we expect it to. We'll say token instance balance of uh, from account. All right. Then function. And then we'll say balance. All right. We'll assert equal balance to number. We'll say it's equal to 90 because we took 10. Deducts the amount from the ascending account. All right. Try to run the test. All right, fails. We also want to test um, for this token instance balance of the two account. And then we'll just paste this here. And we'll say a 10. We'll say it adds the amount to the receiving account. All right, test this as well. Oh, syntax error. Sorry, guys. All right, so we uh, have some failures here that we need to address. So let's actually change the balance. We'll do that a lot like this here, but we'll pass some uh, different values instead of msg.sender and two. We'll do it like this, balance of uh, msg.sender. Actually, sorry, balance of from. We'll deduct it. And balance of, oops. Ah, sorry, my tap completion is not working very well. Uh, balance of two. I'll say value. All right. So this is actually you know deducting the amount uh, from the from account and adding it to the to account. This is just a basic financial transaction, a lot like we saw right here. Run the test. See that passes. Oh, token instance balance of is not a function. 
So let's see what we did here. Balance of, ah. Typo. I'm full of typos today, guys. Sorry about that. But again, I kind of want to just leave these on the video just so that you guys can see you know, what real development looks like. All right, and that's passing. It's important to be able to catch your own errors, you know. That's helpful for me to show you when I catch my own errors so that you don't get discouraged. All right, so that works. And the last thing I want to do is uh, update the allowance. So we'll do that in the tests. Uh, so we've you know called you know transfer from. We've checked the balance here. Now we want to return the allowance to see if that's changed. And we'll say return uh, token instance allowance from account to uh, say spending account. So again, this is just going to be the keys and the mapping. We'll say the from account is allowed to spend, you know, a certain amount for the spending account. Or sorry, the spending account is allowed to uh, spend a certain amount for the from account. We'll say then allowance. All right, and then assert equal allowance. It deducts amount from, oops, from the allowance. All right, so essentially, you know, we have transferred 10 tokens and we expect the allowance to be empty at this point because we're not, uh, we don't have anything in there anymore. So we'll run that test, should fail. All right, fails as we expect. We'll call two number on this. All right, we expect it to be zero, but it's equal to 10. That's because we haven't implemented that in our function yet. So we'll do that now. We'll say allowance. And we will from msg.sender. And we will deduct it. Oops, sorry. Deduct it by the value. I guess I explained that. This is the allowance mapping here you know, that we created earlier that keeps track of you know, the account that's you know, added an allowance, and this is the specific account and how many tokens it's allowed to transfer. So we just dig into that with from, right? This is the account that we're spending on behalf of, and you know, the sender is allowed to spend a certain amount, and we're just decreasing that or decrementing by the value that's passed into the function. Save that and run the tests. All right, it passes. Let's go ahead and commit our changes so far. We can uh, commit everything. We'll call this, uh, well, let's we'll see where we're at. I can't remember actually. Okay, so we're at number three. We'll commit everything. We'll say this is delegated transfer. And feel free to check out the link uh, in the description below at this point in the tutorial. This is where I'll have the release on GitHub. You can just download this uh, at this commit to follow along if you'd like. So that's it, guys. That is um, a complete ERC20 token. This is all the code for a complete ERC20 token that you know implements all of the necessary functionality expressed in the ERC20 standard that we've looked at. We have you know written tests against all of these things. So this is quite a robust smart contract. Um, it does everything we expect it to do. We know that it uh, does everything we expect it to do because of these tests. And congratulations for sticking out this far. Um, 
the next thing that we're going to do in the series is build out the token sale. So be sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications below so that you can see that video when it comes out. That'll be the next smart contract that we'll be programming. So until we get onto that and until the next video comes out, thanks for watching DAP University. Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University. And I'm back with another video uh, in our series about creating your own cryptocurrency and ICO on Ethereum. And I wanted to do a quick follow-up video that uh, talks about our ERC-20 token that we just finished uh, programming. So if you haven't seen that video already, be sure to check it out and subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications below so that you can see the other videos in this series when they come out. So this video today is really a follow-up video uh, to the ERC-20 token that we that we built. Um, and we did that in a test-driven fashion where we wrote a bunch of tests to build our smart contract. And sometimes, you know, when you're writing the tests, it can be a little abstract if you're not used to test-driven development. So I wanted to kind of just open the Truffle console and interact with our uh, token a little bit before we go on to building our other smart contract and building our client side uh, ICO website. So in order to uh, you know interact with the token in the console, let's just uh, pull up Ganache, make sure that our blockchain is running. It looks like it's running. So I'll minimize that. And let's run our migrations. So we'll do Truffle, migrate, reset. All right, those are migrated. So we'll enter the console. So what I wanna do is sort of uh, really just poke around at our contract here. Let's uh, get a deployed instance of it. We can do that like this. This is a DAP token. Again, this is the variable that we, uh, that we declared in our migration. I'll show you that. Um, you know, here, DAP token. And we want to get deployed instance. And then we want to say, then function instance. And we'll call this uh, token instance. All right. We can see token instance here. All right, it's quite large. And this is, you know, the, uh, the abstraction of our instance. So let's kind of play around this for a second. So let's try to inspect some initial values. Let's try to uh, see what the token responds to. We can check its name. All right, you can see it's DAP token. We can check the symbol. All right, it's DAP. You can check the standard. All right. And let's check the total supply. Now, before we check the total supply, Let's remember how this uh, total supply got set. Whenever we uh, deployed our contract, we ran this constructor. And this constructor basically took an initial supply as an argument. And we passed that, uh, we passed that value in here. When we deployed the contract, we said that it is uh, you know, a million tokens. And we you know, set that total supply state variable as the same thing, uh, same amount as the initial supply, right? And that total supply is uh, tracked here with the state variable of total supply. So let's actually use a callback for this. Uh, then say S, say supply equal to S. All right, supply, 
and this is a big number, so we can call to number. All right, we can see that's a million. One, two, three, one, two, three. So we can also see that uh, the balance was uh, sent to the, uh, you know, the administrator of this contract, the one that deployed it. And remember I said that uh, with Truffle, if you're using something like Ganache, it's going to default to the first account uh, in the list. And I'll show you how to you know, see those accounts in the console. Uh, we use the Web3 library for that. Again, Web3 is just a library that you know, allows us to interact with the blockchain. It can be injected into your front-end applications, which we'll do later in the tutorial. Um, and it basically you know, just gives you a lot of tools to interact with uh, you know, smart contracts and the blockchain in a JavaScript runtime environment. So we can use Web3 like this, Web3. We can get the ETH object and we can say accounts. And I think I showed this to you earlier in the video or in the series, but yeah, here are the accounts that are listed. We can access all these accounts on zero-based index. So this would be the first account in the list. This is the same account that we saw here in Ganache, right? Uh, F57, this is F57. All right, so what we want to see in the console is that the um, initial supply was actually set to the balance of the person who deployed the contract, right? And I say person, it doesn't necessarily have to be an external account. This could be another smart contract, but uh, for the sake of this tutorial, we'll just assume that it's a, an external account. So we'll take balance of... Um, Actually, let's just do accounts zero. We'll call this admin. Let's see that the uh, token instance balance of admin. All right. We can do the same thing then function uh, balance. All right, balance to number. This is the admin balance. So this was actually set to a million tokens. And like I said, you know, we, we tested all this, uh, but I wanted to show you what it looks like in the console just so that you can uh, you know, debug these things yourself or uh, kind of play around with them. And I want you to get more comfortable with the travel console because it's a really nice tool. So we can also see... Um, that we can you know call other functions in here we can you know actually perform a transfer in the console let's uh do this token instance transfer uh, counts one we'll say we'll just say one token and we'll do from admin and remember, admin is a variable we assigned uh, to this first account. Oh, let's let's do this. To make this even more clear. Receiver. Let's say receiver equals web three dot eth accounts one. All right. All right, we can see that we got a transaction, which means that the um, that the transfer was successful because we got a receipt here. That's how we know it was successful. We can see uh, some information about this. The transfer event was called. This is the receipt that we you know look for in our tests. Every time we go to you know something that looks like this, we're looking at this receipt and digging into the logs. Here's the logs that we were talking about. Um, right, it's just uh, an array of objects here in, in JavaScript, and we can see that it has a uh, you know event. It's a transfer event. It's got the, ob the args that we could dig into that we did here, um, you know, from to value, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We can see a lot of other information about this that I won't really get into detail with here, but you can kind of play around with this yourself. 
now we can see that the uh, token instance balance of, um, we'll say the admin. I'm not going to fool the callback in this case. I'm just going to see this big number, right? It went down by one, like we expect. And we can see the balance of um, the receiver went up by one. All right, so that transfer is kind of how we could do that in the console. Let's uh, look, let's try an approval as well. So we can do token instance, approve. Um, let's approve. Let's approve um, accounts one. We'll approve 100 tokens. Oops. Let's do web three th counts one. All right. So an approval event uh, actually was triggered. A transaction receipt is listed here, and our approve function worked. So let's uh, check the uh, allowance because that's kind of what we tested for in the uh, test suite, right? So like. Whenever we called, um, right, whenever we uh, called approval, we tested that the allowance went up, right? So let's check the allowance. Token instance allowance counts zero. Remember, this is the uh, well, sorry, I should be explicit here. I didn't add the uh, the sender, which uh, is bad practice, but for console is not so important. Um, really, this should have uh, specified the from account, but by default, uh, the, the default account in this environment is uh, the first account in the, in the list. So, accounts one. All right, so let's say, let's check our mapping. Remember, this is the uh, allowance here. Let's see, yeah, the allowance. And this basically says that, you know, this account is allowed to spend this many tokens for this account. So we wanna see that account one is allowed to spend, you know, some return amount, which we transferred, you know, 100, uh, by this account. Oops, accounts. I did that again. Sorry, guys. Web three eth accounts zero. Okay, what else is going on? Accounts not defined. All right, so we got a uh, a value here. We can see that it's actually a hundred, like we expect. And we can also uh, perform a delegated transfer, just like we did in our test. So we can do that by you know, looking at this function, transfer from. We can set up a similar scenario like we did in our test. We can say the from account is equal to web 3 eth accounts, uh, say 2. And we can say the two account. Two account is equal to web three to ETH accounts three. And the spending account. Web three ETH accounts four. All right, so we have all our accounts here set up in this scenario. So let's actually uh, do this. You know, we set up uh, an allowance there. So let's, um, well, yeah, let's, let's kind of recreate this scenario. Let's say token instance uh, transfer. Let's give this account some tokens first from account. Go 10 tokens, or sorry, 100. And we'll say, you know, we'll be explicit here. From accounts zero, you know, this is, the account that got all the tokens when we deployed the contract. Oops, I keep doing that. Web three ETH counts zero. Okay, so this is uh, 
transferred. This account has some tokens now. We can check that token instance balance of uh, from account. All right, it's got 100 tokens now. So we can approve this. You can say token instance. Um, approve the spending account. This is the account that's going to be allowed to perform the delegated transfer. Say we can allow it to uh, spend 10 tokens. And we'll send this. Uh, you know, this is the account that it's going to be spending on behalf of. We want to approve, you know, this account. We want to approve this account to spend this many tokens on this account's behalf. All right? So that worked. And the last thing is we want to actually uh, try to transfer the tokens. So let's do it this way. Token instance from um, do from account to account. And we'll say 10 from spending account. And let's actually, uh, yeah, we'll do this. So this is token instance. We're going to call transfer from, from this account to this account, uh, this many tokens, and this is the account that's actually performing the delegated transfer. All right, that worked. Let's see that the transfer is actually successful. We'll do uh, token instance balance of, oops. Um, from account. All right, it's 90. It went down. We'll do balance of two account. All right, it's 10. So that account actually got some tokens. And let's make sure that the allowance went down as well. I'll say allowance. Let's say the allowance from account and spending account. Boom, the allowance has been completely drained just like we expect. All right guys, so I hope that's helpful to kind of show you how you can interact with this token contract in the console. This is something you can do with uh, you know, the Truffle console or if you're more advanced and using something like Geth, this is you know, how you can interact with your token. Um, yeah, I hope that's helpful. Like I said, you can check out the code at this point in the tutorial with the GitHub link down in the description below. And be sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications with the bell below so that you can see the other videos in this series uh, when they come out. And until then, thanks for watching DAP University. Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University. Welcome back to this multi-part tutorial where I'm showing you how to code your own cryptocurrency and your own ICO website from the ground up, step by step. In this video, we'll be talking about the token sale contract. This is the smart contract where we will actually allow accounts to buy our DAP tokens in our ICO. So if you haven't seen the previous videos already, uh, be sure to check those out in this series and be sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications with the bell below in order to see the next video in the series when it comes out. And if it's already out, you can just check the link at the end of this video or just watch the uh, next video in the playlist. So if you're just catching up with this part in the tutorial and you want to you know, grab the code, you can find the project link uh, in the description below. This is a link to GitHub with the code up to this point in the tutorial. And you can follow along with that if you'd like. If you're picking up from the last video or you know, or you downloaded the code, let's uh, first ensure that we have Ganache running. This is our uh, you know, local blockchain that we're using for development purposes and it looks like it's running. So we'll minimize that. We will uh, run Truffle Migrate to ensure that our uh, local blockchain is up to date. All right.
Now let's get into uh, building this token sale contract. We can do that by taking a look at what we'll be building. Let's talk about how the token sale contract is going to work. So essentially this token sale contract is going to be, you know, the second smart contract that we're developing in this decentralized application, you know, this uh, token sale ICO website. And this is the main contract that the, you know, end user or the account connected to the network is going to interact with uh, when we build out our application. This is the uh, contract that's actually going to facilitate you know, token buying. We're going to, you know, add a function in here that allows, you know, a, an account to buy some of the DAP tokens that we uh, coded in the previous videos when we built the uh, DAP token ERC20 smart contract. So what do we want to do with this uh, smart contract? Well, first we want to uh, provision some tokens uh, to the token sale contract. So what we essentially want to do is take some of the total supply of the tokens that we created in the last tutorial and give them to the smart contract. Now let's talk about that a little more. So if you remember, um, when we built our DAP token, this ERC20 token, uh, we gave a total supply. And if you remember in our tests, we set that total supply to a million, right? We did that in our migration as well. We said that there are going to be a million DAP tokens. So whenever we create our token sale, we actually want to take you know, a portion of that total supply and uh, give it to the smart contract for the, of the token sale. So that might be a new concept to use. Well, uh, you know, on the Ethereum blockchain, you can hold tokens in your wallet, right? You can uh, have tokens that belong to you. And, you know, we created this balance of function in the last uh, kind of part of the series to keep track of, you know, who owns how many DAP tokens, right? This takes an address and returns uh, the amount. So if I had, you know, an account connected to Ethereum blockchain, you, this would show me how many of these DAP tokens that I have. Uh, but uh, you know, remember an address can be the address of an external account on the Ethereum blockchain, like my wallet, um, or the address can be a smart contract. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this token sale. We're going to provision a certain number of tokens um, from the total supply to our token sale. And that's part of this, the business use case of building an ICO. It's what they do whenever they mint the tokens, they, uh, you know, take a portion of them and sell them to the public. That's why it's called an initial coin offering. So that's uh, one of the first things that we'll do. And we'll actually do that in our contract constructor. We'll see that here in a bit. We will set the token price. We want to set, you know, the amount that the tokens are going to be sold for. This will be in way, which we'll talk about momentarily. Uh, we're going to assign an administrator to our token uh, token sale. So this is someone who has, you know, the power to uh, do certain things that other accounts can't do on uh, the Ethereum blockchain. For example, we want the administrator to uh, be able to end the token sale at a certain time. And that's exactly what the last thing that we'll do right here will create the ability to end our token sale. Okay, so let's get into uh, building this uh, token sale contract. So I'm going to go to my uh, contract directory. We'll create a new file. We'll call this uh, DAP token sale. Dot sole. All right. You can see that here. And we'll go ahead and create a test for this as well. All 
All right, so we got both the files that we need in order to get started. So let's uh, sketch out our smart contract. Remember, the first thing that we need to do is declare the version of Solidity that we're using. We do that like this, pragma, Solidity. We use a caret, two. And we can declare our contract. All right, we can save that. We did that just like we did in the last video. Now let's go ahead and create a constructor. We'll sketch that out. Remember, a constructor is just a function uh, inside of a smart contract that gets run upon initialization, which is when the uh, contract is deployed. And the constructor function is you know, just a function with the same name as the contract. And we do that like this. Right. We can say public. All right. Now there's a couple things that we want to do inside this function. The first thing is we want to assign an admin. Remember, this is going to be you know an external account connected to the blockchain that's going to have special privileges with this token sale that other accounts won't. Um, for example, we're going to allow the admin to end the token sale. We don't want somebody, you know, just to be able to end our token sale arbitrarily without, you know, permission. So we want an admin to be able to do this. Uh, we want to actually assign our token contract. Um, and we'll see this in a minute because we're going to actually have to interact with the token contract that we built in the last part of the tutorial. And we'll set the token price. This will be how much, you know, how much Ether it will cost uh, whenever we sell our tokens. Okay. So let's uh, go ahead and assign the admin. We can write a test for this. Uh, but before we do that, we need to add a migration. So we'll go to our migrations file. Remember, this is what we created in the last part of the tutorial. These are the migrations that get run whenever we um, run Truffle Migrate and actually update our blockchain by deploying the smart contract. And we want to, um, you know, deploy um, this other contract. So there's a couple things that we need to do. First, we'll just uh, import the contract like we did the DAP token contract. And we'll just update this call this DAP token sale. Remember this is just reading the contract file out of our contract directory and um, basically creating a contract abstraction with Truffle that we can use you know in a JavaScript runtime environment like this. I'm going to add it to this list of uh, deployed objects here. So we'll say deployer deploy and we'll say DAP token sale. And we won't, you know, add any extra arguments for the time being. We're actually going to come back and change this in a minute, but I'll just show you the simple version first. Um, so let's uh, let's go back in here now that we've got our uh, migration taken care of. We'll close the sidebar and open our tests. And we can sketch out a test in order to um you know build out our constructor so first we will import our token sale we do that just like we did in the migration uh you know same thing dap token sale and we'll sketch out a test by saying contract say dap token sale pass in a function this will give us access to the accounts, just like we used in the last tutorial. All right. And 
let's say, let's declare the token instance, or token sale instance, to keep track of this throughout our promise chains. And we'll write our first test. We'll say it initializes the contract with the correct values. And I noticed that I made a few typos in the last video inside these strings. Uh, <laughs> my apologies. I uh, definitely, definitely need some spell checker going on. So just like you know every other test, we're going to start by returning uh, an instance of the deployed contract. Deployed, then function. All right, and we'll keep track of the instance. First, let's just create a you know a heartbeat test for this contract. We'll just see that it has an address. Uh, we can do that like this. You can say return token sale instance uh, address, and I'll say then function. Oops. All right, and this address, we'll just check to see that it's there. We don't necessarily want to check for anything specific because this address is you know, dynamic depending on our, our testing environment. Uh, we'll say assert not equal, and we can say the address. We do not want it to be you know, this, this zero value. Let's just say has contract address. All right. You can save that. You can run our test. All right, passes. So this contract is there. And let's go ahead and assign an admin to our contract. Now this is something we won't really do in a test-driven fashion because uh, we won't actually expose this admin, and I'll kind of explain that in a second. But first of all, we want to, uh, you know, assign an admin to this contract. So essentially, we want, we want to add an external account that um, is going to have special privileges with this contract, like the ability to end the sale. So first of all, we'll keep track of uh, this admin address with a state variable. And remember, a state variable in Solidity is uh, you know, just a variable that's going to belong to this entire contract and is actually data that's going to get written to the blockchain. It's going to be you know, written to disk. It's not going to be stored in memory. It sort of uh, kind of belongs to the smart contract when it's deployed to the blockchain. And that's the first thing we'll do in our constructor. Uh, we'll say the admin is the person who deployed the contract. And remember, um, we have access to the uh, person who deployed the contract with uh, msg.sender. And we talked about msg being a global variable in Solidity that has you know, a sender, which is uh, just the address of the person who called the function, in this case, who deployed the contract. And we'll make them the admin of this token sale. So the next thing we want to add, uh, add is actually the token contract. Now, why do we want to add the token contract? We want to add the token contract because we want to actually purchase tokens. So if you look, we have this you know, transfer function. This is kind of what we will rely upon. Um, whenever we want to purchase tokens. We want to you know, transfer tokens to this address and uh, basically you know, have this value. And we'll transfer these from the admin that we just assigned. So we can add a reference to our contract you know, inside of this token sale contract uh, with our constructor. So let's sketch out a test for that first. 
what we want to do is to see that our token um, exists, you know, a reference to this token exists within the token sale contract. So we can do that by checking for the uh, DAP tokens address inside here. I'll show you what that looks like. So we'll go down here. I'm just going to turn this over a little bit. We can say return uh, token sale instance. And uh, let's say token contract. All right. And just like we did with our um, our contract address here, we can check for an address in the same way. So we can actually just copy this. All right. This is going to return an address when we implement our token contract function. So the address is not equal to 0x0. So this has a token contract. All right. Run our tests. Uh-oh, got a syntax error here. Forgot to copy the other part. All right, token sale instance token contract is not a function. That's what we expect. So we can implement that. I'll let you guess as to how I'm going to do this. All right, you probably guessed correctly. We're going to add a state variable, but it's going to look a little different than uh, what we did in our last you know, example. You can see all our state variables here. We're going to introduce a new data type. And that's going to be, you know, a contract data type. And we do that like this. We'll say DAP token. We'll declare this public. And we'll say um, the token contract. All right. So this is going to give us a function that we're calling here. That's going to give us an address of this to of this uh, DAP token that we're going to set inside of our constructor. Okay, so you can run that test. It's going to fail again, but we'll see if there's a new error. All right? So you can see this is not uh, it, it failed to compile. So we need to actually implement this in our uh, constructor. So how are we going to get reference to this DAP token inside of here? Well, we're going to actually pass the address of the, uh, the DAP token inside of our constructor so that we can get reference to it here and assign it to our state variable. We do that like this. We you know, use the same data type and we, um, when we pass it into our constructor. We say DAP token and we say token contract. We close this. Token contract, all right? That'll be the first thing that we pass in. And we just want to assign that to our state variable that we declared. Uh, token contract equal to token contract. All right, save that. We can run our tests. Oh, compilation failed. And that compilation failed because it still doesn't know what DAP token here is. So we'll actually need to import DAP token. We can do that like this, import. We can just reference this file name here. We say DAP token, SOL. All right, run the test again. All right, so the address, uh, well, we have a new error, right, which is good. It's different from the old error, so we're making progress. But it says the address is um, still not set like we expect, 
All right? So how do we actually you know, get to this address? Well, we need to pass it into our constructor. And just like our um, you know, token contract, you know, we pass some values into our constructor here. We did that with the migration file. That's the same way that we will you know, pass values into this constructor. So we'll go to our migrations file where we deploy our contracts. Now, when we built this out a minute ago, you know, we just added a new line here, but uh, we're going to have to do something a little fancier. Um, we actually depend upon, you know, the address of this contract uh, inside here. So, you know, this deployer deploy function is going to be asynchronous uh, and it returns a promise. So just like all of our other operations that we've been doing in our tests, et cetera, et cetera, we need to use a promise chain. Let's say then. All right. And we want to say move this side here, return. We want to say DAP token address. All right, this is our DAP token here. Here's our address. So we can run this test again, see if that worked. Boom, it passes. All right, so we have successfully set the uh, token contract inside of our constructor. You can cross that off the list. And the last thing that we want to do is set the token price. So let's go to our tests. And we'll add a test for the token price. So we'll say return token sale, uh, token price. All right, and we'll assert that the price is equal to a certain amount. We'll say token price. Let's actually keep track of this price here in our test. Let's set it equal to a value. And I'm going to paste in the value of the token price here. This is going to be way. Let me explain this. So if you're unfamiliar with way, if you're unfamiliar with way, way is how we you know keep track of um, ether in solidity so way is the smallest subdivision of you know ether it's the smallest unit of ethereum ethereum cryptocurrency and we use it um, inside solidity so that we're not using you know floats uh, we're only using fixed point numbers and um, I'll show you kind of what this means. I'll take uh, this value and we'll open a nice little tool. This is uh, etherconverter.online. This shows you how you can convert, you know, ether into different uh, kind of, you know, units. We can say, uh, you know, way and everything else up to one ether. And we can see, um, you know, larger denominations as well. So you can take a note down here at the bottom. This is the smallest, um, you know, the smallest subdivision of ether, right? This is way. So let's paste in the value that I just created. And we can see that our price here is going to be equal to 0 0.001 ether, right? So that's how much each of our DAP tokens is going to cost, a 0 0.001 ether.
So this is going to be our token price, and that's what we'll test for here. We'll say that the token price, the you know the function that we're calling, returns this price, and it's going to be equal to this variable that we assigned here, which is going to be 0 0.001 ether, and we store that in way. Save that, run our tests. It's going to fail because it doesn't know what token price is. It's not going to know about that function yet. Yep. All right. So the uh, you know token price is not a function. That's what we expect. So we'll go back to our token sale and we'll implement that with the state variable. We'll just say um, this will yeah. So you're going to store way as an unsigned integer. Uint two fifty six. This will be public. This will be token price. All right. That, remember that's going to give us a function um, for free with solidity because we declare the state variable public. We don't actually have to write this function out. It's going to just generate it for us automatically, which is nice. And let's keep track of the token price here. And we'll say this is going to equal to the token price that we'll pass in. All right. So we can save that, run our tests, see what happens. All right, the function is there, um, but it's still getting, uh-oh, looks like there's a new problem. Um, we created some side effects from that, but we can kind of fix all of these in, in one fell swoop. So we kind of messed with our, uh, our, our arguments here when we uh, passed everything in. So what we need to do is update our migrations. So in addition to, you know, uh, deploying the, um, the contract with the token address, we need to actually pass in the token price. And I'm going to do that like this. Let's just pass in the token price like this. We'll assign it to a variable so that it's a little easier to read. Um, we'll copy this value like this. Oops. All right. I'm going to say, let's make a note here. Oops. All right. So token price is something we're going to pass in. Let's try to run our test again. Uh-oh. We got a revert. Let's see where this is happening. Run it again. Boom, it passes. Again, sometimes you'll see these kinds of things um, with the stage of the game uh, with Shuffle. Just try to run the test again. If you see you know, a cryptic error message like that that you don't understand, let's just run it again to ensure that it's doing what we expect. Boom, yeah, passes again. All right, so we have uh, kind of successfully initialized our token sale with the values that we expect. Um, I, let me explain one more thing while we're here. So this admin, uh, you'll notice, doesn't have a public visibility set to it um, like the others, and that's because we don't actually want to expose the address of the admin. I don't think I really sufficiently explained that earlier, so I wanted to... Um, tell you now. We don't want to expose the address of this admin. We don't really want to tell people who the, the sender is. Um, so that's why we didn't test for that here. Uh, we just tested for you know the contract address that it's there for a smoke test and um, we tested for the you know token contract address and the token price. All right, so that's it for today, guys. That's uh, the first part of our DAP token sale smart contract. You know, we've created a constructor where we've set, um, you know, an admin for our token sale that's going to have special privileges. We've gotten access to the token contract inside here that we can, you know, use for for buying tokens later. And you know, we set the token price. We've done all that with, uh, you know, our tests. So be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you can see the next video when it comes out. And if it's already out, you can just click the link at the end of this video or just check the next video in the playlist. And until then, thanks for watching DAP University.
Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University. Welcome back to the multi-part tutorial where I'm showing you how to create your own cryptocurrency and build your own ICO on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, this is the next video in the series where we'll be continuing to build out the token sale contract. Uh, in the last video, we created um, the token sale contract and we um, you know, created the constructor. And in this video, we're actually going to build out the uh, functionality that allows, you know, an account to purchase tokens. So if you haven't seen the previous videos, be sure to check those out and subscribe to the channel uh, so that you can see the rest of the videos in this tutorial whenever they come out. And if they have already come out, you can uh, just check the link at the end of this video or watch the next video in the playlist. Now, if you're picking up uh, at this point in the tutorial, um, you know, you've got the code that you've written so far, and if uh, you want to just download the code at this point in the tutorial, you can check out the link to GitHub in the description below. I'll put a link to the latest commit. And we can uh, also just check that we have Ganache running. This is our, you know, local blockchain. It's running. You can minimize that. So let's jump into, you know, building out the rest of our contract. This is our token sale at this point. We can uh, go ahead and sketch out something for, you know, buying tokens. We can reference this uh, little text file that I showed you in the last video. In the last video, we... Uh, In the last video, we, you know, set the token price and we assigned an admin inside the constructor. And we also, you know, got access to the contract. And in this video, we want to uh, buy some tokens. And we're also going to, you know, provision the number of tokens uh, to the token sale. So we can, you know, sketch out something for buying the tokens here. Let's say function, buy tokens. And we'll uh, pass in an unsigned integer of the number of tokens. Let's say public. We want this visibility to be public because we want people to actually purchase the tokens. We also must declare this payable. And I'll explain that in a second. But this is our starting point. So here's our function for buying tokens. Um, we want it to be public because we want, you know, to expose this to the public interface. When we build out our client side website, we want to call this buy tokens function. Um, we want to, you know, allow someone to pass in the number of tokens that they want. And we want this function to be payable because we want someone to be able to send ether uh, via transaction with this function. And that's what we have to do for all functions in Solidity that uh, want to send ether like this, we declare it payable. Now let's go ahead and write a test so we can, you know, check for the functionality here. So let's do this. We'll add a new test. We'll say it, you know, facilitates token buying. All right, we'll pass this a function. Again, I'm going to give us some space here so we can see. And I'm going to do the same thing, you know, that we do everywhere else. I'm going to copy this and paste it. Okay. And inside of here, uh, the first thing that I want to test for is that, um, that this really just, you know, keeps track of how many tokens were sold. That'll be kind of an easy first step that we can test for. So let's actually sketch out what we want. We want to keep track of the number of tokens sold. We'll just simplify this. We will um, emit a sell event. 
we'll say trigger. We want to um, basically require that the number um, of tokens. Well, basically, we want to the, the amount they're buying the tokens for. Uh, we want to ensure that that's the same amount as the token price. We want to uh, kind of require that um, there are enough tokens in the contract. For example, if this contract only has 100 tokens and I try to buy 1,000, we want to uh, prevent that. We want to require that um, a transfer is successful. And this is where we'll actually contract, or call, this is where we'll actually see that from our contract. All right, so let's let's work on this first. Let's just do something simple and keep track of the number of tokens sold. This is actually going to be somewhat of a complex function, so this will take a minute, but let's do the easy part first. So we can do that like this. We can uh, just say return. Uh, tap token sale. Well, we've already done this. Uh, let's do this. Keep track of the instance, just like we did in other cases. And then we can return uh, token sale instance. We want to buy tokens. We can say the number of tokens. And let's add some function metadata here. This is going to be uh, from, this is going to correspond to msg.sender. And this will be the buyer. And the value is going to be um, the amount of ether that we're sending expressed in way uh, when we call this function. So let me explain that. Whenever we call this uh, function, whenever we purchase tokens, you know we can ex we can specify the number of uh, tokens we want to buy. But remember that Solidity functions have some metadata that we can uh, use, and that function metadata is going to require two things: one, the account that is calling this function, and two, it's going to have to know the amount of ether expressed in way that they're sending, right? So when we call this, like we actually have to send some ether. That's why this is payable. Um, so we can do that like this by expressing the value here. So how do we get the uh, value? Let's just say value. Well, we can get the value as um, the number of tokens right here multiplied by the token price that we declared here. This is going to be the value in way. So think about that for a second. The amount of way that we need to send in this function is going to be the number of tokens we want to buy times the token price. Make sense? This is how many way. This is how much one token costs, and if we want, you know, two tokens, or ten tokens, so we have to multiply ten times the token price to get the amount of uh, way that we want to send with this function. And this buyer is just going to be the person or the account that's purchasing the tokens, and this is the number of tokens. So we can declare the number of tokens equal to ten, right? So we got number of tokens, uh, the value, number of tokens times the token price, which is up here. And uh, yeah, so that's how we're going to buy tokens. So whenever that happens, we will uh, let's check the uh, amount. Well, first of all, this is going to be a receipt. 
because we're creating a transaction here. And we'll you know dig into the logs later, but we'll skip that for now. We'll say return uh, token sale instance. And we'll check for the tokens sold. All right. We can also do a, this. And we'll check that the, uh, sorry, not receipt, the amount. We'll assert that um, the amount to number is equal to the number of tokens. All right, so that makes sense. So basically we wanna buy some tokens and whenever that happens, we wanna check for the number of tokens sold because that's the functionality we wanna build out first. And we wanna ensure that the number of tokens sold is the same as the amount of tokens we just bought. So we can run our tests. Oops. All right. See, this is failing. Buyer is not defined, so I forgot to do that in a test. Sorry about that. Let's um, tell you what. Let's keep track of the buyer up here. We'll say our buyer accounts one. And actually, let's go ahead and refactor this a little bit. Let's keep track of the admin. Well, we'll wait on that for now. Here's the buyer. So, yeah, we want to buy the tokens, and here's our buyer. Here's the value. Here's the number of tokens. Let's run that test again. All right, token sale instance, token sold. It's not a function. That's what we expect. So let's implement that. We want to keep track of the number of total tokens. Total, the total of tokens sold, pardon me. We'll do that with a state variable. We'll say an unsigned integer. Uh, we want to make this public so that we can get a function that we, you know, we're using in our tests. All right, token sold. So we can increment that number like this. Oops. Use the increment operator, and we'll just uh, use this variable that we're passing in. All right, it's pretty straightforward. We're just increasing this number by this number. This will start out as zero. So let's run our test, see if it passes. All right, number of tokens is not defined. Uh, let's see here. This is just a little error in our spec, so let's refactor a little bit. Um, now that y'all can see how this works, let's actually move this back over here. We'll do number of tokens is equal to the value. There's no real need to keep track of value here. Uh, you can kind of see it expressed here, the number of tokens times the token price. Clear that out. And let's actually declare this variable before we run our test so we don't have this problem. We'll just say uh, our number of tokens. All right, save that, run our test again. All right, so it looks like Ganache has crashed. We will uh, restart that. If you all see this error, uh, cannot connect to RPC instance or your Ethereum client, um, probably your uh, probably your Ganache instance has, has crashed. So we will, we will relaunch that. All right, we're back to normal. Let's uh, try to run our tests. Boom, it passes. All right, so we have successfully incremented the number of tokens like this. 
Let's uh, let's kind of work on some more easy stuff before we get into the hard stuff. Let's uh, actually trigger this cell event. We can uh, write this in our test. We'll uh, you know dig into this transaction receipt like we did in previous tests. Remember we uh, kind of checked for an event, right? We dig into the logs, we'll do the same kind of thing here. So I'm going to uh, just paste in some code so that we don't have to laboriously you know, code this out. And I'll let you all see that. And like I said, you can download this code if you, if you need to. So I'm taking the receipt and I am looking at the logs to see that there is one event. And I'm also trying to check here, I'll, I'll close this so you can see. Um, I'm trying to check that it's the sell event and that the, it has a buyer. It logs the account that purchased the tokens and an amount. So it's going to log uh, the number of tokens purchased. So we're going to check for that sell event. We'll run our tests. All right. It didn't get any events, which is what we expect. So we can go back to our contract and we'll trigger an event. So before we trigger, we actually need to declare an event. We'll do that like this. Oops. All right. And if you check our tests, we said we want to keep track of uh, a buyer and an amount. So we'll say address buyer and unsigned integer amount. Okay, and let's trigger this event. So sell. So who's going to be the buyer in this case? Well, the buyer, since this public, sorry, since this function is payable, is going to be the account that is calling this function. So the buyer is going to be msg.sender. All right, and we are going to uh, list the amount of tokens that they purchased. And this is not going to be the you know value that they were sending. It's going to be the number of tokens here. All right. And we can see that uh, that's what we checked for in our test. Save that on our test. All right. Looks like we have a syntax error here. It's just a little typo. My fault. I forgot to capitalize the T in tokens. All right, boom, it passes. So we have successfully triggered this sell event. Okay. So now we'll get into the kind of hard part of this uh, uh, test. This is going to be these three steps. We'll kind of work our way through the easier part and then kind of get, uh, you know, get to these parts, which are a little, little trickier. Um, so first, let's just check that the value is going to be equal to the number of tokens that they're trying to purchase. Okay, so we can uh, just check to see if we can, uh, you know, try to buy some tokens for, you know, a value that's different from, you know, what we're sending. We'll do that like this. We'll just say try to buy tokens different from the ether value. We'll say return um, token sale um, buy tokens. So number of tokens. This is the variable that we used here. Let's just copy this. We'll pass in some function metadata to specify the buyer. And so here's what we want to test for. Now, this would always give us, you know, the number of tokens times the token price. This is how much, you know, uh, way we want to send, right? Remember, way is just the smallest uh, denomination of Ether. It's the smallest subdivision. So the token price is this many way. It's a lot. Um, 
and we multiply that by the number of tokens to get the amount of way that we actually want to send, right? So we multiply that by, I believe, 10 in our last example. So let's try to like, you know, rip off our token sale. Let's just try to say, hey, we want to try to buy, you know, 10 tokens for one way, which would be, you know, an incredibly small amount, uh, a very, 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 very tiny amount of ether, right? So this is like what we really want to guard against is someone underpaying for our tokens. I mean, we really want to guard against overpaying, right? Because we don't want people to get ripped off themselves, but we really don't want anyone to rip us off. So we will, uh, you know, try to try to cheat the system here. So we will uh, check for that. And just like our other examples, we will uh, check for a failure. We do assert fail. And then try to catch that. We'll say function error. And we will uh, just check that the error message has revert. We'll say revert. Um, sorry. Zero. And we'll say. Uh, msg dot value must equal number oops of tokens and way okay I'll explain msg dot value here in a minute uh, but let's run the test first all right so it uh, did not get any kind of failure. So let's make it fail. So this is what we want to fill in. We want to require that the value is equal to the number of tokens. So essentially, remember, we're trying to say, we're trying to prevent someone from underpaying or really overpaying uh, for this amount, right? So how we would do this is say require that the you know MSG value is equal to, you know, we would say the number of tokens uh, times the token price. Now, this is not actually the code that we're going to use. I'm going to change this in a second, so don't get too attached. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of do this step by step. So first, uh, msg.value um, is some more metadata that we're going to get when this function is called. Remember, we have msg.sender. Remember, msg is our glo global variable. It's got some some data that we have access to. msg.value is uh, you know the amount of way uh, that this function is is sending. Um, you know, we can see that here, msg.value, and we want to we want to you know say that that's equal to you know, how much this is actually going to cost, right? We did the number of tokens times the token price, which is what we did in our test. Number of tokens times the token price. Um, so that's what we want to require. We want to require that that's equal. Now this looks nice, but we don't just want to multiply these things, right? Because this could be some sort of this could be really any value, right? We want to uh, do some safe math here. So I'm actually going to create a function that handles this multiplication for us because we don't want to just use this by itself. Um, and I'm going to kind of reference uh, an external library. So we want to create like a multiply function. Right? And we actually want to call it here. All right, so we want to build this multiply function. And I'm actually going to reference uh, an external library without you know, pulling the entire thing in. I'll kind of just give you guys uh, an example here. I'll introduce you to DS Math. So this is a um, basically an external library that allows you to do arithmetic operations or arithmetic operations uh, safely in Solidity. So it allows you to do things like, you know, add, subtract, multiply, divide. 
et cetera, et cetera, um, without, you know, it allows you to do it safely without causing any problems in your contract code. So I'm going to look in the uh, source here and look at math. This is the this is the library we would normally include, but I didn't want to add another dependency to the project, so we'll just kind of reference how their multiply function works, and we'll do something very similar. So you all can check out this uh, library more um, just by you know going to uh, DAPHub's organization and looking at DS Math. So I'll close that. And let's implement the multiply function. We'll do it like this. We'll take an unsigned integer. Oops. All right. So I'm not, I'm not going to go into this too in depth, but this is pretty similar to what we saw in DS Math. Um, you know, basically just takes two numbers that you want to multiply by, and it does this safely in Solidity, and it returns uh, the value. Now, um, I'll explain a couple things about this function. The uh, internal uh, visibility means that this is only, you know, internal inside the contract. can't be, you know, called externally. Um, pure just means that it's not actually creating any transactions. It's not reading or writing data from the blockchain. It's just a, a pure function. Uh, you might be familiar with that concept from... Um, other programming languages, you know, takes in a function of the same data type and returns the same data type. Um, yeah, so that's what this function does, and we're going to use it here. So let's run our test, see if an error occurs. Boom, it passes. Okay. So we have successfully required that, you know, we're buying the tokens for the correct amount. And the next thing we want to do is build out these next two steps. We want to make sure that the contract actually has enough tokens before um, we allow you to purchase some. And that's going to require a little bit of setup inside of our test. So let's go ahead and do that. So in order to require that the contract has enough tokens, we need to actually provision some tokens to the contract. If you remember, um, that was one of the kind of steps that I listed here. We want to provision some tokens to the token sale contract. <clears throat> so just to recap, um, you know, just like external accounts, like wallets can have uh, you know, tokens, so can uh, a smart contract. And that's what we want to do here. We want to give this token sale uh, contract some tokens because it has an address and we can, you know, add some to this uh, balance of uh, function inside of our um, token contract. We basically want to check this balance of and use a contract address here instead of a um, instead of an external account. So we'll do that by transferring some tokens. Actually, I'll open that back up. We'll do that by uh, transferring some tokens to our smart contract instead of uh, an account. The basic idea is, you know, if there are, um, you know, a million DAP tokens at the total supply, we want to take some amount of that total supply uh, and transfer them to the token sale contract instead of, you know, another person. And um, we want to... Yeah, essentially, um, you know, sell those. All right, so there's a few setup steps here uh, in order to kind of modify this test and and make it do what we need to. Um, first, I'm going to uh, actually import the token contract. So let's do that. Well. Uh, call this dap token. 
All right, we'll keep track of that. And I'm going to deploy that first. So let's do this. Um, hmm. Let's do it like this. Call this tap token dot deployed, and let's keep track of the um, token instance. So we'll do dap token dot deployed, then instance, and this will say um, token instance instance, and we'll just make a note here. Say grab token instance first. Okay. And then we can um, do dap token sale that deployed. And this is going to uh, return a promise so we can specify the return value here. And we can. Um, you know, do this. Oops. And say the uh, instance here. Actually. And then, you know, we will uh, then, gra then grab uh, token sale instance. So now we have access to our uh, DAP token instance inside of our test, and we have access to our token sale instance. So we have two contracts that we want to interact with. And before we start, you know, we're gonna we're gonna continue modifying this kind of test chain, um, and we'll do a, you know a couple more setup steps first. So we've we have access to the token instance. Then we have access to the token sale instance. Um, and next we want to provision some tokens. So essentially we want to take some of the uh, total supply and give it to this token contract, right? And remember the total supply when we deployed the contract was uh, I think a million, right? A million tokens. And we want to take some of those 1 million tokens and give them uh, to the token sale contract, right? But who has the million tokens, right? Who has the million tokens whenever this is deployed? Well, if you remember, inside of our uh, DAP token contract in the uh, constructor, we assigned all of the uh, all of the initial supply to the person who deployed the contract, right? And in Ganache, and in you know this environment, this defaults to the first account in the list, which is this account right here. So if you're following me, um, msg.sender, uh, in the case of this deployment, is the um, person who has all 1 million DAP tokens presently whenever we deploy this contract in our, our test, test case. So what we want to do is transfer some number of tokens from that account to our uh, token sale contract, All right? And let's just say that um, that person, since it's going to be, you know, the first account in the list is also going to be uh, the admin. So we'll do that here, uh, admin. Oops, zero. All right, and how many tokens do we want to provision, right? So we said we had a million tokens, so let's uh, do 75% of them. So we'll say tokens available, 750,000. It's gonna be 75% of 1 million. So in this step, we want to provision 75% of all tokens to the token sale. 
All right. So again, that's going back to this kind of first step. We want to provision some tokens to the token sale contract. We're taking 75% of the total supply. Uh, sorry. The total supply. 75% of the total supply, which currently all belongs to uh, the first account in the list, right? This is the admin. This is account zero. Taking 75% of all of those and transferring them to the token sale. So we can do that like this. Uh, return. Instance transfer. Remember, this is the uh, function inside here. Move this over here. Oops, sorry. This is uh, our transfer function. We're going to transfer token sale instance. We're going to say we'll transfer you know all of these tokens that are going to be available in the token sale, seventy five percent tokens available. And we will do this from the admin. Okay. So the admin is going to be the first account in the list. This is who has all 1 million tokens so far. And we're going to say, hey, admin is going to call this transfer function. And it's going to transfer not to an external address, but the contract address. And we're going to you know, transfer 75%, which is going to be all of the tokens available in the token sale. So this is really just a setup step to uh, kind of you know, give our token sale some tokens to work with. And once we've done that, we can just uh, kind of close this out by, um, oops, and function. This is going to be a receipt because this is a transaction. Oops, we'll just close that for now. Okay. So that kind of gets us up to speed. It gives us some setup steps. Uh, so recap, we're getting the token instance, getting the token sale instance, and we're giving the token sale instance 75% of all tokens in existence to start out with. And now we want to um, try to actually buy uh, some tokens so that we can uh, trigger this right here. We want to require that the contract has enough tokens. So we want to try to buy more tokens than the contract actually has. So if the contract currently has 750,000, we can try to buy some you know, obscenely high number and we want to require that this fails. Okay, and we can do that like this. Okay, so let's add a test to see that we can, you know, uh, try to purchase more tokens than are available. So let's do this. We'll uh, just kind of copy this. Like this. We're going to check for another failure. And we'll try to, you know, see. We're going to try to purchase, uh, you know, more tokens than are available in the contract. So I've just copied a you know a valid value here. I'm going to uh, you know buy the tokens for the correct price, and this will be from the buyer. And let's say the number of tokens is uh, eight hundred thousand. Okay, that's more than we have, right? It should be seven hundred fifty thousand. So I'm actually going to just test this in isolation. So let's comment this out for a second, just to ensure that we're going for the right failure here. Let's take out all our other require code here. And we'll do truffle tests. Okay, looks like Ganache has crashed, so we'll restart that. All right, Ganache is running again. All right, so uh, our assertion didn't work. Well, you know, because we haven't, you know, coded that yet. So let's actually change the message here. 
So that's what we want to implement. So we want to require that the token contract balance is um, the balance of the token sale is greater than the number of tokens that we're trying to buy. We always want to make sure that there are enough tokens whenever we're doing this. So we can do that like this token contract, right? We've kept track of this up here. Token contract, balance of, remember that's how we check for the number of tokens that exist. That's in our uh, uh, interface here. Let's see, balance of. And we want to say, what is the balance of this smart contract, this token sale contract? Well, in Solidity, we do that like this. We just pass in this as a reference to the smart contract. We say it's greater than or equal to the number of tokens. Okay. And that's how we actually uh, code this re requirement. So we want to check that there are a number enough tokens uh, owned by this smart contract whenever we're trying to purchase them. Run our tests. Boom, it passes. All right, so I'm going to activate this and kill this and uh, make all our tests live. Run them again, see if it works. Boom, still passes. All right, so we're getting close here. We've uh, done a lot of setup steps in order to facilitate token buying. And the last thing we want to do is actually transfer the tokens. So we'll write the tests first. Go into our test file. And let's try to uh, check to see that some tokens are actually transferred when we uh, trigger you know, this successful uh, transaction, right? We already bought the tokens. We've already done this in our test. Um, the buyer has bought them. We want to check the balance of the buyer, and we want to check the uh, balance of the token sale. So we want to see that the balance of the buyer went up. We want to see that the balance of the uh, token sale went down. So we can do that like this. First we'll go, um, yeah, let's do it here. We'll say, uh, yeah, let's do this. We'll return uh, the token instance, balance of. Um, let's check the token sale instance first. All right. And we can uh, we'll just copy this. We'll say it's um, a balance. And we can assert that the balance uh, to number is equal to you know the amount of tokens that they actually bought, which was, I believe, 10. Let's see here. Yeah, 10. So let's check for the tokens available minus tokens bought minus the uh, number of tokens. All right. And let's also check that. Um, yeah, let's, let's check that that that, that actually worked. So we're going to run our test. All right, failed. So 
in addition to um, you know the, the the balance of the token sale instance, let's actually go on before and let's return the balance of uh, the buyer. We'll do this same thing here. We can uh, check that the balance is equal uh, to the number of tokens. All right. So that's that's failing. Let's uh, go to our test and actually implement that. So we'll go to our token sale and let's require a successful transaction. And we're going to do this inside of require because we want this to revert if it doesn't happen. We'll say require at the token contract. Transfer. That's the function from you know the token contract. MSG.sender. All right, so let's look at that. The uh, transfer function takes a to address. This is who we're sending the tokens to, and this is the uh, you know the value. So we're calling transfer. We're sending the tokens to the uh, sender of this function, which is you know the buyer in this case, and we're buying tokens we're calling transfer on our token contract and we are specifying the number of tokens we want to buy so this is the actual buy functionality so we can run that test and see if it passes all right so let's see it did not add the receiving account all right it didn't actually um uh, didn't actually give him any tokens. So let's see what's going on there. I think this is just another case where we need to rerun our tests. All right, it worked. So we can see that we've got um, a full function here. This is the uh, ability to buy tokens and it's fully tested. So this is going to allow uh, you know, an account to call this function. They're going to pass in you know, the number of tokens that they want. They'll send you know, the value with their wallet, which we'll see on the, uh, on the client side. And uh, yeah, this is fully robust. It's got all these checks to make sure that you know, we're buying for the right amount, that the, uh, we have enough tokens, and that um, the transfer is successful. And this will, you know, keep track of the number of tokens sold, and it will emit a sell event. And we've got all the tests for this. All right, so that's it, guys. That's the end of this video. Um, we're almost finished developing our token sale contract. We've just got one more bit of functionality that we'll add in the next video. So be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already to catch that video when it comes out uh, and turn on notifications with the bell below. And if it's already come out, you can just click the link at the end of this video or just find the next video in the playlist. And until then, thanks for watching DAP University. Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University. So welcome back to this multi-part series where I'm going to show you how to create your own cryptocurrency and build your ICO on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, in this video, we will conclude building our token sale contract. If you haven't checked out the previous videos, be sure to do that. Um, and you can also subscribe to the channel so that you can see the next videos in these series as they come out. And also make sure you turn on notifications with the bell below. And if the videos have already come out, you can go ahead and just check the link at the end of this video um, or just watch the next video in the playlist. So if you want to follow along with the code, you can uh, check out the GitHub link to the code in the description below. 
And you know, before we get rolling, let's also ensure that we have Ganache running. This is our you know local blockchain. So we'll minimize that, clear everything out. And in the last video, we um, you know worked on building out this token sale contract. And today we're going to build out the last little bit of functionality, which is uh, ending the token sale. All right, I'm going to give some space here. So that's what we said in our you know kind of initial instructions. We uh, want to be able to end the sale. We've already uh, you know, provisioned some tokens to the contract. We've set a token price. Um, we've assigned an admin, and we've uh, added the ability to purchase some tokens in the sale. Now we're going to work on building the sale. Um, and you know we assigned an admin, so this is something we only want an admin to do. Um, so we can start working on that. We will sketch out our function. We'll say end sale. And this will be public because we want it to be uh, called externally. Uh, I'm just going to give you guys some more space. So we'll require, well, let's actually make some notes. We want to um, essentially require that only an admin can do this. Okay. Um, whenever we end the sale, we want to uh, basically transfer um, the amount of uh, tokens in the sale back to the admin. Remaining DAP tokens um, to admin. And lastly, we want to destroy this contract. So whenever this is done, we want to actually remove this contract. So we can build out these three steps uh, kind of one by one with our tests. We'll just kill some of these files here. We'll go to the uh, tokensale.js and add um, a new test. We'll say it ends token sale. Oops. And we'll do the same thing we've done in our other tests. Uh, you know, we'll assign a token instance or token sale instance. Oops, sorry. To the instance. And, um, you know, we'll get a copy of the, uh, well, actually, let's, let's do this like we did the other one. Let's do this. We'll start this way. We're actually going to keep a copy of DAP token, and we're going to keep a copy of the uh, token sale. So we've got both. And um, first, we want to try to end the token sale by someone other than the buyer. So let's say um, try to end sale from account other than the admin. Return token sale instance, uh, end sale. You want to try to do it from someone who's not the admin, so let's say the buyer. All right, and whenever we do this, we want a failure to happen. We want to catch the error. And we want to assert that the error message. Uh, is. Uh,
must be admin to end a sale. Oops. All right, we can run this test, see if you have any errors. All right, successful, so we expect an error. Um, let's actually try to code that in there. It's not 100% what's going on there. Let's, uh, let's do this. Let's actually try to end it from the admin as well. We'll just test for both things uh, in each case. So say end sale as admin. Token sale instance. Um, uh, let's see, in sale. Say from admin. And uh, let's actually get a receipt here. So we can say then, this was a successful transaction. Um, receipt. And this will be And we'll just uh, we'll just leave that there for now. We can check that receipt momentarily. So let's run this test. All right, so we've got a failure, which is what we expect. Now we want to actually implement this. So let's require that this is an admin. MSG sender. The person who's calling this function is the admin. And remember, we assigned the administrator when we uh, initialized this contract, and we kept track of it here with this uh, public, or sorry, not public, this uh, state variable. So we'll require that's an admin and run our test again. Boom, it passes. All right, so we are doing this correctly. Now the next thing we want to do is uh, transfer, you know, any remaining DAP tokens to the admin when we end the sale. So remember, we provisioned some tokens to this token sale, and when we end it, if there's any remaining, we want to give them back to uh, the admin. So we can uh, check that that happened. We can return uh, the token instance. Let's say balance of admin and then function uh, balance we want to assert balance to number is equal to let's see 999,990 I believe that's the number of tokens you know minus the uh, token sold and let's just say it returns all unsold DAP tokens to admin. All right, let's run that test. It should fail. All right, so that's not true. Let's um, make it pass. We'll do that like this. That the token contract We'll actually transfer the tokens back to the admin. And we'll say token contract balance of this. We can end this line. So let's explain that. So we're taking the token contract, like here, you know, we're calling the transfer function. And we are uh, transferring uh, to the admin, right? We're giving all the tokens to the admin, and we get all the tokens by uh, checking the remaining balance of this smart contract. And remember, in the last video, we used this to reference the smart contract address, and we're just reading the balance out of uh, the token contract and transferring that total amount to the admin. So let's run the test and see if it passes. Boom, 
Boom, it passes. All right, so the last thing we want to do is actually destroy this contract whenever we end the token sale. This is pretty cool. Um, I'll show you what this does. This is uh, something in Solidity called self-destruct or suicide, depending on um, what you want to use. You can see we're at solidity.readthedocs.io. Um, and this is the documentation for uh, self-destruct. So self-destruct, it destroys the current contract, sending its funds to the given address. And that's going to be, you know, uh, that's going to be the amount in Ether. But we're just uh, transferring DAP tokens, which you already did. And it has an alias called Suicide. And you can also see the documentation on this, which we talked about a minute ago, the current contract explicitly convertible to an address. Um, so yeah, that gives you kind of an example of what we're doing here. We can test for um, you know, the destruction of this contract uh, a couple ways. So whenever we call self-destruct, um, you know, it's going to disable this contract essentially, and it's going to uh, you know, return an ether that might be in this contract, which in this case is nothing, um, to the admin. But um, how do we test for this, right? Uh, so the contract code doesn't really get destroyed, right? Because the code in the blockchain is immutable. Uh, but it's really going to disable it. And it's going to clear out our state variables. So one thing that I'm going to do um, is just check for like one of these state variables and um, just kind of assume that it's going to be reset to, to a default value. So we initialized uh, the token price here um, when we you know created this. And it should be set to the token price, which um, you know is this big number that we set in our tests. So, in order to you know kind of ensure that our, our contract has been cleared out, uh, whenever self destruct is called, this is going to get reinitialized to zero. So that's what I'll test for in the test suite. And there's a couple different ways you can do this, but that's uh, kind of just the basic way that I'll do it for now. So we can. Um, check that the uh, token price has been reset. Token price was reset when self-destruct was called. All right. Then function. Oops. Shirt equal. Um, let's see price. Okay. We're on this test. All right, it failed. Well, let's, let's say to number. All right, the token price is still there, so we need to actually uh, call self-destruct to destroy the contract. We'll do that like this. Self-destruct, oh, sorry. Self-destruct. Um, admin. We'll put it down here. Uh oh, got a transaction. Um, let's try it again. All right, boom, it passes. So, yeah, we successfully ended the token sale. We made sure that the admin is the only one who can end it. We uh, transferred all the remaining DAP tokens back to the admin that were in the sale. And we you know, allowed uh, the admin to do that. And we disabled this contract whenever we ended the sale. So that's it, guys. That is our complete um, token sale contract. 
If you've made it to this point in the tutorial, congratulations. Um, that's going to complete the entire, you know, backend portion uh, of our decentralized application, our, our ICO website that allows you to, uh, you know, create your own cryptocurrency and sell it. Um, yeah, so, you know, we've had to develop this entire thing on the back end first, um, and I kind of explain why. In some of the other tutorials, you know, I did a little bit of uh, contract development and then switched to the client side and contract to client side, contract to client side, but that doesn't really work in this tutorial because we need uh, both of these smart contracts in order to even develop our client side uh, code because the main thing that we rely upon is this buy tokens function. Um, and we also, you know, uh, rely upon variables like token price, token sold, things like that. So, yeah, that concludes the uh, backend blockchain solidity side of our project. Um, let's go ahead and commit our changes. We've got several things here. Let's see where we're at. Okay. We'll say um, for speed token sale. All right. So that's it, guys. That's the end of this video. Um, be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you can see the next video in the series when it comes out or just check the link at the end of this video if it's already out or watch the next video in the playlist. And next we're going to start building out the client side application, the uh, token sale website where we can actually purchase these tokens. Um, and until then, thanks for watching DAP University. Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University. So welcome back to this multi-part tutorial where I'm showing you how to code your own cryptocurrency and build your own ICO on the Ethereum blockchain. In this video, we're going to start building out the token sale website. This will be the client side portion of our decentralized application that we're working on in this tutorial. Uh, and the last videos, we have uh, built out our back end up to this point. We have coded the ERC-20 token, and we have coded the uh, token sale contract. And now we're going to wire these up to talk to the uh, website that we're going to build. So be sure to check out those videos if you haven't already. And also be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you can see the next videos in this tutorial as they come out. You can also turn on notifications with the bell below. So if you want to uh, follow along with the code in this point in the tutorial, you know, if you want to just get the code, you can uh, check the description below. I'll put a link to GitHub there. And um, you also want to make sure that you have installed all of the dependencies from the uh, first or second video in this series um, where I show you how to get all your dependencies set up for this project. That's going to be uh, extra important for this video now that we're getting to the front end part of our uh, tutorial. Now, the biggest dependency that you really want to make sure that you have installed is uh, NPM and no, you know, no, Node Package Manager. This comes with Node. You can see if you have Node installed by typing Node-V. I do. So make sure that this is successful for you before um, you continue on. We can also uh, ensure that Ganache is running. Remember, Ganache is just our uh, blockchain instance. And yeah, mine has, has crashed, so I'm going to relaunch. So we need Ganache running to make sure that our smart contracts are uh, doing what we expect. And so since mine crashed, I'm just going to run Truffle Migrate. All right. Now let's go ahead and start building out our front end project. So this is going to require uh, several setup steps. Um, and, you know, my election decentralized application tutorial, um, we got started with the Truffle Pet Shop box, but the purpose of this tutorial is kind of more in depth. It's supposed to show you how you can set everything up, you know, step by step on your own um, so that you can see how you might do this um, in a different project without using a box. 
So um, we're going to need a couple things. We're going to use npm for uh, our main server dependency. So since we're doing that, we want a package.json file. This is just going to be the manifest for all of the uh, you know packages in our project, as well as uh, kind of giving us some uh, description about our project and who wrote it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we will create a package.json file. Okay, I'm going to open this in Sublime Text. Again, this is just my command to open Sublime Text. All right, so we have our package.json file here, and I'm going to just build this out. So first we'll give our project a name. This is going to be uh, DAP token. Well, sorry, we'll call it token sale. Well, uh, we'll call it DAP token sale. And we'll give it a version. This would be 1.0.0, be description. We'll say it's, uh, sorry, we'll say uh, dap token sale co. And um, give it a main. And we'll say directories. Specify some directories in the project. Okay. And we'll give it author. And for me, this will be Gregory. You can do this however you like. You can put your full name or your GitHub profile, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we'll just say license. Oops. And now we need to do, um, this is where we want, actually want to specify our dependencies. So we're really only going to manage one main dependency um, in our package.json file, and that's going to be our server process that we're going to use to build out our front-end application. This is really similar to the Truffle Pet Shop box that you might have used in the previous tutorial. Um, we're going to use light server for this. So we'll do dev dependencies. And we'll say light server. We'll specify the version. We'll give it a caret uh, 2.3. Oops, 3.0. All right, so that's uh, the beginning of our package.json file. I need to give this an actual valid name. Do that like this. I got some other warnings here. Like there's no. Uh, you know, valid repository. You could fill out all these values if you wanted to, but um, these aren't really totally critical for this uh, tutorial. Okay, so now that those uh, dependencies are installed, you could see that we have uh, you know created a node modules directory here. That's going to have everything that we need. Um, so let's talk about this first dependency. This is you know light server that uh, we've imported, and we can go see the uh, GitHub repository where this is uh, hosted. can actually go here. So this is, uh, you know, GitHub. This is the, you know, light server um, project. So light server is going to be uh, basically a development server that allows us to, you know, serve our, our project, our client side project. And, you know, we can see how uh, we can run light server. We'll add this to our package.json file. Um, we can uh, add a configuration file. This is what we'll do. That will add some more, uh, you know, files to the root of our project. So let's actually add the uh, uh, command to start uh, light server. We can do that like this. Go back to our project, and we will uh, configure our package.json file to uh, add a start script. We'll say add a new object here and um, actually let's do this we'll say scripts 
and we'll say dev we'll say light server okay so whenever we type npm run dev on our um, machine it will run this command so let's try that All right, so we can see that it uh, actually started our server process and it opened our browser to, uh, you know, some port on local hosts. I guess currently uh, a few of my ports are occupied, so you might see 3000, 3001, et cetera, et cetera. I get 3003 because that's what's first available. Um, so, yeah, the browser sync started, but it looks like we've got some other work to do. Um, it did not detect a BS config file. And, you know, it doesn't really know about any of the files that it was trying to serve. Um, so that's fine. We'll get to that. But first, I wanted to just show you how you can you know, add this to your package.json file to start light server with a nice, uh, handy NPM shortcut for doing that. Um, so let's address the uh, BS config file. So uh, browser sync is a dependency of light server. And we can see that uh, here. So Light Server uses browser sync and allows uh, for configuration overrides uh, with a BS config file. So what browser sync is going to do is allow us to expose certain files and directories to our, um, you know, our build that Light Server is using. And in our case, we want to expose uh, our contracts to our, um, we want to expose our contracts to our front end client. So eventually, we're going to create a, um, you know, a source directory here, and we want to actually expose the contracts to that directory, and that's the directory where we will build all of our client side code. So let's go ahead and create a uh, browser sync config file. We'll do uh, touch ps config. We'll do a JSON. All right. And inside this file, it's going to be a pretty simple configuration. We'll just say uh, server, and we'll say uh, base directory. And we'll add an array. So now we're going to create this directory. We haven't done this yet, right? So this this is just saying these are the directories we want to expose to Light Server. So we want to expose source. This is what we're going to create momentarily. And we want to expose the uh, contracts here, these JSON files, these contract abstractions, uh, to our client side. So we'll say build uh, contracts. Make sure I got that right. Build contracts. Okay. Okay. So that is our um, light server command. Now it's probably going to yell at us that it doesn't know what this is yet, and that's okay. Um, but hopefully it'll pick this up. So let's try to rerun light server. npm run dev. All right, so let's see, you know, uh, the BS config file was detected. Um, serving files from source directory and serving files from the build contracts directory. So that's how you can know that your uh, configuration was successful. Now this doesn't exist yet, so let's create it. I'm gonna kill these. If you keep running npm run dev, you'll get a bunch of uh, <laughs> extra windows pop up. So let's uh, do that. What I'm going to do is uh, clear some of this out. Let's go ahead and create a directory for our project. So let's go ahead and create um, a directory for all of our client side access. Sorry, all of our client side assets. We will uh, make directory. And we'll say source. Okay. 
we'll go ahead and uh, create a directory for the CSS files. Oops. Okay. And we'll do the same thing for the JavaScript files. Um, all right. And let's go ahead and create an index.html file while we're here. We'll say touch. Okay. And if you're unfamiliar with these commands, this is just, you know, creating a directory. Uh, a folder essentially, and this is just creating a file. So I have to have the directories and the folders there before I can create this file. Um, yeah, so let's see what we got here. Got a source directory, which is what we exposed to uh, you know, with with our browser sync config um, to Light Server. And we have an index.html file, which we haven't filled out yet. And we have a JavaScript directory and a CSS directory. So we can go ahead and, uh, you know, maybe create some HTML here. Okay, so I've just pasted in some really basic boilerplate HTML to get us started. Uh, again, you can check out the code at this point in the project if you don't want to actually write all this yourself. Um, or you can just, you know, copy what I have on the screen here. So, I mean, some of this is kind of overkill for a tutorial, but it's, you know, kind of conventional. So let's uh, just create a little test to see if our, uh, you know, document can be served with our development server. And we'll just say, um, you know, dap token ICO sale. All right. Now let's see if we can uh, serve this. Boom. There we go. So we've got a, uh, you know, an index.html file. Doesn't look like much, but at least we know that our configuration is set up properly. So we'll minimize that. I'm going to clear this out now. Okay, so now that that's working, we need to uh, import the rest of the dependencies for our project. Now, this can get a little tricky because there's so many versions uh, of different dependencies that are being developed quickly right now for Ethereum development, and I really want to make sure that you have the right ones um, to follow along with the tutorial. So I'm going to show you how I'm going to install them, but it's pretty mission critical that you have the correct versions. So I'm going to put you know links down in the description below to the exact dependencies that I'm using um, that I'm going to import. And if all else fails, you know, really just make sure that you go to uh, this repository for the project and copy the dependencies yourselves out of the source directory. You won't see it here yet because I'm currently building it. Um, I'm doing this live as we go. Make sure that you copy the dependencies out of the repository if you get stuck. Um, that's really important. Now, I'm not going to use npm to install these other dependencies, and that might sound funny, but uh, the reason I'm doing it is to show you, uh, you know, how we can, you know, build this in a tutorial in a simple way without having to, uh, you know, complicate things with something like Webpack or another, you know, module bundler. Um, and kind of get lost in um, dependency problems. I want to keep this as simple as possible. So what we're going to do is basically import some dependencies manually into our CSS directory and our JS directory. So let's start with the easy stuff. Um, the first dependency that I, I want to import is um, Bootstrap. This is going to be basically just some CSS and some JavaScript to give us some really nice looking um, UI for free. So I'm going to actually use the, uh, I'm not going to use Bootstrap 4, I'm going to use Bootstrap 3.3.7 um, just so that we can keep it simple for this tutorial. And I'm just going to copy the actual source, the minified source uh, from the CDNs. So you can essentially Basically, you know, go to the getting started page for Bootstrap 3.3. .3. And you make sure you could download these files directly. 
Um, you can do this however you wanted to, but if you want to just follow what I'm doing step by step, um, you can you know go to these CDN links and um, copy the source for yourself. And I'm not going to do these with a CDN in case you want to develop this offline. So I'm going to get the CSS, and that's the same um, you know file here. Take this and copy it. And so I'm going to go back into my project and actually, uh, you know, create this file. And I'll say, you know, touch source CSS, and we'll do uh, bootstrap min.css. And let's go to our project. And we're going to paste in what we got there and save it. All right. Now the next thing we want to do is grab the JavaScript from Bootstrap, and we'll do the same thing. Um, again, this is not necessarily how it you know develop a, a bigger like production project, but I really want to keep this uh, as foolproof as possible for this tutorial. So I want to copy this and go to the Bootstrap.min.js source. Okay, we'll copy this. Same thing. Oops, sorry, not CSS. Okay. Paste this in here. So now you know that you have the same, you know, CSS and JavaScript files that I'm using uh, for this tutorial, and you won't run into any problems, hopefully. So let's pull those into our project. Um, we can, you know, add a uh, simple link here. Our styles. This pulls uh, Bootstrap styles in. This is what we just created: CSS, Bootstrap.min.css, and let's pull in um, the JavaScript. So we'll do that before the closing body tag, so that our uh, we can preserve page load times. So yeah, now we should have our uh, CSS and JavaScript files from Bootstrap. Let's rerun our server process and hopefully we'll see a styled H1 tag that doesn't look like, you know, Times New Roman. We should see the font that Bootstrap uses. So we'll clear that out and we'll say npm run dev. All right, boom. So we at least know that our CSS is working and we can open our console and see if we have any errors. Bootstrap JavaScript requires jQuery. Now that's a pretty good uh, indicator that we did something wrong. So we need to import jQuery into our project. So if we're going to import jQuery, um, you know, let's actually just use a CDM for that. So we can uh, go back to Bootstrap. We can kind of do what Bootstrap tells us to do, um, and we can use um, this right here. So this is importing jQuery from a CDN. Um, again, you can see that, you know, this is how we imported our JavaScript file from bootstrap.min.js, but we have to, uh, we, we're going to use, uh, the CDN for this. So, it, you know, it'd be nice to develop this offline, but chances are, if you're watching this YouTube video, you've got an internet connection. So let's, uh, just do that. All right. So that's pretty textbook from what Bootstrap tells us to do. So let's uh, restart that. You can actually see this. It opened in a separate tab here. All right. So let's see if we have any console errors. And no, we're good to go. All right. So... Uh, we've done that. We've imported jQuery. We've got Bootstrap going. Uh, we have all of the you know UI stuff that we need for our project. Let's actually uh, build. Let's actually import the um, kind of other JavaScript libraries that we need for um, Ethereum development. So let's um, let's import uh, Web three. So Web three is uh, a library that it's going to allow our client-side application, you know, our token sale website, 
um, to talk to the blockchain. So since Web3 is, you know, under such heavy development, I really want to make sure that you have the correct version. So I'm actually going to, uh, I'm actually going to pull the uh, source of Web3 uh, from, you know, this project the first time that I built it. So we'll go to the uh, source directory and go to the JavaScripts and we'll um, actually get Web3 from here. Now, and click raw to copy. Now, these steps are a little confusing. I, I admit that. Um, so if you just want the dependencies from this project and to make sure you've got the right ones, you can check out the link in the description below. I'll put all the links to the exact files that you need. Um, so be sure to copy those if you need to. Like I'll put this link down here. Uh, so we'll just copy this and we will create the file. Uh, so that touch source, uh, JS, and we'll do web3.min.js. And we'll paste this in here. All right, now we have web3. This is the library that allows us to, you know, wire up our, our client side uh, project to the blockchain. And the next thing is a uh, truffle contract. This is going to be a JavaScript library that gives us um, the ability to interact with our contracts um, with uh, with JavaScript, which is pretty nice. It's going to play with the contract abstractions that are generated by Truffle. Essentially, it's a nice kind of cohesive way to read, um, let's see here, to read these files, these ABIs, um, and to generate, you know, an abstraction in JavaScript that we can, you know, use to talk to our contracts on the blockchain. So we'll go back to Truffle Contract, and I'm going to, you know, install this the same way we did the other things. I'm going to get, uh, go into this file and get the minified version. Go to raw, and again, I'm going to put this exact link um, to, to the asset in the description below. So if you don't want to hunt this down, you can just click the description. And I'm going to uh, see this file name. Let's do touch source JS truffle contract min.js. All right. And we can go back to Sublime Text. Paste this in. Okay. All right. So. That should be all of our dependencies. While we're here, we'll go ahead and create an app.js file. Oops. Okay. This is where we'll write all of our, uh, you know, client-side JavaScript. And we can go ahead and console log app.js loaded. Okay. Let's uh, include these files into our index.html file. We'll do that like this. Um, first of all, we've got Bootstrap, so we'll select that here. We'll add Web3. We'll add Truffle Contract. We can add one more. We'll go ahead and include our JavaScript file here, our app.js. Now, it's also very critical that you load these in the correct order. We want to ensure that our app.js files at the bottom. So let's go to our terminal and see if we have any errors. You do npm run dev. All right, the page loaded. Let's check our console. Okay, so it looks like uh, truffle contract didn't work. We'll see why. All right. It's probably named wrong. Let's just check. Ah, it's because it's truffle contract.js. Let's do min. 
That's right. Let's try that again. Okay. All right. So our everything worked. No console errors anymore. And we have uh, our app.js file loaded. All right. So that's it, guys, for this video. Um, that gets us started building out our front end. We kind of have a uh, test to, to ensure that, you know, we've kind of wired everything up correctly. Again, this is really critical that you have all of the uh, correct uh, dependencies for front end development. And, you know, my apologies that all of these dependencies are coming from a million different places. Um, it's really hard to create a tutorial that is simple in this way because this can get haywire very quickly. Um, so my apologies for that. Uh, I'm going to put a link down in the description below where you can get the exact versions of all of these files. Um, and also if all else fails, you can just check out the code at this point in the project. This will be at, you know, github.com forward slash dap university forward slash token sale. I mean, you won't see it yet because I'm building this like live as we go. Um, but whenever this video is published, yeah, you'll, you know, you'll be able to go to that commit or see the final project and, um, you know, just find the dependencies in the source directory and you could copy them from there if you wanted to, or you could just, you know, check out the project and, 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 and go from there. So that's it. Thank you for watching this video and be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you can see the next video in this series when it comes out. And until then, thanks for watching DAP University. Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University. So welcome back to this multi-part tutorial where I'm showing you how to code your own cryptocurrency and build your own ICO website. And today we're going to continue building out the uh, client side portion of our decentralized application. This is going to be our token sale website. So be sure to check out the previous video where I, you know, set up your development environment uh, for client side development and be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you can see the next videos in this tutorial when they come out. So let's go ahead and uh, kind of jump into building out our front end. So we'll go back to our project. Um, we'll resume uh, where we left off. Again, there's, you know, code down in the description below. There's a link to GitHub if you uh, just want to pick up at this point in the tutorial. So what we want to do is um, kind of sketch out um, some HTML and then we'll wire it up with JavaScript. So I'm going to, uh, you know, into the body tag here. We'll clear this out. Actually, let's do a couple things. Sorry. Um, a few preliminary tasks. Let's make sure that we have Ganache running. So Ganache is running. And uh, if you're picking up at this point in the tutorial, make sure that you run npm install to uh, install your dependencies. I'm going to skip that step because I've already done, already done that. Um, but yeah, so what we want to do is um, actually let's also ensure that our uh, product is working. We go to npm run dev. Okay, we have our uh, token sale kind of placeholder here. All right, so let's sketch out some of this HTML. Uh, first, what I want is to kind of create. Um, you know, just a big container. This is a bootstrap uh, element. So I'm going to do div.container. And I'm going to give this a width, actually. So I don't really want to write uh, any extra CSS. So I'm just going to do this inline. Uh, it's not necessarily best practice, but um, let's get us started. Oops do a row and we'll give us a um, you know full width column here okay and if some of this looks magic to you I'm uh, choosing tab com completion and sublime text I basically can you know type the element that I name element that I want and type the class you know my class and hit tab and it will give me that for free so also these classes, you know, are things that just, you know, reference, uh, you know, special uh, elements that we get for free for Bootstrap. 
um, we saw that in the previous you know video about how we wired up Bootstrap. Bootstrap has all these components that you can just pull in by assigning classes to your DOM elements. That's what we're doing here. So we will uh, do H1 like we said a minute ago, and we'll give us a, actually let's give us a class. We'll center this, and we'll say DAP token ICO sale. All right. Start our uh, project act again, and I'll just leave this running this time. Okay, that gives us a, uh, a nice header here. We'll uh, go back to a project, and we'll uh, give us some space with the horizontal rule and a break. Oops, can be. Correct here. Uh, all right, let's do. Let's go ahead and just catch up some content. So we'll do uh, div. We'll give us an ID, and then we'll also give us a class. Um. And we'll say, you know, introducing app token. Sorry. And we'll uh, you break this. We'll say token. Price is let's say span um, token price and uh, we'll leave this blank for now. We'll actually wire this up with JavaScript ether and we'll say you currently have uh, all right. We give us another spam. We'll, we'll, we'll fill in these values with JavaScript. They're gonna be blank first in our template. Um, and then we'll give us a non-breaking space. Capitalize this. Take a look. All right, so we can see our text that we've created here. Now let's get a visual reference for like what we're actually building, right? So sorry, this has been abstract without you know seeing what we're going for. Um, this is the kind of final project that's on the Rinkeby test network. Um, so we're going to build this whole thing out, right? This is our client side application. Um, minus this, I don't think I'm going to add the uh, little uh, announcement. You can do that yourself if you'd like as an extra exercise. Um, but yeah, we're going to you know create this layout. We're going to create a form to buy the tokens. We're going to show how many tokens you know have been sold, um, how many there you know there are total, and we'll show the account that we are connected to the uh, network with. So, so far, this is what we got. And next, I'm going to uh, basically, you know, break here. We'll add our form. And this is the form that we saw here. And uh, we'll do it like this. Say so form. Um, I believe Bootstrap requires this. We won't add an action because we'll just wire this up to JavaScript. But I think Bootstrap requires us to say role form. Uh, all right, so we'll do a div. This is sort of my special recipe for you know creating this inline form like this with the buttons here. Um, we'll do this uh, form group. And we'll say uh, input group. All right. And then we'll do uh, input uh, ID equals number uh, of tokens. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, and this input type is actually going to be a number. 
and we'll say, let's actually just format this like so. Put the ID first, type here. We'll do uh, name, number, we'll do value equals one. This will be the initial value that the form is initialized with. And we'll give it a minimum value as well because we don't want anyone to, you know, buy less than one token. And we'll also give it a pattern. This is pretty neat. Um, we can kind of add basically an HTML validation here um, that we only want, you know, integers from zero to nine in this form. And this is really because we don't want to really support fractional tokens at this point. We only want you to allow you to buy, you know, one DAP token or five DAP tokens or 100 DAP tokens. We don't want to support, you know, fractional tokens like 1.5 or 1.2. And that's just for the sake of this tutorial. So we'll save that. Um, let's add some styles to this as well. Add a class here. Um, say this is form control. say input LG All right, I think that'll work oops okay then we'll add a span actually let's do this span uh, I think this is input uh, a group button this is going to be the submit button. Button. This will be type a submit. Class is going to be a button. Button primary. And button large. We'll say buy tokens. All right. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what that does. I may. I may need to add some more styles to this. But let's see. Oh, this is the, no, no. Yep, that's it. Yep, that's the same as the, uh, it's a little wider, but that's the uh, same as the other website. Okay, so that's uh, the beginnings of our form. We can see our inline form here. We can, you know, it's initialized to one. We don't want it to say zero. We try to submit that. It's going to scream at us. Value must be greater than or equal to one. If we do 1.5, it's going to say, uh, you know, it's an invalid value. So let's refresh that. Um, zero. Right, it doesn't work. Okay, so we got our form on the page. And we want to... Um, let's see what else we want to add. Oh, I forgot we got this uh, loader. This is a not a loader, like a progress bar. This is kind of showing how many tokens have been sold. This is pretty small because only this many out of the total supply have been sold. But we'll add it anyway. Um, let's uh, add progress. So once we're done with the form, we'll just minimize this. We'll say, uh, we'll break here, and we'll say div.progress. And uh, div ID progress. And uh, we'll give it some classes as well. Class, this is their bootstrap specific bar, progress, bar, striped, and active. And we need to give it a minimum and a maximum value. Let's see here. Yeah. Value min equals zero. Yeah. Value max equals 100. Okay, let's just save that for now. See where we're at. All right, so we have our loader. Let's just see if we can kind of tell it that the minimum value is like 50 or something. Uh, we'll actually see that uh, when we wire it up. Let's just leave it at zero for now. Um, we'll actually talk to this in JavaScript and tell it, you know, how far of progress it is. So let's also add a uh, place for our, uh, showing the token sold. Let's be P. And we'll say a span tokens sold. We'll leave it blank for now. And we'll do a slash span uh, tokens available. So 
So the idea is that we want to create, you know, something that says this many tokens out of this total supply have been sold. So we'll create the skeleton for that here. <laughs> Typo. Let's see. Uh, PHP tokens sold. All right. So like I said, this is blank. We'll wire this up in a minute. But we're just giving ourselves a skeleton. And next, let's uh, add a uh, another div. Well, let's actually do this. HR. And we'll add a place for the account address that we're connected to the network with. So P. Um, do account address. We'll leave that blank for now. Shouldn't see any changes, but let's make sure we didn't break anything. Well, we saw our, our horizontal rule tag, um, so that's good. But we won't see an account address yet because we haven't wired this up. Okay, and I also want to add a loader um, because we're going to load a lot of this content asynchronously on the page. And we'll you know show this loader uh, now, but we want to show hide it whenever we wire up the um, JavaScript. So above all of our content, I'm going to add um, div loader. And this will just have a paragraph tag. Uh, so just say loading. I'll save this. So the idea is, uh, you know, we're going to load this page, you know, asynchronously with uh, with data from the blockchain with a kind of giant render method. Um, and while it's loading, we want to show this loader and hide all of this. Um, but, you know, once it's rendered, we want to hide the loader and show the content. And that's why I've created both of these things on the page for now. Um, so let's go to the page and we can see loading here. Now we won't want to see all of this at the same time whenever we you know build this out but this gets us started. It gives us all the content that we need on our page. So I'll save that. Um, all right that's a good start. We've got all of our HTML laid out that we need. Now let's try wiring it up. We'll go to our app.js file and um, we can pull this out. Let's actually create and uh, uh, you know an app for us to use. We'll do that like this. App is just equal to this big object, and we'll create an init function. And we'll just say console log app initialize. All right. And below this, we can, uh, you know, initialize our app whenever this file loads. We do that like this. This is pretty common uh, pattern for, you know, um, whenever our, our file loads. This is how we boot our app a lot and many, many apps that use jQuery like this. It's so window.load. function app .init. so essentially what we're just saying is um, whenever the window loads we want to initialize our app so if this initializes correctly we should see this logged in the console app initialize go back to our page and check our console the app was initialized properly all right so let's go uh, back to our app and the first thing that we want to do is kind of wire up this app in order to talk to the blockchain so that we can start filling in some of the values on the page, right? So um, let's do this. Let's, let's instantiate Web3. Now remember, Web3 is going to be the JavaScript library that we use to uh, get our our front-end client to talk to the blockchain, right? It's going to basically allow our app to communicate to the blockchain um, when it's deployed to a web server or on our local machine. So there's Web3, I mean, there's a pretty standard configuration that looks like this. Um, 
and we'll basically use this pattern. You don't necessarily have to understand everything that's going on here. That's okay um, it's in order to be able to use it. I think this is a case where you don't have to understand how the car works in order to drive it. So we'll just do a basic configuration that looks like this. This is the you know suggested uh, pattern from GitHub. And um, sorry, you can uh, check this out on the Ethereum organization. This is the Web3 project. You can read more about this if you'd like. So I'm just going to say init web3. This will be a function. We want to call this whenever our app is loaded because we want to initialize our app so that it can talk to the blockchain. Um, and I'm just going to paste in some code here that looks a lot like the code we just saw from GitHub. All right. So let's kind of step through this and, and talk about what it is. So essentially, Web3 is going to depend on an HTTP sorry, an HTTP provider, um, and that's going to be provided by uh, MetaMask, right? So MetaMask is something we installed in the dependencies for this project, um, and MetaMask is going to be uh, the browser extension that turns our, you know, modern web browser into a blockchain browser because, you know, most browsers by default won't talk to the blockchain, and we need an extension like MetaMask in order to do that, and hopefully you installed that from the dependencies portion of the first couple of videos. So what we want to do is get uh, MetaMask to essentially talk to Web3. And MetaMask is going to inject a, an HTTP provider into our browser um, that allows our browser to talk to our client-side application, which talks to the blockchain. So we basically want to wire up MetaMask to Web3. And that's we do that with the current provider that MetaMask injects. So let's... Um, we do that here. So essentially... If um, if the Web3 provider is already provided by MetaMask, we want to just uh, you know set this to the app at Web3 provider. So keep track of that here. Web3 provider start off null, um, and we'll you know sign this to a new Web3 object like this. And if it's not, we want to basically just default to. Um, the local HTTP provider, uh, which is the same, uh, you know, host and port as Ganache. See that here. It's the same, same, same location. Seventy-five forty-five. So don't get too tripped up if you don't understand this configuration. This is really just based off, you know, what Web three tells you to do on GitHub, um, and this is, you know, how it's adapted for our project. So you feel free to copy the code in the description below if you get stuck. All right, so let's uh, actually do that here. We'll say return uh, app.initweb3. All right, let's uh, let's refresh this and see if it works. All right, we see our console logging statement and no errors, so that's a good start. Okay, so now that Web3 is initialized, um, we can do a little more. Next, we want to do is um, initialize our smart contracts that we can, you know, wire up the wire up our app. So the next thing we'll do is uh, add a function for that. We'll say init contracts. All right. Now, what we want to do is get the contract abstractions from this directory here. This is our build contract directory. And this gives us, you know, uh, a JSON representation of our smart contract with an ABI, which is an abstract binary interface that describes how the contract works, you know, all the functions and things like that. Um, it's provided, you know, for the Ethereum virtual machine to allow the contract to be encoded and decoded. And uh, Truffle Contract is the library that we'll use to interpret these. And we'll see it knows about the address of our contracts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, so we're going to read out uh, one of these files. And we can do this with uh, get JSON. And we can uh, read one of these files out of this directory like so. Say function uh, 
okay? And let me tell you why this works. So why am I not saying, uh, you know, build contracts, right? Because uh, Browserify, or sorry, Browser Sync, uh, the, the dependency that is comes with Light Server, we configured this build, you know, contracts directory to be exposed to the root of our project. So, you know, everything from source and everything from build contracts is being combined together um, with Light Server and, you know, Browser Sync in order to... Uh, you know, build our project. So we can actually reference our contract abstractions just from the root here. All right. So now we want to say, um, we want to actually assign this. So let's keep track of our contracts here. Okay. We can say, you know, app.contracts. Uh, dap again sale is equal to here's where we're going to use a truffle contract and remember we pulled the truffle contract in the dependencies so truffle contract is going to give us um, a lot of nice functionality that allows us to read our contracts and interact with them and you know, you can interact with smart contracts directly with Web3, but there's a lot of nice things that you get for free with Truffle. Uh, for one, it plays nicely with the entire Truffle framework. So, for example, you know, whenever we, you know, initialize this contract uh, with one of these JSON files, we get um, something, you know, it knows how to read this file natively. If you're going to use Web3 by itself, uh, you might have to use this ABI by itself, but Truffle contract understands this entire JSON file. And it's also going to be really nice later when we decide to deploy this project to a different network because uh, Truffle contract knows how to read these uh, different networks so that we can uh, know the address depending on where we decide to deploy our smart contract and we don't have to keep you know copy and pasting values or using some sort of environment variables. Um, you know, this handles it all for us out of the box with this JSON file. So it knows how to do all that. And, you know, we're going to create, you know, an abstraction that's going to allow us to essentially interact with this uh, DAP token sale contract with Truffle contract in a very simple and streamlined way. So we'll say app.contracts um, DAP token sale uh, set provider. This will be the app.web3 provider. This is what we, you know, uh, set here. And we'll do app. Uh, we will, let's get a deployed instance of this contract just to see if it works. Deployed. This is a lot like our tests. You can see this pattern a lot. Let's we'll say dap token sale. And we'll just console log this for now. Tap token sale address. Say dap uh, token sale address. Okay. All right, let's see if this worked. Let's uh, go to our project. All right, and it has not worked, and I'll tell you why because we have not connected uh, to our local network with MetaMask. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to essentially get our contract and connect to it with this address that Web3 knows about. But first we must uh, actually set up MetaMask. And we can do that like this. So make sure you install MetaMask from the, you know, the dependencies portion of the tutorial. And uh, let's actually import an account from uh, from Ganache. Well, actually, first, let's change the network. See, I'm connected to the Rinkeby test network because I wanted to look at our mock-up here. But let's actually connect to our local network. We can do that uh, by saying custom RPC 
because we are, you know, connected to port 7545 with Ganache, um, which is the port we want to connect to. So we'll just copy that. Sorry, MetaMask is not working. Um, so we'll, you know, 8545 is a default port that a lot of people use for development, but we're going to use 7545 since that's what Ganache is running on. So, you know, we selected custom RPC and let's enter the URL, click save. All right. So we are connected to that network. Now let's change networks just to clear this out. All right. Now let's uh, let's import one of our accounts from Ganache. We do that like this, go to account and import account, and we can select a private key. That's how we will uh, import this account. Now, don't use a private key from one of your accounts from the main network. That would be bad. So if you didn't catch that, I'm in Ganache. Uh, you know, I'm going to click just the first account for now. We'll import a couple, but um, yeah, we'll take this one first. We'll go to the show key, so we'll select the private key, copy that. Sorry. Import account, private key, we paste it there, import. All right, so this is uh, an account that's connected to our private network. Let's refresh. All right, still not working. Um, I believe that's because we haven't actually called init contracts. We'll do that here, app.init contracts. All right, let's save that. All right, so we can see that uh, the contract was initialized, and here's the address. So, boom, that's a good test. Our client-side application is actually talking to the blockchain. It's talking to Ganache. It got you know this smart contract uh, DAP token sale, which is what we wanted, and it uh, got the address. It actually uh, was able to connect to it, which is really nice. All right. So let's uh, do the same thing for our, our token contract because we need both smart contracts in order to develop this uh, client side application. We need our token sale contract that we built and we also need the token contract as well. So we want to do this with a promise chain. So whenever this is done, we want to um, also get our uh, DAP token. So we'll copy this just like we did. We'll say dap token, dap token.json. And we'll basically do the same thing that we did up here. Um, let's do this. Let's actually just copy all this. Okay, close that out. All right, and this will be, uh, let's change all the sales to just token. I think that'll work. And then we'll, all right. So basically we just, you know, set up DAP token just like we did the token sale, it's pretty standard. Um, let's save this, go back to our browser. All right, we got a little problem here. So app.contracts.daptokensale.deployed, then, then done is not a function. Okay, let's just see what our issue is here. Let's see, it's because I just changed this too early. Uh, so what we want to do is actually, um, we want to do this whenever the uh, get JSON is, is finished. So we'll do that like this. Sorry, guys. And that means we have uh, too much here. All 
All right, there we go. There's a token sale address and there's the token address. So we've got both of these contracts uh, in our app. And that means our, you know, our app is talking successfully to the blockchain, which is what we want. So that's pretty good progress. Um, so let's try to wire up um, part of this project to the client side. Whenever we want to lay out our client side, we will um, basically create a render function in our app that's going to actually like, you know, just show everything on the page. So we'll do that like this. So it'll be a function as well. And let's just do, let's just show an account. So we can get access to the account that we are connected to like this with the web three. ETH dot get Coinbase. This would be the error. This is a callback function that uh, is accepted by this function. And we'll say, you know, if there's no error, then we'll say app dot account account. And we will uh, actually wire up the account. We'll say your account. And we'll add account here. Now I'll show you what I'm doing. Well, first let's add a default value to the app. We'll say uh, 0x0. Zero, zero. And actually, we need to do this in a string. Let's, uh, yeah, it works. So what we're doing here is we're querying for the account address uh, on the DOM. This is here. And we're trying to wire this up. So let's check that out. This is add a comment here. This will be, uh, we'll just call this, you know, load account data. Let's check our browser. All right, nothing yet. Let's see what the issue is. I believe that's because we haven't actually called render yet. So let's call render. And after we initialize our contracts, so we first want to get, you know, we, we want to ensure that all our contracts are loaded. So we'll do that like this. We will wait for this to be done. And then we will, you know, wait for this to be done. And we'll say app, uh, well, return app.render. Let's try that. All right, still nothing. Let's try to just log the address, see if there's anything lost in translation. So let's just try this. So log count, count. All right, so our account is logged, so I bet there's just an issue with querying the DOM. So app account is equal to account and account address. Let's see if we actually define that correctly. Um, account address. Let's just copy that. All right, let's just try to save again and reload. All right, boom, there it is. Yeah, we can see the account has been listed on the page. Let's uh, give ourselves some space here. Yeah, there we go. All right, so we have uh, successfully wired up our account on the page. So now we know our front-end application is talking to the blockchain. We've got, um, uh, yeah, we've got a, you know, a token sale website, a basic one that's got some of these values filled in with our app.js file. And I think that's where I'm, I'm going to cut it off for today, guys. 
Um, be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you can see the next video when it comes out. Uh, in the next video, we'll probably you know wire up the rest of this website where you can uh, you know see all of the uh, the values wired up here, and we'll try to wire up this form and show this progress bar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So be sure to subscribe to the channel uh, to see that video. And until then, thanks for watching DAP University. Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University. So welcome back to this multi-part tutorial where I'm showing you how to create you know, your own cryptocurrency and ICO on the Ethereum blockchain. In this video, we're going to try to finish building out the client side uh, portion of our decentralized application. You know, this is the token sale website where we allow you know, accounts to purchase our DAP tokens that we built in the previous videos. So be sure to check out the previous videos in this series if you haven't already. And be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you can see the rest of the videos for this tutorial when they come out. And if you're picking up at this point in the project, you can check out the GitHub link in the description below. So if you're uh, kind of just catching back up, let's you know go through a couple things. Uh, make sure that you have Ganache running. This is our local blockchain, so Ganache is running. And you also want to make sure that you install your dependencies with uh, npm install. I've already done this, so I'm going to skip this step. Um, and we want to start a uh, light server. So we do that with npm run dev. And this kind of picks up on our project where we last left off. We last uh, wired up this account. Uh, you know, we wired, we, we laid out our, our markup for our, our token sale website and we actually, you know, wired up the account. Now we want to try to fill in the other values and kind of make this whole thing work. So let's get started. We'll go, uh, back to our project. This is uh, our app.js file that we were working on. So let's try to fill in some more values. You know, we started building out this render function. This is going to be something that's essentially going to um, essentially going to just act as our uh, kind of main function that just, you know, renders the entire app. And, you know, we created a loader here um that you know we're showing we're showing everything for now but we created a loader that you know shows that we want to show that if the app is loading asynchronously because you know of the asynchronous nature of the blockchain and we want to hide the content if it's loading and if the content is available and you know all of it's loaded we want to show the content and hide the loader so let's do that first um we'll just say let's actually do this We'll go to the content and uh, say style equals display none. All right, so that should show our loader and hide the content. All right, so this is what we want to see like when the content's loading. And when it actually is finished loading, we want to uh, you know lay out the project. So we'll do that here. Um, let's do this. Let's first keep track of like the loading state. Now, a couple of you messaged me on the last tutorial, of, you know, the, the election decentralized application tutorial, uh, where you saw like some things load twice on the page. It looks kind of funny. Um, that's because we didn't really prevent the double loading error. Um, that's pretty common for you know a JavaScript project like this, but we'll do that in this tutorial. So I'll show you if say if uh, app loading we will just return, right? So if if the app is loading, we don't want to like double render anything. We'll just like execute, or sorry, exit this function. Um, and we'll keep track of our loading status here at the uh, top of our project. We'll say loading, false. All right. So that's, what we'll do, if this is true, we'll skip this step. So we'll set it to true here. True. All right, so basically, if, like, if any of this is happening, uh, 
like if, if this is an asynchronous call, right, to get the account, um, we don't want to show any of the content until this is done. So we're going to say, hey, we're loading. Don't show the content yet. And whenever all this is finished down here, we're going to say, you know, stop loading and show the content. And we'll add a whole lot more uh, in between these two things, but this will get us started for now. So we'll uh, basically keep track of, you know, this uh, loader and this content. And we'll say, you know, var loader. Oops, loader equals loader var content. content just line that up for neatness loader content and first you know if this is loading and we're and we're executing this render function we'll say loader show and content oops and hide all right and then you know when this is done um, we're going to let's actually do this for now. We'll say we'll say done, and uh, we'll do that just like we did up here. Done a function. We're gonna move this in a minute, but this will work. And we'll say you know loader app dot loading uh, is equal to false. And then loader hide, and then content show. So essentially, like after all of our asynchronous processes are done, we want to, you know, tell the app's not loading anymore. We want to hide the loader and show the content. So we'll give this a try, see if we made any errors. All right, it's property done of uh, undefined. So this doesn't actually return a promise. So this um, doesn't work like I expect. Um, so let's skip this for now. Um, this will become, this will work correctly whenever we actually, you know, pull all the data from our contracts. So let's skip this part for the moment, but we will move this back into a promise chain whenever we actually develop our data from the contracts. All right, so that works. So we can refresh. All right, so yeah, so we can see the loader happening for a moment, and then boom, done. Okay, so we've wired up our, our loader to wait for the uh, wait for all the contract data to come in that we have so far. And really, that's not any contract data yet; it's just the account data. Um, so let's go ahead and start, you know, getting some of these values filled in from our smart contracts. This is kind of the exciting meat and potatoes part of the tutorial. So first what we can do is um, grab our, our token sale contract, you know, that we, we, we added here, you know, app.contracts.tokensale, and we'll fetch this a lot like we did in the tests. So we'll say app.contracts, dap token sale, sorry, should just use tab to completion, deployed. Then function and say instance. This was a lot, like our, a lot like our test, if you recall. It was a dap token sale instance, and then we'll return. Instance. Let's, uh, sorry, typo. Let's get the price. How about that? All right, so just a, you know, quick recap. This looks a lot like our, our async pattern that we used in the tests, right? Um, you know, dap token sale dot deploy, then function instance, and we're signing the instance here. So a similar pattern. Um, 
that we use in our, our JavaScript app. So we'll go to the token price and we'll say, you know, then function token price. And we'll say app.tokenPrice. I'll actually cache this here. And we'll start off by just, uh, we'll start off, let's use that default value that we had in our migrations. So if you go to, you know, migrations, um, deploy contracts, this was the token price that we set in the previous videos. So we'll copy this. And we'll just add this as the default value for now. But we want to update this uh, from our contract. So app.tokenPrice equals token price. And um, I'll see here. We want to actually show that price in the website. So do that like this. Token price. Oops, token price. <laughs> Token price, uh, we just want to set the HTML. And we want to say app.tokenPrice. Um, now, if you remember, we set the token price in way. But we actually want to show the token price in Ether. Right? So we'll do one thing at a time, but we'll we'll update that here in a second. So let's just see if we can actually put this token price in, in the DOM. Let's just see. All right, so it didn't seem like it worked. Um, let's see why. Let's see if we actually got our token price. We can do console log token price. All right, token price. Let's see if we have to call two number on this. All right, yeah, so we had to just call two number. So that worked, but this looks wrong, right? This is not a bazillion ether, right? This is should be 0 0.001 ether. We want to show this amount uh, as 0 0.001, and uh, this is currently in way. Remember, because that's you know the, the unit that we have to use in our smart contracts. Uh, you know, way is the smallest denomination of ether, and that's how we store prices, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in our smart contracts. So we want to convert this to something that our user is going to understand. And we can do that with the uh, Web3 library. We do that like this. We say uh, Web3. We have a nice uh, helper called from way. And we can pass in the price. We'll take this off first. Um, so we can pass in the amount of way, and we can give it the unit that we want it to convert to. We want to say ether. Right, and we can do that and call two number. So what it's going to do is Web three from way. It's going to take in the amount of way, which is the price, and convert it to Ether for us. So we expect this to be like 0 0.001 when we look at our page. Uh oh, syntax error. Looks like I'm missing a uh, parenthesis here. All right, let's see. HTML, two numbers on a function. Uh, it's because I called it too early, sorry. So you want this here. All right, boom, it worked. So now the token price, we're actually reading this from the smart contract. Token price is 0 0.001 ether, which is what we expect. It's not this big, long, bazillion number that we see from, you know, way. All right. So, Next, let's uh, actually update. Um, let's update this loader and you know this information down here. So let's get the amount of tokens sold. We will return. Oops. Return uh, DAP token 
sale instance, uh, token sold. We'll say then function. We'll say token sold. And we'll say app dot token sold. Um, to number. We'll keep track of that here. Let's start off with zero. Um, okay. And let's update this value. So we can see we want to find the content, find token sold, and you know tokens available. And we want to actually update this value first, and then we'll update this value next. Okay. So we'll do that like this. Uh, tokens sold. Say HTML. App .token sold. Save that. See if it works. All right, boom, we got a number here. Token sold, zero so far, which is what we expect. We haven't bought any yet. And we can do uh, tokens available. And we'll do HTML app.tokens available. Oops. Okay, so I'm actually just gonna use, I'm just gonna let our front end app, uh, you know, tell us how many tokens are available. So we'll say tokens available. So we'll say 500 or 75,000, 750,000, excuse me. Um, so we'll actually put that in our file as well. All right, so we can see that zero of 750,000 have been sold. Okay, so the next thing we wanna do is update our uh, loader. We wanna show you know, this thing here. Um, we wanna show some progress. So let's actually you know, kind of fake the amount of tokens sold first. Uh, so we can you know, show some progress on this loader. We'll just say 500,000. This is a fake value that I'm going to use to kind of stub this. Oops, sorry. Uh, I'll say token sold 600,000, right? Go back here. So guys, that didn't work. Let's see why zero. Oops, that's because I uh, left off an S here. Tokens sold. Tokens sold. All right. So let's uh, update tokens sold to you know this just arbitrary amount for now. Just just get our loader to work. So yeah, we can see a much higher number here. This is six hundred thousand of seven hundred fifty thousand. So let's work on our loader. Um, so I'm going to say var uh, progress percent. This is going to be, uh, we're going to round up. And we'll say app.token sold. And we'll uh, app.tokens available. So what we're doing is just creating a percentage uh, by you know, dividing the number of tokens that uh, are available. Sorry, the number of tokens sold by the number of tokens available. And we're just gonna you know, round here. And we'll find our loader. This is how we tell our loader what to do. Um, you know, progress. And we're gonna give it uh, some values based on just CSS width, which is pretty nice. It's pretty easy, pretty easy, pretty magic. So we'll just query for that. Oops. And we'll say uh, your progress. And we'll just say CSS. 
width, say progress percent. We'll give it a percentage. Oops. And again, I'm just going to use a fake value here so that we can see that the loader actually works. All right, so this is not really what I expect. Let's see here. Um, let's log this to see what's going on. Progress percentage of one. All right, let's see here. Uh, I actually did a couple things wrong here. Um, so yeah, let's not round here. Let's instead do this. Take this off. I was trying to figure out a way to get this uh, progress bar to accept a percentage. So let's you know, divide these numbers and then multiply them by 100. And I actually did this wrong. Let's add these together. So we want to take the, we want to get a percentage. You want to divide these numbers and then multiply by 100. I think this will work. And then just apply the styles to this, say width. You know, progress percent is equal to this width. So let's check out our project. All right, boom, that loader is working. So again, I just used, you know, a fake value here just to see if it works. Let's change it to like 50%. So we'll say, you know, roughly 300, uh, roughly 375, sorry, 75. Could just change this around. All right, so that worked. Um, now let's actually go set this to our um, you know, value from our contract. So this should really be zero. But I just wanted to ensure that the, that the loader was working. All right, that didn't work. Let's see, token sold. Can round this. So we actually want to update this to be uh, two number. Try that again. All right, boom. So that worked. Um, zero out of seven hundred fifty thousand tokens, and we don't see any you know progress here because you know we shouldn't have any for zero. Um, all right. So that gives us that part uh, working. I think that should be all of our basic UI functionality. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, let's, let's wire this part up. You currently have, you know, X number of tokens. Let's let's add that here. So we can do that. Um, we can do that like this. Um, let's, we got to load the token contract to check the balance. So we'll, uh, you know, load token contract. And I'll add a comment here just to explain what's going on. To be load token sale contract. And we'll do app.contracts uh, dap token deployed. Sorry. Yeah. Then function. Say instance. And we'll say dap token instance. Oops, sorry, take sale off. Equals uh, instance, just like we did up here. And then we'll say return, dap token instance, uh, balance of. Remember, this is how we find the balance of an account. And we'll say app.account. And we'll uh, use our promise chain. balance and we will update the balance this is uh, here you currently have you know X number of balance debt balance and we'll say HTML the balance to number we'll see if that worked All right, it did work. And that's because um, 
you know, we are using the account that's connected, um, the first account in the network, which is used by Ganache. And that's the, yeah, you know, default account that, you know, owns all the tokens whenever we deploy this. And we haven't actually, you know, transferred any of these tokens to the sale yet. So what we'll do is add a new account to Ganache really quick. Or sorry, to MetaMask from Ganache. We'll add the second account. Get its private key. And we'll go here. Sorry, MetaMask is being stubborn. Um, we'll import an account, the private key. I'm actually going to rename this. We'll call this Ganache 2. And I'm going to rename this one as well. Ganache 1. Ganache 1, go back to Ganache 2. It's at 100 Ether in the balance. All right, so this is updated. You currently have zero DAP tokens, which is what we expect for someone who hasn't, you know, purchased any yet. You remember, this first account is the account that deployed the contract, so they got all million tokens, and we haven't actually transferred those to the token sale yet. So maybe we should do that in a migration. We can do that in the next video. Um, but yeah, that shows you, you know, kind of what you've got so far. All right, so the next thing we want to do is go back to our project and we want to actually uh, move this inside of our uh, promise chain. So we want to really ensure that all this stuff is done uh, whenever we finish. We can say, you know, app.loading here. Okay. And again, this is all the stuff that we want to do uh, whenever all of our asynchronous actions are finished. And uh, this is all the asynchronous activity that's going to be in our render function. And we want to wait for all that's done to, uh, you know, stop loading and hide the loader and show the app. So I'll do that. Refresh the page. See a loading bar and boom. Once it's done, everything renders out nicely. All right, so the last thing we want to do, I believe, in this uh, app.js file is actually wire up this form. So we want to be able to, you know, go over here and purchase some tokens. So let's do that. Go to app.js and, uh, yeah, let's add a, you know, buy tokens function. And we'll say, sorry. Say, uh, when we do this, we want to do a similar thing. We want to, you know, hide the content. Hide. And we want the loader, loader to show. Um, and, yeah. Let's do that for now. We'll, uh, Say, you know, the number of tokens. We'll read this from the form. I'll show you that. That is uh, here. Number of tokens, that's the input. I'll actually just copy this to make sure there's no typos. Oh, there was a typo. Number of token. Let's actually make that tokens. Okay, we'll get that value. And we will, you know, interact with our contract and try to create a transaction. We do that just like we did in our tests. We say app.contracts, uh, dap token, sorry, token sale, uh, deployed, and then function instance and um, we'll say return instance by tokens and we'll say the number of tokens 
that we declared here. And we'll pass some other things to this. We'll say, uh, we'll give some, some metadata, right? This is what we kind of did in our test in the console. We'll say from app account, we'll say value. This would be number of tokens um, times app token price. So remember, we want to send the amount of ether uh, expressed in way. So we take the number of tokens times the token price, which we set here. And we also read that from the contract. That's the default value. But we updated this whenever the contract loaded. And we'll specify the gas limit. Say, uh, sorry. We'll do this as a default value for now. And then we'll uh, get the result. And we'll just say uh, console log tokens bot. Now I'll see if this works. If it does, let's reset the form. Oops, trigger. This might not work, but we'll try it. And um, yeah, I'll try to show this. We'll hide the loader and show the content. So we also need to tell our form to call this function whenever it submits. So we can just go to our form here and uh, do that like this. We can just tell it um, to call that function on, on uh, submit. And I'll say on submit uh, app dot buy tokens and we'll uh, prevent the default behavior here by returning false okay so let's uh, we'll try that there's a step that we skipped but I just want to make sure we have no compilation errors here We'll try to go to this account, make sure we're connected with the right one. We'll try to buy a token. It's not going to work, I don't think, because we skipped a step, which I'll highlight. All right, invalid number of arguments into the solidity function. So let's see what we missed there. Ah, well, first of all, we need to migrate. Let's do truffle, migrate, reset. All right. Let's run the server. So I buy tokens. All right, so telling us that we have an invalid number of arguments. So let's see why. All right, so it looks like the error here is because um, I called the wrong thing. It should be number of tokens. All right, number of tokens here, 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 and here. So we'll try that again. Save that. Go back to our uh, project, and uh, let's just let's just ensure that we actually have like a MetaMask confirmation. You know, if I click this and it works, I expect MetaMask to pop up and ask me to confirm this transaction. All right, so it did. Uh, yeah, so see, it got our gas that we specified in the in the metadata, and uh, let's try to submit. It's not going to work, I don't think. So let's try. All right, so this looks like a new error, which is what we expect. All right, this is a revert. Now, why is this reverting? So let's go back to our um, contract that we developed. Um, let's see here. Contracts, token sale, buy tokens. So we want this to revert if the token contract balance is, uh, you know, 
not if the number of tokens is bigger then we want it to uh if well we want to require that the balance is bigger than the number of tokens so we just said we want to buy you know one dap token but guess what our token contract doesn't actually have any and remember in our test suite um we actually had to you know provision some tokens to the um you know to the actual token sale contract and that's what we need to do here right okay so this is actually a uh, you know setup step for the app that you'll have to perform if you want to purchase any tokens we actually need to you know provision some tokens to the token sale contract so we'll do that manually with the console um, let's go here we'll let's open a new tab Okay, let's do truffle console. We can get the uh, token sale uh, like this. Void then function. Let's say I token sale equals I. All right, and then we can get the token. All right. So what we want to do, just like our test, is um, you know move some tokens from the you know to to the token sale instance, right? So we basically want to say, you know, transfer um, some tokens to this address. And it's going to be the number of tokens available, which you want to be 750,000. So we'll actually add this to our console as well, tokens available. All right. And um, let's see here. Let's, where do we do this? We'll transfer the token sale instance address, tokens available, and we'll do it from the admin. So we'll say admin here equals web three dot eth dot accounts zero. Okay. And we'll do this. So we'll say token transfer and we'll say token sale address. We'll do the tokens available, which we just set here. And we'll say from admin. All right. So that looks like that was successful. We can check by going back to our uh, token sales site and going back to our admin account to see if they, you know, had any tokens subtracted. You know, they started with a million. We expect to see, you know, uh, 250,000 at this point. Refresh. Boom, it's exactly what we expect. So it successfully transferred the tokens uh, out of the admin's account into the token sale. We can see, uh, you know, token uh, balance of, uh, let's see, token sale address. Yep, 750,000. So that worked. So now I'll try to buy some tokens with uh, our other account. We'll switch to account two. And let's just try to buy one token. So we'll say buy tokens. Oops, that didn't work. Unknown address, unable to sign transaction to this address. Okay, so this is an issue that happens um, sometimes with MetaMask. We'll see if it happens again. I might have to restart Chrome. Oh, that worked. I just refreshed. Sometimes you have to change networks um, or uh, restart Chrome. It's kind of a known issue. It's a little bit of a pain, but uh, it is what it is. So I'm going to try to submit this. Submit. All right, it's like tokens were bought. Let's see if we can refresh. All right, so I just uh, refreshed one more time, and this took a second, but yeah, we can see that the, um, yeah, it actually worked, you know? We, we have one DAP token. All right, so I just did that again, and, um, you know, we can see we can buy another token. So at this point, we have to, you know, refresh our page in order to see the updates, but we don't want to do that. 
So let's uh, actually build that out as well. And now the last thing we want to do is uh, refresh the page whenever you know our um, you know whenever our contract is updated. We want to see you know these tokens update. So I just bought another token. That's why this is three. So if I buy you know if I submit this form, I want to wait till the contract's updated. And when it's done, um, I want to you know see all the data. So what we're going to do is use this event um, that we created in the token sale. We want to watch for the sell event. And we'll do that like this. Whenever the sell event is triggered, you know, after a, a successful sale, here's where we want to update our client. So go to app.js and we'll create a new function. We'll say, uh, I'll do it here above render. So I'll minimize these so we can see. And we'll call this uh, listen for events. Let's be, you know, list for events emitted from the contract. And sorry, it's be a function. Ah, my tab to completion is not really working. So what we'll do inside here is say, you know, app dot contracts tap token sale uh, deployed like we do every other time, then, oops, then function, we'll say instance, and we'll say uh, instance, we're going to watch the cell event, and we're going to pass an empty object because we don't want to filter anything, I'm not really going to get into the details of that, but just know that that's not what we want to do, and we will say that we want to uh, watch uh, from block zero, to block latest, all right, and we want to uh, say whenever that's done, we want to watch this, say function error and we want to console log uh, an event triggered, and we want to re-render the page. Now this is the this is like the main part is uh, whenever the cell events trigger we want to reload everything that's why it's kind of like one of the reasons we created this big old render function uh, okay so what we'll do is also take out uh, this we don't need this anymore we'll uh, actually just set um, that here here, no, sorry, we do need that, my fault. We're gonna take it out of buy tokens. Um, we just don't really want to do anything here. We just want to wait for an event to be triggered. Well, specifically, we'll say wait for sell event. All right, we'll save that and go back to our browser, loading. And let's, uh, uh oh, did I mess something up? Yeah, it looks like I did that in the wrong place. Sorry. Let's, uh, copy that and undo. Um, keep that there. Sorry, this is inside the render function. We want to go down to the buy tokens function and take that out here. Um, we'll say wait for sell event. All right, so we'll refresh. Let's buy another. Let's buy a hundred tokens. I'm feeling lucky. Let's buy a hundred tokens and see what happens. All right, we'll submit. We'll wait, wait, wait. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. All right, so I'm still waiting. I'm stuck in a waiting loop. That's because we didn't actually listen for this event. We want to take this listen for event function, and we want to call it here. So before we, uh, you know, initialize our contracts, <laughs> we're going to do app .listen for events. You all are getting all of the uh, fun experiences of developing something in real time. This is kind of how this whole process works. It's good to know how to catch your own errors, though. Um, okay, so we'll go back here and refresh. 
Uh, oh, deployed, undefined. So it looks like we made a mistake in our our function. Uh, let's see here. Listen for events. Uh, DAP token sale. App dot contracts. Let's copy this. Uh, we need to do this after we initialize our contracts. Actually, uh, let's do it here. Okay. So yeah, we're doing this inside the in init contracts function, not the init web three. Or uh, yeah, that's my fault. Save that. Go back here. All right, see some transaction uh, transaction history. We'll clear that out, and let's try to buy some tokens and see if it works. Let's buy five. Let's buy five thousand. No, let's do five hundred. All right, boom, it refreshed on its own. Now that's working. All right, guys, so that's really it as far as the client side application goes. That's, uh, you know, full app.js code and uh, index.html file of our token sale website where we can buy tokens and see the number of tokens sold and the number of tokens that we've actually purchased. We can see our, you know, our balance of tokens in our account. So yeah, this is a fully functioning uh, ICO website that we've built locally. Um, so congratulations if you've, you've watched me code this whole thing up to this point. Uh, extra kudos to you. I hope that was helpful. Um, let's go ahead and commit everything that we've got. I'm going to, uh, before I commit anything, I'm actually going to add a git ignore file so that we don't... Uh, commit all of our node modules, which would be a nightmare. Uh, so let's do touched, get, ignore. Again, if you're unfamiliar with this, this just tells git which files to ignore. Uh, and we'll say node modules. All right, we'll save that. And let's see, get status. Now, you can see that this number has reduced greatly from this number. And I'll see git log. And um, we'll say git add dot git commit m. We'll say five uh, front end. All right. So that's good, guys. That's everything you really need to develop a uh, token sale website locally. If you'd like to uh, see more and subscribe to the channel so you can see the next videos, where we're actually going to get this token sale website off of our local machine and onto you know, a web server. And we'll also deploy the smart contracts to a test network. So we'll have a fully functioning um, you know, token sale website that's, you know, deployed out in the wild that you can show. And yeah, be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you can see those videos when they come out. And until then, thanks for watching DAP University. Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University. So welcome back to this multi-part tutorial where I'm showing you how to code your own cryptocurrency and build your own ICO on Ethereum. In this video, we're going to deploy the smart contracts that we've built up to this point in the tutorial to the Rinkeby test network. So the idea is that we have you know, developed our project locally. We've run our uh, smart contract with Ganache, uh, but today we're going to start using Geth and get our contracts off of our machine and onto a test network. So if you haven't seen the videos up to this point in the tutorial, be sure to check those out. And also subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see you know, the rest of the videos in this tutorial series. And make sure you turn on notifications with the bell below so that you can be notified about them when they come out.
And if they're already out, you can just check the link at the end of this video or watch the next video in the playlist. So up to this point in the tutorial, we have you know developed all of our smart contracts locally with Ganache. Um, you know Ganache has been our you know in-memory blockchain that we have used um, to you know develop and deploy and, and test our smart contracts. But um, in order to you know deploy the smart contracts to a test network or the main network for that matter. Um, we need to move beyond Ganache to something a little more robust. Now, Ganache is great for you know um, developing things quickly and you know these tutorials and things like that. Um, and you know Ganache has the same interface as uh, you know the main network and things like that. But you really, it's got different internals. Like it, it works you know completely differently uh, on the inside. It's an in-memory blockchain, and we want to you know connect to a real blockchain, um, and that's what we're going to do in this tutorial. So I will minimize this. So instead of Ganache, we are going to use uh, something called Geth, which you might already be familiar with. Um, Geth is a Go implementation of Ethereum. I'll show you that. So this is the Geth repository on GitHub. Um, you can kind of read more about this. You can see the link, uh, geth.ethereum.org, and it will tell you about it. So I'll leave you all to that if you want to check that out. Um, but yeah, we're going to be using geth. So essentially what we're going to do is install geth on our machine, and we're going to run our own Ethereum node. So, you know, how this is different from Ganache is, you know, Geth is a full-blown Ethereum node. And we are going to, you know, use it to, uh, you know, we're going to run that process to connect to the Rinkeby test network. So when we use this node, you know, we're going to be directly connected to the Rinkeby test network. So let's explain that for a second. Um, you know, fundamentally, you know, when you're connected to the Ethereum blockchain, um, it, as a node, you are participating in the network. So we're going to start a process on our machine that, um, you know, performs a lot of the uh, similar responsibilities as a web server. But, you know, we're going to be a node, a process um, that's, you know, helping run the entire uh, network. So we're going to, you know, download Geth and run it so that we can be, you know, a part of that process, a part of running the network. And we'll use Geth and our Ethereum node that we uh, spin up in order to deploy our contract and connect to uh, the test network. So let's go ahead and install Geth. I'll point you to these installation instructions. Um, I'll put a link to this down in the notes below this video. These are the installation instructions for Mac. That's what I'm going to be using. Um, if you'd like to, you know, um, you see the instructions for a different machine, uh, I'll, I'll leave that to you to check that out. But this is how I'm going to do it on Mac. This is with Homebrew, the package manager. You certainly don't have to use Homebrew, but it's the easiest way um, for me. Uh, you know, there's a variety of ways you can go to, you know, the... Um, you know, a website for, for Go Ethereum and download it directly if you wanted to and, you know, copy it to your user local bin. Um, you know, there's all kinds of ways you could do it, but I'm going to use Homebrew. If you don't have Homebrew, you can install it first. Um, so just looking at these instructions, what we would do is uh, first we want to add the tap. So we do that like this. We'll just watch these instructions here. You know, we do brew tap ethereum ethereum all right so i've already done this but i'm going to uh cancel but you want to you know finish that step and then we would do brew install ethereum and i have also already done this but you'll you know wait for this entire thing to finish if you haven't done this already So yeah, if you can complete both of those steps, you have successfully installed Geth. Um, we can kind of check that out by, uh, you know, saying which Geth. 
And if you get uh, user local bin geth, um, you know, geth has been installed. You can also say uh, geth version. I'm using, you know, 1.7.3. This is a stable version. Uh, so I'm going to clear this. So that, those are the two things that you could, you know, kind of use to verify that your installation uh, was successful before you try to, you know, uh, execute any more um, steps in this tutorial. If it's not, you want to kind of stop and try to figure out why, you know, geth may not have worked correctly. But if you did, let's continue. I'm going to run geth uh, first. But before I do that, um, I'm going to actually kind of split my windows here so that you guys can see what's going on. I'm going to maximize this. And I'm actually going to start a Tmux session. Uh, so Tmux is just a terminal multiplexer that's going to allow me to like split my panes here and manage uh, sessions in the terminal. If you're kind of just curious about what that is, um, you can see this here. This is the Wikipedia page for, for Tmux if you want to kind of read more about this. Um, but this is what I'm going to be using to split my panes and things like that. So I don't want to throw you off, but this is, uh, you know, some, some extra credit if you want to check this out. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to start this by going Tmux uh, A-T. I've already got a session running. Um, so I'm in our token sale directory for our project, and see this is just giving me two different panes, uh, and I'm going to kind of use these. Um, I'm going to run the geth uh, you know, node here, and I'm going to run a console here. So let's try to uh, start geth. We can do that like this, Get, uh, geth. Uh, and I'm going to connect to the Rinkeby network. Now let me explain that. So there are different networks on Ethereum. And, you know, we we used our local network uh, when we were using Ganache. But in order to, you know, deploy our uh, website, our token sale website, in order to deploy the smart contracts to this website, um, we want to use a test network. We don't want to use the main Ethereum network. So you can see if I open uh, MetaMask, we can choose the networks. There are you know, several listed here. Um, you know, some popular options are, uh, you know, the Robson test network or the Rinkeby test network. Um, so the main Ethereum network, right, is where, you know, it's just like what you think it is. It's the main network that you would connect to if you wanted to spend real Ether. Um, you know, you might have seen my other tutorials where I've used the Robson test network with Remix. Um, that's also fine, but for this tutorial, I want to use the Rinkeby test network. Um, so I, you know, I should note that any ether that you use in this tutorial on the Rinkeby test network is not worth anything on the main network. It's uh, it's fake, and that's actually good because we want to just um, you know test things. We want to test how our smart contract works in a, in a testing environment before we you know put it on the main network. So yeah, you know the goal is to get this website you know off our machine and get the smart contracts onto that test network first. So we're going to run our geth node with uh, the Rinkeby network. We're going to actually connect our node to the Rinkeby network. We can start geth, um, you know, connected to the Rinkeby test network like this. I'll explain this here. Um, and I can, you know, potentially even paste this command down in the show notes below. I'll go ahead and do that so I don't forget. Okay, so let's explain these uh, parameters. I'm going to start geth. I'm going to tell it uh, to use the Rinkeby test network with this flag. Um, I'm going to tell it to use the RPC flag and also specify some libraries that I want to have uh, in the geth console with this RPC API flag. Um, you know, I want to be able to use this uh, personal uh, ETH network uh, Web3 net. Then I want to specify the IPC path, and this is the kind of default path uh, that was set whenever you installed Geth with Homebrew on a Mac. Uh, if you're not on a Mac, this is going to be different for you. Um, I'll leave that up to you to uh, figure out what this value should be. So let's go ahead and start Geth. 
And in this uh, window over here, I'm going to start the geth console with geth attach. Okay. Now, let's explain what's happening over here. You know, this is our uh, geth node, which is going to be a node connected to the Rinkeby test network. And when we connect to the Rinkeby test network, we have to download its data. Now, why is that? Because, you know, when we're a node, we are, you know, participating in some of the similar responsibilities as a uh, web server. Um, and, you know, the, all the data on the blockchain is distributed. So if we're going to participate in that, we have to get all the data. Now, if we were going to uh, connect to the main network, the data is quite large. Um, and it's still somewhat large on the Rinkeby test network. But, you know, we have to uh, wait for all the data to download. And that could take some time, depending on if this is the first time you've ever done this or, you know, uh, basically how up to date your uh, local instance is. So you can see some activity here. We can track uh, whether or not uh, geth is syncing still by going to our console and typing eth syncing. Okay, you can see uh, the progress by checking the current block and the highest block. All right, so this is what we want to sync up to. This is our upper limit, and this is our current progress. We can watch this number change. Um, see, it's a little higher now. And I can also show you that um, we can see the blocks on Etherscan. So this is uh, rinkaby.etherscan.io. Make sure you use the Rinkaby subdomain if you want to, uh, you know, specify the Rinkaby test network on Etherscan. So we can see the blocks over here on the left on the home page. We can see, you know, this number here. Uh, last three digits are 318. We can see this over here, uh, 315. So that's a little behind, but it's pretty close. Um, so these, you know, um, blocks should be roughly the same. Now, while this is syncing, um, let's go ahead and create an account. You know, we need an account to connect the Rinkeby test network. So, uh, I'm going to exit the console. All right. So we can create a new account like this, uh, geth dash dash Rinkeby. We want to specify the network that we want to create the account on. That's very important. Um, we we'll say account new. All right, now your new account is locked with a password. Now, it's important to know that our accounts are either locked or unlocked. Um, so this is asking us to give us a password. Um, so I would suggest that you use a real password for this. Don't just say ABC123. Uh, don't use password. Um, you know, the, we're going to create something that's public facing on the Rinkeby test network and it's not real ether, right? But you still want to, you know, not, you, st you still want to protect your account. So I'm going to use a real password. Okay. All right. So here's our account address. I'm going to copy this. So now that uh, we've created that account, we want to do the next step, which is get some ether on this account. So we have a brand new account and we need you know, some ether so that we can actually you know, deploy our smart contracts, right? Um, you know, we're gonna create a transaction, we're gonna send a transaction whenever we um, you know, deploy our smart contracts, we're gonna change the blockchain and that's gonna cost ether. So we need some ether in here. Now a note about the um, uh, about the Rinkeby test network is it uses a different consensus algorithm from the main network. Um, you can't actually uh, mine on the Rinkeby test network, um, and this is because it's just a test network. It's for development purposes, and you know it's not really decentralized. It's actually centralized, right? Um, to to you know filter who can mine and who can't, but um, for our purposes, that's okay. Um, 
so because you can't mine and you can't, you know, earn your own ether, you actually have to request ether on the Rinkeby test network. We can do that um, with this website. I'll pull this up. We can go to faucet.rinkeby.io. So let me explain, you know, what this is. Uh, a faucet is a smart contract that uh, essentially can dispense ether. And this is how we're going to get Ether and fund this account that we just created in order to, you know, deploy our smart contracts. Um, and this is pretty easy um, because we can't mine. We have to, you know, request Ether here. I'm going to um, request some like this with these instructions. Essentially, what you have to do is create a social media post um, to say that you're requesting some. And then you have to paste the link to that post in here, and you have to uh, you know specify the amount that you want, and um, it will send them uh, to your wallet. So let's walk through that. I'm going to use Twitter. You can use either of these three social networks that you like, Google Plus or Facebook. I'm going to use Twitter. So I'm going to create a tweet. And this is just going to say requesting faucet funds into you know this account on the Rinkeby Ethereum test network. So we want to take this default account and replace it with the uh, account that we just created in Geth. You know you can see this. We'll take this here and copy it. So we're going to paste that value here. Uh, make sure you preserve the you know zero x. Um, so this is, you know, the value that we copied from our terminal. And, yeah, make sure you start with 0x here. So we'll send a tweet. So find the social media post that you created. You know, I'm on, I'm on Twitter, and this is my Twitter account. You can uh, look me up on Twitter at DAP University. Follow along for, you know, daily updates. And, uh, you know, shoot me a tweet or two. And, um, yeah, so this is the tweet that was created. Uh, we're requesting faucet funds to the Rinkeby network for this address. Um, so copy this status. Whatever link you use, you know, might have been Facebook or Google Plus or Twitter. Just copy the post URL. And we'll go back to the uh, uh, website here. And we'll paste in the status address. So we'll say, you know, give me Ether. This is going to have a few options um, depending on how much ether we want and how long we want to wait. So there is a cool off period. So essentially, you know, if you want three ether, you have to wait eight hours before you can request any more. You know, seven and a half, uh, one day, uh, 18.75, you know, three days. So the reason for all this is, uh, you know, you can't mine on the Rinkeby test network and you have to request ether from a faucet. Um, and really, this is just to prevent like spam attacks. You know, if you had the ability to mine unlimited free ether, like who cares if you just go around and spam people's apps? And that's kind of like why this is here. So I'm going to just choose three ether to wait eight hours. Um, click this. And all right, so funding requested, accepted. Um, it's found our Twitter posts and it found the account out of there. So we will uh, sit here and wait. We'll see this go through. You can watch the status bar. And when this is finished, we're going to go into our uh, console and check the balance to see if this actually uh, got an ether. Okay, so it said it was funded. We'll minimize this. So we can see um, our account is if it's funded or not by going to the geth console and we can say you know geth attach and let's check our accounts like this eth accounts here's a list of accounts you know uh, that we have you know, I've got several uh, you might just have one um, so really we want to ensure that the first account in our list is funded um, you know, full disclosure, this is, you know, the last, this is the one I just created on my network and requested faucet funds here for. Um, if you have one, you really just want to ensure that this one is funded um, because that's the account that we're going to use to deploy our smart contracts. 
So I can get that account by saying ETH.accounts0. All right. Um, so we want to say web, uh, web3, ETH.getBalance. Uh, we want to check the balance of this account. Oops, sorry. Um, sorry, a little typo there. So yeah, you can check the balance of this account by just saying ETH get balance ETH dot accounts you know zero, just the first account, and you should see a non-zero value here. And if you do, that means that your account is funded. Um, now remember, this is the amount of ether you have uh, expressed in way. Um, you know, you're not just like the richest person on the planet. You uh, this is how much this is how much way you have. This is you know the smallest uh, denomination of ether. Um, so it's a lot, you know, less ether than this. So, yeah, just ensure that you have uh, a non-zero value here before you continue. Uh, if that didn't work, you might want to troubleshoot uh, your faucet funds. Uh, but for now, just make sure that the first account on your list has uh, some ether. So the next thing we want to do is actually add um, some configuration to our Truffle project so that we can, you know, deploy um, our smart contracts. So, you know, so now we have you know an account with some ether that we can deploy. Now we want to configure our project so that we can deploy it to the Rinkeby test network. So I'm going to exit the guest console, and I'm going to open this project in Sublime Text. Okay. So what we do uh, to configure our project to deploy to the Rinkeby test network is add some additional configuration. So find your config file. This will either be, you know, truffle.config.js or truffle.js. So if you're on Windows, you're probably using uh, truffle.config.js or truffle-config.js um, for the reason I mentioned in one of the first videos because of the naming conflict with the executable. But if you're on a Mac or otherwise, uh, you know, like me, I'm using truffle.js. So what we want to do um, is add some configuration to this networks object. Um, we do that like this, we essentially just add a, a network, and we say uh, Rinkeby, we say host, uh, localhost, okay, uh, we say port, this is uh, 545, this is the port that we're running geth on, we say network ID, 4, and gas, let's say uh, 70, no, sorry, 47, yeah, so let's explain this, uh, we're basically saying host and port is for geth, this is, you know, the node that we're connecting to, and um, the network ID is going to um, specify the network that we want to connect to, in this case, Rinkeby. So there are different numbers here. You know, one is the main network, uh, four is the Rinkeby test network, and the other test networks have, you know, different numbers. So this uh, tells us that we are going to Rinkeby, and we're just going to name this Rinkeby so that we know uh, what we're doing here. So we'll be able to specify this network name whenever we deploy our contracts. So I'll save this and uh, minimize. All right, so now that we have... Um, our Truffle project configured to deploy our contracts to the Rinkeby network. There's one more step that we need to do before we can um, deploy, and that is we want to unlock, you know, the first account in our, our list, okay? So remember when we were using Ganache in the previous tutorials, um, we were able to, you know, deploy our smart contracts and Ganache would, by default, use you know the first account in a list, and that's kind of a similar thing we want to do here. But we're going to just specify that account. But we'll use the convention of using the first account. Um, sorry, this is still loading. I think Geth is kind of slowing things down here. Yeah, we'll just close this for now. So. We can unlock our account in order to deploy. This is essentially just going to give us to you know permission um, to you know use this account for deployment. So we will uh, open our console 
and we'll use the uh, personal library that we you know injected whenever we started Geth to unlock our account. We'll use that like this. Personal uh, unlock account. And we'll say uh, ETH accounts zero. We'll say no. We'll say twelve hundred. So let's explain what's going on here. So I'm going to use the personal uh, variable here to unlock the account. I'm going to pass the account in. So null here is going to be the password. Um, if I, you know, when I when I submit this command, it's going to ask me for a password. Uh, I pass null here because I don't want to actually type my password out on the screen. Uh, um, I suggest that you don't do that either. And uh, here is the amount of time we want to unlock our account for. This is uh, expressed in seconds. This is, you know, 1,200 seconds, which I think is like 20 minutes. Um, so essentially, this is going to say, hey, let's unlock this account for 20 minutes. And uh, I want to specify some sort of time here because I don't just... I want to know how long my account is locked for. There may be some, like, default kind of cool-off period for this. I don't really know. But um, for now, I'm just going to say hey, unlock my account, because otherwise I don't want to uh, have to manually, you know, lock my account. I want to just, you know, keep it unlocked for a certain amount of time. So I'll hit enter. I will, uh, you know, enter my passphrase that I uh, created in the tutorial when we created the account. So now our account is unlocked. And this is the final step before we actually deploy our contract to the blockchain. So um, if, that, if, if that was successful, um, you want to also see if your uh, geth node has finished syncing. And you can check that with ETH syncing. All right, so mine is not quite done yet. So if yours is not done either, you must wait for this to finish uh, before you deploy it. So I'm going to pause the video and wait and get back. And I suggest you wait and do the same before you proceed with the tutorial. So once Geth is finished syncing, um, you, know, you can check to see eth.syncing is false. If you don't see an object here, um, you know, you've successfully synced Geth with the RinkB network. Um, or you synced your node with the network. And yeah, this might have taken some time for you. It took some time for me, you know, depending on um, how fast your internet connection is, et cetera, et cetera, and how much you had already downloaded before. Um, so now that we have ensured that Geth is synced, we can deploy our contracts. So I'm going to exit the console. And we want to migrate our contracts, much like we did in the previous tutorials. Um, we can do Truffle. Uh, migrate, and we'll use the uh, you know reset flag like we did before, and we'll say uh, compile all, and uh, we will specify the network. Now I'm not going to run this yet. I'm going to show you why that works. Um, we this is the network right here that we specified in our configuration file and it's going to know to uh, use network id 4 to correspond to the rinkby network so we will run this see what happens this is probably going to take a second and that's okay all right so i actually got an error here um and i'm going to leave this on the video so that you all can uh uh, handle this type of thing too in case you get it. Uh, let's see what happened. So it started running our migrations and it said an error encounter was encountered. It's bailing. So it's saying that there's an authentication error, uh, authentication needed, password or unlock. Okay. So remember when we locked, uh, we, sorry, when we unlocked our account earlier, um, we specified uh, 20 minutes and it took longer than 20 minutes for my node to sync up. So we want to unlock that account again. So I'm going to open the Geth console. All right. And I'm going to say personal unlock account uh, ETH accounts zero. Oops, sorry. Um, and I'm going to say null for password and say 20 minutes again. So 1,200 seconds. <clears throat> Oops, sorry, typo. 
and I'm going to enter my password. All right. So now it's unlocked, and I'm going to exit. All right. Now let's rerun our migration. So triple migrate dash dash reset dash dash compile all dash dash network rinkaby. And let's see if it works this time with an unlocked account. All right, so it's deploying. It's using the network. We have, uh, you know, successfully authenticated with that account that's required to deploy our contract. And we'll just wait for these migrations to run. You can see that it's deploying the initial migration. Tell you what, I'm just going to pause the video until this finishes. Okay, so uh, my contracts were migrated successfully. You can uh, see that these you know, transactions were submitted over here in our, our uh, geth process, uh, our node process, and we can see the you know, logs here. So we can also open our project and kind of check on the success of this. I'll show you something pretty neat. Um, so Truffle keeps track of uh, you know, the addresses of our contracts that are deployed to different networks in these uh, contract uh, JSON files that, that are built whenever we run migrations. So let's take a look at our ERC20 token contract. Um, you know, here's the big JSON file. We'll go to the bottom. We can see that uh, these git diff markings, um, we can see that some new information was added here. We can see that a new network was created. Um, we can see network ID number four. This is corresponds to the Rinkeby network configuration that we just created. And we can see that uh, we have an address. So this is uh, Truffle's keeping track of the address of this smart contract that's deployed to the Rinkeby test network. We can go to Etherscan to check out the <clears throat> uh, state of this contract address to see if our migration was successful. So we can just enter an address here and type search. All right, we can see a transaction hash, a uh, block number, uh, the age, just three minutes ago, this was successful. And we can see the contract creator. This is the address that deployed the contract. And yeah, it's pretty cool. So we can just, uh, yeah, we can see all this information here. We can see that it's telling us that this is a smart contract too. We can do the same thing for our token sale contract. Go back to our project and see the DAP token sale. We'll go to the bottom of our file and copy this address as well. Go back to uh, Etherscan. Yeah, again, make sure you're on the Rinkeby subdomain. Don't try to, you know, look for this on the uh, main net. You probably won't find anything. Um, so, yeah, here's another contract address, and this is our token sale. All right. So, we have successfully migrated our smart contracts to the Rinkeby test network. That's pretty exciting. Um, we're getting really close to being able to use the deployed contracts with our uh, front end client, with our token sale website. We'll be able to connect to these contracts on that network instead of our local network. We're getting really close. We just got uh, one more thing to do. And this is a, you know, a step that's gonna be particular to our project, not necessarily other projects that you might build. Um, we need to give our uh, token sale contract some tokens. Now remember when we created the tests for our token sale contract and when we created our front end client, we had to do this step. So we had to provision 75% of all the tokens uh, to the token sale. And again, if you don't have all this code, you can just look at the GitHub link in the uh, show notes below this video to find this code. Um, so we need to get an instance of this token that's deployed to the Rinkeby test network, and we want to actually call the transfer function and send some tokens to you know this address. So, and we want to you know do a certain amount of tokens, and we want to do it from the admin. So, what are the steps here? Well, we need the token cell uh, address, which we have here. That's easy to get. Um, Token sale, go to the bottom of this file. You know, we'll use this address on the Rinkeby test network. We want to transfer to this. And we want to, uh, sorry. 
we want to um, actually DAP token sale. We're going to provision some of these tokens. So we need a deployed instance of this, you know, ERC20 token on the Rinkeby test network. And we're going to have to do this inside the Geth console. So how do we do that? Well, I'm going to show you. We're going to use the Web3 library um, to get a deployed instance of this contract. It'll be, you know, uh, something in JavaScript that we can use and understand to call this transfer function. And we're going to need to track this admin, which was just the first account in our list. So let's set up um, some of these things in the console. First, we'll keep uh, track of our admin. So open the console, actually, let's clear out. We'll keep track of the admin, um, let's say var admin, this will equal ETH accounts zero. You know, this is the, uh, this is the account that we deployed uh, with. So we'll use this as the admin. And we'll say tokens available is how much? 750,000. So we'll do that here. Uh, tokens available. 750,000. All right. And we will, you know, get the address for the token sale. And we will, uh, you know, copy that address from our configuration. All right. Now, the last thing we need is a deployed instance of this uh, token contract so that we can call the transfer function. Now, this is going to require a couple steps. We're going to use the Web3 library uh, to, you know, get a, you know, an instance of this uh, token. So we'll, we'll need to do two things. We'll need to, you know, tell Web3 what this token, you know, looks like, you know, how it behaves, what functions it responds to, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we will do the second step, which is uh, tell this, tell Web3 where this token is located on the network. Basically, we need to give it an address. So I'll sketch these steps out here for us. Um, one, we will, you know, describe the token to Web3. And I'll show you this is going to be an ABI file. And we will um, give or tell Web3 uh, the token address. All right. So how do we do this? Well, we can look at this um, JSON file that we you know, referenced here with the address. And we can copy this thing at the top called an ABI. Now the ABI is a you know abstract binary interface that uh, basically is used you know with the Ethereum virtual machine allows us to be encoded and decoded etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but it also so so allows you you know create uh, kind of an instance in JavaScript with Web3. So this ABI um, you know just tells tells us like what this token responds to right. It's got a it's got a function name for buy tokens. Um, it's got, uh, it, it, it tells you all kinds of stuff, right? So I'm actually in the wrong thing. I'm going to token, token, um, not token sale. So what we want to do is take this ABI array. We want to copy it and put it in our console and, you know, uh, assign it uh, with Web3 to a contract and so that Web3 knows, like, how to use this contract. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to press enter here. Actually, I'm just going to copy this. Copy this array. I'm going to do this in my text editor. Uh, you all can do this in a variety of ways. I'm just going to make this cleaner. And I'm going to use a plugin called uh, Pretty JSON. 
and I'm going to uh, compress this so it's on one line and I can copy it into my console. Um, I mean, you can do this a variety of ways. You could minify this on the web with a, you know, a, a web tool or something or just paste something into your console, but uh, I'm going to do it this way because it's easy. And I want to say ABI. So var ABI. And I'm going to paste this array that we created. All right, so we have access to that ABI in our console. Now we want to um, tell Web3 what the um, token address is, token address. And we'll find that at the bottom of this file as well on the Rikibi network. I'll copy this. All right, so we got token address. Now this is an important step. Don't confuse this with the token sale address that we created earlier, we want the token address. All right, so now we have these two pieces of information. We, we have the information to describe the uh, contract. We have the ABI in our console, and we also have uh, the address so that we can tell Web3 about the address and where it is on the, on the network. So let's get a deployed instance of the contract in the console. I'll do that like this. We'll go, um, uh, we'll say var uh, token contract equals web3 ETH contract. We'll pass in the ABI that we saved. All right. All right, and we can see that we have a uh, web3 object here. Um, the next thing we want to do is uh, get an instance and say uh, token instance is equal to my contract at, and we're going to pass in the address that we gave it earlier. This is token address. Now make sure you don't pass in the token sale address, we want the token address. Uh oh, oops, sorry guys. I uh, <laughs> just had a, t I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, token contract. So token instance equals token contract at token address. All right. It's actually harder to uh, type and talk than you think. Um, so now we have a token instance. This is uh, actually a deployed instance of our smart contract in the console. Um, so we can call functions on this. So let's just kind of see before we do anything crazy uh, what we have access to. We'll go to our contracts, our token instance, and we can get the name. All right, name. Yeah, there we go. DAP token. So we are reading data from the smart contract on the Rinkeby test network in our console. So that's that's huge. We know that we've deployed this uh, correctly and then we can actually read data from it. I mean, there's no other way that we'd be able to find this information um, unless we you know, had done that. Let me say address, all right, you know, D1A2, that's going to be the same address uh, that's here. You know, D1A2, that's on the Rinkeby network, test network, so it's not local. Um, all right, so the last step that we need to do before we can actually interact with this is to, um, yeah, transfer the tokens. So go back to our test and see what we did. We took the instance, which we have here, token instance. We want to call it transfer. All right. We want to pass in the uh, token sale address. And we want to give it uh, the tokens available. All right. And we want to do from admin. All right. Because that's exactly what we did in our test. All right. Let's see if it works. Okay. What happened? Let's check. We can check to see token instance. 
balance of, we'll say uh, admin. All right, sorry, I had a little hiccup there, guys. Uh, but uh, you can see if you type, you know, token instance balance of, um, you know, the uh, admin, you can see that it's gone down by uh, the amount that we expect. If we do the balance of the token sale address, it's gone up by the amount we expect. So I did this the first time and this hadn't actually finished yet. That's why I had a little hiccup in the video. Um, but yeah, this is an asynchronous call, so we had to wait for the transaction to finish. And once it did, we saw that we actually provisioned the number of tokens um, that we expected to the token sale. So if you, you know, don't, if this doesn't work for you initially, remember this is potentially a, a long running command that might take a second. So just wait and see if it works. All right, so that's huge, guys. We have set up our uh, token sale uh, contract with uh, some tokens. All right, so the last thing that we want to do is actually connect our client side application to our uh, smart contracts that are connected to the Rinkeby test network. Uh, in order to do that, we need to first import our uh, account that we deployed our smart contract with or, or any of the accounts that we created in Geth that have um, you know, Ether on the Rinkeby test network. And we want to um, yeah, basically get those from uh, our machine and import them into MetaMask. So we can find uh, our accounts. We can find the JSON files that we'll use to import into MetaMask the key stores uh, like this. If you're on a Mac, you can go to, uh, you can just say ls-l, uh, also be library, uh, Ethereum, and we can say uh, Rinkeby and key store. And so we can see the files that are listed here. These are the JSON files that are gonna to correspond to each account in that we, we created with Geth. So if you only created one account, you'll only see one uh, JSON file here. If you created multiple, you know, you'll know you see multiple. Um, so I'm going to actually just uh, show you this in Sublime Text so that you can get an idea of what's going on here. All right, so here's the uh, directory open in Sublime Text. You can see that there's, you know, five files because I have five accounts. Uh, you might only have one if you just created one. Um, so you can click on this and see a JSON file. Now, we need to get this JSON file um, into uh, MetaMask. We want to upload it into MetaMask. So I'm going to first just kind of copy this and put it in our project. Um, so just copy this JSON file and put it here. Now this is not really recommended best practice, but I'm going to just add it to our project. Just make sure you do not commit this. Um, do not commit this to history. So I'm gonna uh, copy that JSON file and add it here. Uh, I'm gonna save it as just key store JSON in our project. All right, so I've copied this account into our project and I'm going to upload this into MetaMask. Now this, uh, JSON file is just what we uh, can use to, you know, import our account to MetaMask. We'll use the password that we uh, created whenever we created the account as well. So let's go to our client side application uh, by running npm run dev. And this will open Light Server, and it'll open our app. So now we can go to uh, MetaMask. And, uh, you know, we can see that we have nothing here because this account uh, doesn't have anything. So we want to, you know, import that account and use, yeah, you just use this. So let's go to import account. We will uh, select a JSON file instead of a private key. We will open this file here. You can see this is our project where I just saved this key store at JSON. And I'll click enter. All right. We'll have to enter the password that we used when we created the account uh, with Geth. All right. We'll let this import. Let's look. Okay. And we can see that uh, 
we have imported our account from uh, the JSON file with Geth. I have 15.78 uh, Ether here. Um, again, this is just the Rinkeby test network, um, not the main Ethereum network. So this Ether's not worth anything. We're just going to use it to purchase some DAP tokens. So I'm actually going to edit this account and rename it. Say Rinkeby one. Um, and also we can just verify that this is the same account if you wanted to. We could copy the address to clipboard and go check it in Geth, but I'll leave that up to you. All right, so we'll refresh this page. And we can see that we currently have uh, 250,000 DAP tokens, right? Because that was the first account that initially had all the uh, tokens. And we, you know, provisioned some to the token sale because we're the admin. And yeah, we can see that our, our, uh, our front end client, our token sale website is talking to the Rinkeby test network. So we have made a successful deployment. We have added the account to MetaMask. The next thing we want to do is see if we can actually purchase some tokens. So let's just say we want to buy hundred tokens and let's try to purchase it. We'll see our MetaMask confirmation pop up. Um, it's going to cost us something and we will submit and we'll wait and I'll open up the console just to make sure that uh, we don't have any errors. So on the Rikibi test network, I'll give you a heads up. This can be kind of slow if you're trying to just create, you know, send transactions directly. So you might have to wait a second. I'll just uh, cut the video so that you don't have to watch all this. So actually we can see uh, a token was bought or caught back with successful and boom, we found our event and we can see that we purchased some more DAP tokens back into our admin account. And we can see that we have a hundred of 750,000 tokens were sold. Awesome. So yeah, guys, we have uh, successfully taken our contracts and deployed them to a test network, got them off of our machine. We've added, uh, you know, these accounts with Geth. Um, we've provisioned all the tokens to the token sale and we're actually talking to a live uh, token sale ICO on the Rinkeby test network. And we can purchase tokens. And now we have DAP tokens that we can, you know, hold on to and save and uh, send to other people and use as a currency. And a quick addendum before we wrap up, make sure you go back to your project and delete this uh, file. We can go ahead and uh, commit some of our changes. You can see that it's mostly just these uh, JSON files changed. Let's uh, call this um, deploy contracts. All right. All right, so that's it guys. That's the end of this video where I show you how to deploy your smart contracts to the Rinkeby test network. Um, that was pretty involved. There's a lot of steps, a lot of things that can go wrong. So if you have trouble, um, just try to, to, you know, break it down step by step and see what you're having an issue with. So be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you can see the next video in the series where we're going to actually deploy our, uh, client side website to the web. And then we'll have a fully functioning ICO that's, uh, you know, out there for the World Wide web to see, and they can actually purchase the tokens on the Rinkeby test network. So subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications below so that you can see that video when it comes out. And until then, thanks for watching DAP University. Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University. So welcome back to this multi-part tutorial where I'm showing you how to code your own cryptocurrency and build your own ICO on Ethereum. In this video, I'm going to show you how to uh, deploy the token sale website, you know, the ICO website um, that we built in our previous videos. And in the last video, I showed you how to deploy the uh, smart contracts to the Rinkeby test network. So make sure you've seen all those videos up to this point and, you know, have all the code in the project up to this point before we continue. And be sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications with the bell below in order to see further videos in this series when they come out. 
And if they're already out, you can just check the link at the end of this video or just watch the next video in the playlist. So I've got a, um, a link down to the code in the description below that you can pick up with if you want to just drop in at this point in the tutorial. Um, and if you are uh, picking up at this point in the tutorial, make sure you install your dependencies with npm install. So let's talk about what we're going to do today. We're going to take our token sale website, um, you know, all of our client side assets, the index.html file and the app.js file and all the, you know, libraries we pulled in, and we're going to deploy them uh, to a remote server so we can get them on the web and you can, you know, visit your token sale website, um, you know, just through a browser, you can send the link to anyone you want to and show off your work. So we're going to do that today with uh, GitHub Pages. So GitHub Pages offers a pretty nice, um, easy workflow for, you know, deploying, uh, you know, just client side web pages like this. Um, and I'll, sh I'll walk you through how to do that. So first, you're going to need a GitHub account. So if you don't have one already, uh, you can just sign up at github.com. I'll leave that to you. And once we do that, we want to uh, create a new GitHub repo. So you can go to, you know, your page. This is actually my, you know, DAP University GitHub page. You can go here and follow along with all my projects. So for you, you'll go here and click new. You'll create a new repository. You can just say um, token sale. I've already created this on my, um, you know, account. So I'm just going to say token sale two, and you can add whatever description you'd like. We can say uh, DAP University token sale tutorial, and you can just leave it public and um, just say create repository. All right. Now we got some uh, instructions here. Um, about setting up your repository, and I'll kind of just walk you through what we'll do here. Uh, we won't follow necessarily these steps uh, verbatim. I'll show you what we need to do. So while we're here, um, we'll take you know this URL, right? Uh, you can see it in a couple different places. This uh, Git URL, um, you can see it here as well in this form, and let's copy it. So we'll minimize this. We go to our project, and what we want to do is configure our, um, you know, Git repository to uh, set up a remote repository. So if you haven't been following along while I've been committing, and if you're unfamiliar with Git, um, you know, you, you might need to initialize a, a Git repository. You can do that like this, git init. Uh, I'm not going to do this because I've already got a Git repository here. If you want to read more about Git, you can just you know go to the website here. This is git-scm.com. Um, but I'm just going to assume that you've been you know following along and you know committing to uh, you know history where I've been committing in the videos. Um, you know we can see the history here, All right? So, anyways, what we want to do is configure. Um, this git this git uh, project to track uh, an, an origin branch so that's just going to be a remote repository so we do that like this um, git remote add origin and then paste our uh, link in there so I'm not actually going to do this because I've already got an origin repository uh, but that's what you would do you can also uh, check to see if that was successful by uh, typing git remote-v to see um, you know, the remotes that you have listed. And if you see origin here and you see the URL you just pasted, that was successful. So this is my original token sale. Now the next thing we want to do is just uh, push to that origin repository to ensure that we set everything up correctly. So we'll just say um, git push dash u origin master all right mine's already up to date because i've been uh, keeping my repository up to date but you should see some um you know readout here 
we'll tell you what, I'll just add the second repository just to have a second remote. So we'll say um, git remote add, uh, I'll say origin2, and I'll paste in this, okay, git remote dash v, and now I see origin2 here listed, okay. So then I'll, I'll push, you know, to my new repository that I just created, I'll say git remote add, uh, sorry, uh, git push dash u origin to master. Okay, now this is the readout that you should see, right? So you'll see some logging here, and you'll say new branch master master. All right, so let's go to um, you know GitHub, and I'll just you know if you're if you're still on this page, this is the you know kind of default page that you see when there's no code here. So I'm going to refresh. And you should see all the files for your new project. All right, so now that that's successful, now that we have you know a um, place for our our code, um, this is going to be kind of the central repository for creating our GitHub page as well. You know, we need this um, this uh, project that we just created on GitHub to exist before we can create a GitHub page because it's going to use the code in this directory in order to uh, you know build our github page which we'll make in a minute so i'm going to minimize this and i'm going to show you how to set up uh, your project to deploy to github pages so sorry i'm going to bump up this font a little bit so you guys can see what we want to do is create a folder on our computer where we're going to, um, you know, store all the assets that we want to commit to GitHub Pages. You know, we saw a second ago that we have all these files here in this uh, directory, and we want to create a new folder in here um, that uh, GitHub is going to know about. That's going to contain all of the client side assets. It's going to contain all the files for our token sale website. And it's going to serve those assets to build, um, you know, the website that it's going to host. So we'll take a look at our project really fast in Sublime Text. I'm going to pull this over here, and you know, let's just take a quick tour of uh, our project structure. Remember, we had a source directory where we built all of our client-side assets locally. So what we're going to do is uh, create a new directory um, called docs. That's going to be the uh, folder that GitHub's going to recognize in order to build our website. Um, so we want to take all these files plus um, these contract abstractions, and we want to build a website that's going to live in a single folder. So when we were developing locally, we um, used, you know, we used Light Server, and if you remember when we configured Light Server with this BS config file, we took all of the assets from our source directory, and we took all the assets from our build contracts directory, and we essentially just combined those together and exposed them uh, to the root of our project that Light Server knew about in order to, you know, kind of run our our website locally, right? That's like what this did. That's why we installed this in the first place was so that we could take files from different places in our project and uh, combine them into one place that we could use, you know, to uh, develop a website locally. And you know, that's why we were able to use stuff like uh, get JSON. I'll show you. You know, we use the get JSON method to fetch our our contract abstractions, and you know, get JSON allows you to read a JSON file like this, um, and notice that there's no you know slash before this or anything like that. There's no path. Um, that's because we were able to just read this from the root of our project, and that's like kind of like what Light Server was doing for us. Now we want to you know build a folder that's got all of that in there for free. And we want to essentially write a script that's going to do what Light Server did, and you know, make a build uh, for a deployment that's going to go up to GitHub Pages. So I'll show you how to do that. First, let's uh, make a directory for our website. We'll say mkdir. 
docs. Okay. We can see that that was created. Next, we want to create a script that's going to take all the files that we want from source and you know build contracts. And it's going to put them all uh, in that directory. And it's going to do you know a couple things. That's the, that's the first thing it's going to do. But I'll walk you through those step by step. So I'm just going to create a script um, that we can run in our project. I'll say, uh, I'll say touch uh, deploy front end dot sh. Now this is where um, you know our your mileage may vary uh, for different operating systems, whether you're on Mac, uh, Linux, uh, Windows, with like PowerShell or something like that. Um, I'm on a Mac, so those are the instructions that I'm going to walk you through. Um, I'll leave it to you to uh, alter that for your own system. But I'm going to make this file first. We'll open our project back in Sublime Text. And let's open this file. So in this file, I'm going to write a script. Um, and the first thing I want to do in this script is basically, you know, move or synchronize all of the files in those two directories that I just showed you, you know, the source directory and the build contract directory. And I want to put them in our docs folder that we just created. Now, you run, you're going to run into issues if you if you have new folders in here. Um, you know you, you can't always just like you know use MV or CP uh, with you know with you can't use those bash commands all the time because you don't know what files are going to be there and what directory is going to be there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You don't know how deep those uh, go. So I'm going to use this rsync command um, like this rsync dash r it's for recursive, and we'll say source and we'll say docs. So that's going to take everything uh, recursively from the source directory and go to docs. And it's going to build any necessary folders that we need. Uh, I'll say rsync uh, build contracts. We'll say star. We'll go to docs. We'll say um, get add dot. Well, first of all, let's just do that first. We'll show you what it does. Uh, well, okay, so first, in order to run this command, to run this script, sorry, we need to make this file that we just created, this script, executable. So on a Mac, we can uh, do that like this. We say uh, chmod plus. Basically, we're just changing the you know uh, permissions of this file to make it executable. And we say deploy frontend.sh. This is the file we just created. All right, and we can run this command like this. Deploy front end of sh. All right, so let's see what just happened. We can go to our docs folder and see that all of our files have just been created. We can see our index.html file, our migrations file. Um, these are the content abstractions, right? We have the dap token, dap token sale. We have all our JavaScript files, app.js, all of our dependencies, um, all our CSS files just for Bootstrap. So those are the first things we want to do is just to make a build folder essentially. And next, let's go ahead and like you know create this file to actually you know deploy. Like it, like this just builds it, but let's let's go ahead and deploy it to GitHub. So we'll say uh, git add everything here. We'll say git commit m. And we'll say, uh, we'll say, you know, compiles uh, assets for uh, GitHub pages. All right. And then we'll just say git push. I'm actually going to say dash u uh, origin master. So here I'm going to, so this is what yours should look like. But since I just added my extra remote repository, I'm going to say two just for our purposes. Um, 
so you don't put two here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to put two because I just, you know, created that you know, a second ago in the video. So let's try this. Let's see what the readout is. All right. So that commit and we saw this readout like we saw a minute ago when we pushed to GitHub. So let's go to our website. Let's see what happened. All right, I'm going to refresh. And now you can see that there is a um, a new folder here in our project. This is the docs folder and we can see our commit message. This is, you know, compiles assets for GitHub pages. We can see um, that same readout here for our script that we just created. And we can go in here. We can say docs, CSS, JS, index.html. We've got everything that we need. We've got all of our JavaScript files in here. Okay, so that was successful. And the next thing we want to do is uh, just set up this repository to serve pages for GitHub. So I can go to the settings tab for my repository and I can um, scroll down to GitHub pages. This is, you know, just down here on the first part of the settings page. And we can choose a, a source for our page. Now, right now, there's nothing there, but we want to select some options. So there's a couple different ways of doing this. You could choose the master branch, and that would, you know, serve all the assets from the root of your project, but that's not really what we want to do. Uh, because we don't want to just, you know, show all the code in our project. We want to use the docs folder we just created. And that's why we made this, because, you know, GitHub gives you this option to look for that specific folder in order to serve your website. So that's what we're going to choose. We'll click Save. All right. Now, let's go try and visit our website. Okay, so we can visit our website um, like this. Go to your URL bar and uh, use this scheme. So you'll take your um, your GitHub account. Um, I'm using you know this because I have an organization, but this is probably just your username as well. Um, so enter that here, and we say that's your subdomain. We say .github.io, and then you know forward slash, and then the name of your repository. So I'll click enter. And there we go. There's our token sale website deployed to the web. We can see, you know, all of our assets here. Um, I can see the account that I'm connected to. Now, I don't think that I have the right account set up, and I don't think I'm connected to the right network. So we can do that and try to, you know, interact with this deploy website. You can also kind of just see our uh, console here to see that there are no errors. You know, I've still got some console logging statements in here, and uh, you all can, you know, clean those up if you'd like so that you don't just... You need needlessly log information here. This is more for development purposes, but I'll leave that to you as an exercise. Um, so yeah, no errors. Looks like everything went smoothly initially. So let's see if we can actually talk to our smart contracts that are deployed to the Rinkeby test network and see if uh, you know this website is you know fully functional. So I'm going to uh, change the account. We'll say you know, Rinkeby. All right. And then I'm going to actually connect to the Rinkeby network where our contracts are deployed. All right. So I'm starting to get some data back. This is exciting. Um, we can see that my balance has changed because this is what we did in the last you know, tutorial. We can see that you know this is the number of tokens that have been sold. We can see the account that we're connected to. Now let's go ahead and uh, try to buy some tokens. We'll click buy tokens, and this is probably going to take a second, so I'll cut the video. We'll uh, confirm with MetaMask and submit, and we'll wait. All right, so that worked. Um, yeah, this might have taken a second for you. It took a second for me, but we can see that uh, you know we've successfully purchased the tokens. And so if you had, you know, trouble like listening for events and your, your page refreshing after you deployed, uh, you might need to restart Chrome. Uh, that's kind of a known issue with MetaMask. And 
yeah, that's just something that you is known issue and you might have to cope with. And also, you know, this is probably pretty slow for you at the moment. Um, you know, the it's, that's just kind of what you have to expect right now with the Rinkeby Test Network. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty great, guys. We've gotten this website out on the web. So you can see, you know, your token sale website that is, you know, here. This is a link that you can share around. And you can actually purchase the tokens, and you can do this on the Rinkeby Test Network. So nothing about this is dependent upon our local machine at the moment. Um, this is, you know, a real live DAP out there in the wild. So congratulations. You have, you know, successfully built your own crypto token ICO. And, you know, you can modify this for your own purposes and change the name and change things around a little bit and kind of build upon this. Um, I'll leave that to you. So for now, this is going to be the conclusion of the Code Your Own Cryptocurrency and Build Your Own ICO series. Um, so be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you can see you know, more videos about developing decentralized applications on the Ethereum blockchain. And until then, thanks for watching DAP University.